There's no time. O'clock. Hey, everybody. It's Friday. Yeah, it's going to be a good show tonight. Yeah, I yeah. think so. Yeah, this is a classic case. Jimmy Hoffa. I'm actually surprised we haven't. Well, like I said, I, you know, when we first started the show, we didn't want to do kind of these more big ticket, like better known yeah. cases because like so many other things have been done about it. But finally, finally, we decided to get around to like talking about it. Ever since I was a little kid, I mean a little kid, I grew up with the television every now and then in the radio, every now and then one was somebody on the television or radio wondering where the fuck Jimmy, Jimmy Hoffa was. He just disappeared off the place of earth. Well, it's kind of like, it kind of became a joke for a yeah, while. Like, e Hoffa. even in movies and stuff like that, people would be yeah. like, oh, hey, I found Jimmy Hoffa. You know what I mean? Like, just, yeah. it was it was like this meme yeah. before there was even a word yeah. for that. For, for Sandra, no, got Sandra. She was in there seduced by a sexy cow. She, <laughs> she, which I have no idea the fuck she's talking about. I, um, I vaguely remember something yeah, like that. From I don't know what day. I was talking about. She's got to refresh my memory on that one. But, uh... <laughs> She, she'll she take this, the littlest fucking thing I say and fucking run with it. I don't even remember saying that kind of shit. But, uh, cause it's the poltergeist that says it, I guess. Especially when I've been drinking. I'm trying to drink this one up fast. That way I can get more fucking ahead into the future. I drink that bitch, I will go into the future. Did you know that? That's that's a good. Okay, all right. I'm trying to like I'm trying to get this drinking out of the way so, so I can, can do more drinking. So I can do more drinking in the future, <laughs> right? So you see, I can tell what time it is by what color hat I'm on. I'm still on the black hat. When I'm on this hat, I'm in the future. Okay. Because this one's next. All right. And then, I, then when you see me in that fucking Conan wig, you know I'm at the end of time. <laughs> the, the, yeah, yeah I'm at sense. the end of time. Anyway, uh, Jimmy Hoffa was a uh, Teamsters union leader. Oh, he was Teamsters, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, Teamsters. And uh, I know he was a union leader. He was heavily in, entwined with the mob. All those unions were. Uh, they probably still are to a certain extent. But uh, the labor unions were all entwined with the Italian mob of that of that era, and he made a bunch of mistakes and fucking he disappeared. They know, they know he's dead. They just don't know where the body is. Yeah. And a lot of people who were involved in the mob over the years, you know, put forth what they think happened to him. They pretty much know why he disappeared. They just don't know where he is. Um, I think there's one guy. I think his name might have been Jimmy something or other. Was it Jimmy the Greek? One of them I forgot. No. He can't, it wasn't Jimmy the Geek. <laughs> One of them I forgot his name. He he put forth the best theory of what they did with his body, and I'm gonna stick with that. But I'm not gonna talk about it until the time comes. Well, um, I was watching a documentary about this, and one guy who was like a a, a true crime writer. He said, what may have happened, why there are so many plausible sounding theories as to what happened to Jimmy Hoffa and why like so many of them sound like, you know, oh, it's coming from a guy that was there and would probably know, is that what they might have been doing was that, you know, obviously like all these people in the mob knew what had happened to him, yeah. but they were like, if they ever told anybody, they would tell everybody like a different story. Yeah, well, yeah, that's fucking, they're, yeah. they're, they're, they're clouding the information Yeah, stream. like a misinformation yeah. campaign. And then all of a sudden the cops go and look in all these weird areas. They keep fucking digging and looking for this dude and they're always coming up with nothing. And that way they just fucking stop believing. They say, ah, fuck Jimmy Hoffa. That, that was the <laughs> idea. I well, will say, though, that the recent film, The Irishman, yeah, uh, saw it. yeah the it Martin Scorsese film, which is actually a really good movie, yeah. but pretty much everybody, I mean, that kind of um, hinges on the theory that Frank Sheeran, uh, a.k.a. The Irishman, was the one who killed Jimmy Hoffa. And they had, like, the whole scenario and everything. And even though when you see the movie, that seems kind of plausible, um, most of the, like, so-called experts that I was reading and stuff like that said that is probably not what happened. Yeah. Um, but it's a good movie anyway. The old school mob <laughs> at this level, at the highest levels, and that's the level Hoffa was at, were fucking pros. They were really good. I mean, um, intelligence agencies worked with them and learned from them and adopted back in the old school. This goes back to even World War II. They worked with those guys in, 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 in um, covert operations uh, and learned from them and sometimes employed them. Those dudes were would not rat each other out, not at that level. They would never roll over. 
So whoever did it would would go to their grave. It, it was a small team of dudes. They knew each other like brothers. Nobody ever said anything after it was done. Yeah, and You'll like you said, know. they probably purposely spread around yep. a bunch of different yeah. plausible sounding stories yeah. so that no one would ever know. I think whoever did it, their outer circle knew that those three dudes did it, but they didn't know any of the details of what had happened. Yeah. that Because everything would have been compartmentalized and, de- and everything would have been deniable. And then the guys outside that ring, their job would have been to spread rumors. Yeah. Of, of what happened. Which, like I said, that seems like yeah. common sense, that that's yeah. what you would do if you were uh, engaged the, the in these best, types of nefarious activities. The best theory, which we'll talk about later in, in, in of what happened to him, is I believe the one that happened. And if they did that, there would have been no remains when they were done with him. Well, that seems the best that's, way to go about that yeah. kind of thing. If you want to make somebody disappear, then literally... They make literally him made disappear. him disappear. <laughs> There's ways... They had access to methods that would do that. Yeah industrial methods that would do that there would have been nothing and that was the idea that there would be nothing yeah nobody to find yeah it's vaporized much, much harder to prosecute yeah. uh, right. somebody when you can't find a body it's not yeah. impossible it has been done but very be witnesses very, very and there were never going to be any witnesses and no one would ever testify those dudes were all bro- blood brothers to each other they would not roll yeah, I want, okay, so there's a couple, like, super chats and a couple comments that I okay. wanted to answer. Uh, Jeffy Art says, happy Friday, guys. Jenny, I just finished uh, Cold Moon Over Babylon, The Amulet, and The Good House. Oh, my God, amazing books. Yes, all of those are good. Although, I haven't done, I don't think I've done The Amulet yet, but I have it, so I just haven't uh, reviewed it yet. I uh, said, yeah, recommending them to my friends. Yeah, those are all excellent. Got all kinds of super chat. Uh, Sandra was seduced by a sexy cow, said, it's always yeah. a good show. I'm here for the sidetracks anyway, not for the topic. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people are. That's Which makes me feel a little bit better in case it's hopefully I don't like mess anything up. Lady Vesuvius says, is that a Summerton Man t-shirt? Yes, it is. Uh, I made this, actually. Yeah, that's Summerton Man. It says, who is Summerton Man on it? Yeah. It's one of it's one of our thirteen o'clock. They're shows. already our throwing start. stuff. Um, see who is this? That's thank Bay- you, the sexy cow that seduced Sandra. <laughs> okay. <laughs> For the super chat, yeah, says, yeah, sorry, yeah. Sandra. <laughs> okay, that cow's in here. Sandra says, "Middle Ages witch trials. Man fucked cow and said it was the cow's fault. It yeah. seduced him. <laughs> yeah. And then they executed them both. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. some shit that they would have done back then. <laughs> it's those sexy big yeah. brown eyes." <laughs> oh my god everybody's coming up with the he's in he's in block of concrete he's buried in this and that no no they wouldn't do that that's that was that's part of the misinformation campaign they had methods of acts of, of literally vaporizing a body there is there is no jimmy hoffa the body's gone i believe because they had access. That to, seems to like a lot of yeah. uh, a lot of experts say that too. They don't know exactly like where, when, or how it happened, but they're basically saying there would be no. There's I mean, no body. E- either that, or he got dumped in the ocean. Now, nah, too messy. They would want to know for sure that there was no body. Yeah. And there's a process that you can go yeah, through. Yeah, because if you just dump it in the ocean, it might wash up somewhere. You can watch it happen, and five minutes later, there's no body, and you know there's no body. Job done. <laughs> would, that, that's, that's what they did. Yeah. Uh, and thank you for the super chat, Jeffy Art. Always love your podcast. Thank you very much. Uh, Sheila Ann is, yeah, this was a, this is a very popular uh, theory that he's uh, buried in the end zone at Giant Stadium, like no. they poured him in the uh, thing. But yeah, I've heard, I've heard uh, that a lot. Uh, thank you, David June. I'm here, bitches. Can't wait for this case. They wanted them to go and dig that up over there by the fucking Yankee Stadium. And then, oh, he's not there. It's Giant then, Stadium. Or Giant Stadium. And then, and then the cops would look like fools. That was the whole idea. Yeah, it's like, that's, they're like, we're not doing that. Holy crap. Sandra no. said, Jenny looks cute today. Well, thank you. Yeah. Not as cute as the cow, though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sandra's going to have to jog my memory. Well, I, I mean, where. you know, no one's going to be able to. I was talking about they were giving the cows vitamins and steroids. And I said, leave them cows alone. They're cute. How's it? Just as attractive as they are. I think they're vitamins, something like that. That sounds like some That was like say. back in the 30s. While they, they didn't know, they weren't really sure <laughs> if, if vitamins or steroids worked. They didn't really have steroids as you'd know them. They were prototypes. There's a bunch of shit that they didn't that they didn't have agents to f- make something stable. They didn't have that. Beowulf says the moral of Hoffa's story is don't get involved with the mob. Yeah, it almost seemed like I don't know. It almost seemed like he didn't really uh, intend to, but it was almost kind of like back in those days, you know, getting involved in union organizing stuff like that. You almost like had to be. 
most of the government is like that. The same and thing. yeah, so it's kind of like you know, yeah. and and he was kind of like using those tactics like to get what he wanted, which in some ways were good for like some of like the working people that he helped and stuff, but not so good in other yeah. uh, in other ways. And a lot of times in certain areas, there was a kind of a shade of gray where business ended and the mob began, and where politics ended, it was all just kind of the same thing. Um, well, and I like, think that that was one of the things yeah. that Jimmy Hoffa, people like him, like said, they're like, look, uh, you know, the other side is using these tactics. Yeah. So if we want to get anywhere, we yeah. have to do pretty much the same shit. Right. You know what I'm saying? If we want to get anything yeah. done. Right. And, uh, you know, there were, just because you say somebody's in the, the mob or, you know, the Italian mafia, that's not really <coughs> saying much because there was a lot of different mafia families of, and they, each one was of different <coughs> standing. And you could kind of make up your own mob, and you didn't necessarily have to be Italian. You could be a junior member or an important member, and you're not even really Italian. I'm a junior mob yeah, member. So it was <laughs> a little kinda, They were just gangs. And, you know, you could kind of make up your own. Some of them, you could trace them back to Sicily, but that didn't matter. Even by the time the 20s was around, you know, they had guys who were Irish that were doing that in those Italian mobs, kicking ass. Yeah. Making a lot of money, and getting famous, and being... Well, like I said, Frank, well, Frank Sheeran, the guy they made yeah. that movie about, was... Yeah. Was it, yeah. He was an Irish dude. Yeah, and, you know, they, they, they called the Italians... This is back before... Well, a lot of times, this is back before Italians were considered white. Straight yeah, we were enough. talking about we that talking on... About the other, Right. Well, yeah, and it's like it even yeah. in my lifetime, like in the early seventies, like when I was a really little kid, yeah. I remember reading stuff from like the fifties and sixties. Yeah, as if the Italians were not. As white. if the Italians were, yeah, like yeah. they were like these big weird foreigner types, right. like ooh, you know, yeah. and even like Italian food, which nowadays yeah. is like as American as anything else, yeah. was like considered like weird and foreign, which is yeah. like very funny to me. Yeah, now Italian is just like as as white as the Irish, because <laughs> the Irish weren't white either. Yeah, that's true. When you went back far enough. Whiteness is just kind of like a fucking a made up American thing. Um, <laughs> it kind of is in a way. Fucking you all of everybody eventually just becomes white if you're here long enough. The, the, the Hispanics are becoming white. Don't you, they're saying, well, these are white Hispanics. When I was growing up in Brazil, I just blended in with half the population. Yeah. And yeah, they were Hispanic. Hispanic just means, you know, they're part of the Spanish Empire. You know, or descendants of the Spanish Empire and the diaspora. Yeah, that spread. doesn't mean anything about doesn't race mean anything. necessarily. It's a fucking it, that's that's a it's a bullshit terminology. Hispanic doesn't mean anything. Spain is right next to Germany and England. That's fucking Crackerville. Okay. <laughs> Crackerville. That's Crackerville. The royal families married to each other, and, and and the Castilianos up in Castile were basically Germans. But so were the British. The British were basically Germans. They were all, Saxons. Aren't we all? Germans? They're all the same fucking thing. Goddamn Sandra. <laughs> Fuck, man. <laughs> Jesus. But, um, yeah, so, yeah, now they just say, well, they're they're Hispanic, but that's a white Hispanic. You know? It's fucking funny. And then you find out that that white Hispanic is also Jewish. You know what I mean? So these, these terms well, don't mean anything. Yeah. You know? I mean, you know. They're just kind of political opinions. People are it's people Political so labels you're putting on people. Be? Just, yeah. Yeah, just a little Depeche Mode for right. you there. Sandra said, wasn't there a Jimmy Hoffa, Marilyn Monroe connection? Not that I know of, although uh, Hoffa and the Kennedy brothers, JFK and Robert Kennedy, like hated each other. Holy crap. That was like blood feud mm. shit. So much so that, um, I don't know if this is necessarily true, but so much so that people thought that maybe Jimmy Hoffa was involved in the yeah. like JFK assassination because he was apparently super happy when JFK got shot. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. I'm just saying that that's like, you know, that's something somebody said. But... Yeah, so what I was going to say, and I kind of, because I got went off into a rant, forgot what I was saying. <laughs> what else is there? From, <laughs> the, the, the Italians, from the Italian perspective, they called all pretty much all white non-Italians the Irish, whether they were Irish or not. I mean, they had to, you had to definitely not be an Anglo of some sort or another for them to call you something other than an Irish. Like if you were Hungarian, then maybe they would call you a honky, which that's what the Hungarians came from, honky. <laughs> I was looking at where, what, what, what a, where that word came from, honky. Honky, it's Hungarian. Is what, is what Interesting. It, yeah. I never really knew the... Uh, it's a slang term for a the, Hungarian. The but, etymology of yeah. that. Yeah, that was a word that was used in, you know, like, evidently, according, according to 
my research. It may be wrong, but it says that that was like in the New York boroughs and stuff. That was just kind of the slang term for anybody who was kind of Eastern European, probably Hungarian. But it'd be easy to mistake a, 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 a Romanian for a Hungarian. It's just if, if it's a language you don't recognize and it's Eastern European, they're just going to say it's like, I don't know. They just sound like it's, vampires. It's a honky. Yeah. <laughs> a honky. Yeah. They all just sound like vampires. Right. right. <laughs> and for some reason, other uh, African Americans, that, that term stuck with them. Maybe they lived in their, started off that word came from a neighborhood that adjoined a neighborhood that was like that. That sounds Hungarian, plausible. And it got into into. And then it just got into the vernacular. Yeah, anybody yeah. who was white was a honky. But they yeah. were talking about Hungarians. That's interesting. I didn't know yeah. it was that quite that specific. Yeah. It's like cracker. Okay. I always thought that a cracker just was because a cracker is white. But my grandmother from the deep south, she clarified it. No, cracker means cracker jack. And that was like Colonel Sanders was a cracker. And they were just... They were basically lower middle class or middle class white southerners that were trying to be gentrified as much as they could and they'd wear these fucking suits. Used, a lot of times they were white suits, but they were also pastel colors. And they'd sit around on a damn porch drinking tea and shit. And mint julep. And yeah, and <laughs> pontificating and being fucking trying to sound important and telling other people what they should do. That that's what a cracker did, and because they were cracker jacks, kind of like like a pimp or a mac, just walk <laughs> just walk around looking good and trying to tell other people what to do, just on the back of what the suit that you were wearing. <laughs> and if bitch, you, I got a white suit yeah, on. Okay, suit, you do exactly what I say that's right, right now. That's right. Usually they were faking. I'm gonna try that shit out. They had the same days. thing in England. They called them dandies. Well, yeah. And they were usually working class, but they tried to look like they were rich. That's what a cracker was. Cracker Jack. Looking sharp. Yeah. That's what, yeah. That's what they're talking looking about. Looking Cracker Jack. Right. So, you know, a cracker was going to fucking um, walk around and tell people what to do. And fucking, you know, if you told a black person what to do, he'd probably talk down to him back in the Jim Crow era. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, no. Hey, boy. Hey, boy. You need to go back over across the railroad tracks. Yeah, be sounding like... You belonged over here. Be sounding like Foghorn Leghorn. Right, right, right. Shit. So, you know, <laughs> they're just going to see some cracker showing up hey, telling boy. you, get back where you belong. And that's going to, for them, it's going to be... All white people are crackers. No, it's just the crackers <laughs> that were telling you to fucking go back over there on that side. Well, like I said, you have like limited, yeah. you know, limited exposure content. to that kind of shit. You're yeah. like, man, are they all like that? Fuck yeah. that. <laughs> right. Well, the cracker, I like it. the cracker of that era was kind of what you would call in modern terminology. If that would be Afghanistan, that you would call that a tribal elder. <laughs> you know, I'm talking about. Doesn't have any authority on it. Ill authority. He's just he's hanging out there. You know, he's he's assumed authority. Yeah. Just on the back of nothing, really. That's what the tribal <laughs> era er, elder is. Because I'm old, I'm telling you what to do. And there's no government. Yeah, you and that's can't kinda, really pull that shit with yeah, you. Yeah, the Deep like South it. really didn't. It was all local. There wasn't any fucking real government structure. We might have, my little light went red, but it went back to green again. So if it like gave a little blip, I'm sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, we're kind of. Sandra said, I'm in the kitchen for a few minutes. Don't talk about something funny. I don't want to miss anything. All right. <laughs> David June says, nice Tyrell Corp shirt, Tom. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. We yeah. got them for sale. Yeah, because uh, we made that. We made that. So uh, so it's a big hit at work. One old lady misread it as genetic Republicans, though. <laughs> <laughs> genetic Republicans. It's funny. <laughs> uh, don't even don't even get me started. <laughs> Seriously, that's super funny. I think it's funny because I think I thought. I kind of read it as that one time, too, when I was, like, not really looking at it. I was like, wait, yeah. what? Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, so Camp Guy said there used to be a lot of Hoffa-style gangsterism in the Georgia State House, Eugene and Herman Talmadge. Yeah, I've heard those names before. Yeah. It's just, well, I don't know. Like, I kind of feel like this is an interesting case just because, I mean, everybody pretty much knows what happened to the dude. I mean, the mob whacked him, right? Yeah. Um, it's just I, it's just a mystery because they never found his ass, and right. the, and no one is like saying why, like right. who did it. Yeah, and 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 part of what I was leading into, and you reminded me of what you just said. It's hard. The mafia families were kind of self-made families. They were not highly structured. There wasn't a top-down command structure between them all. Any criminal organization could become a mafia, basically. Um, the one that got Hoffa was a very rich and powerful one. All right, you, so you're not talking about 
they may or may not have been connected with very many other mafia families because a lot of those other mafia families would have been a lot poorer and lower in social status. That's one of the reasons why this crime was never solved. This crime was done by a really good, rich, powerful mafia organization. I suspect it was something to do with the Genovese crime family. Yeah. That's what I'm suspecting. Right. So this, so these were the families that you would know about. For every and one that you know about, there's 20 other ones that you'd never know about because they were too small and insignificant. And the reason that they whacked him, I think, was because they suspected, rightly or wrongly, that he was going to uh, become an FBI informant and like talk yeah. about all the uh, ties between labor organizing and the mob. And they yeah. so they thought he was going to blab. So yeah, so they bumped him off. That's yeah. what I think. Anyway. Yeah, and that's that's about right. Now, uh, strangely enough. Political parties and unions and private security and um, private detective agencies are all kind of joined. The, the, the further you go up the food chain, the more it looks like organized crime. The same thing happens in the, in the um, political and corporate world. People that have very important lawsuits against other people turned up committing suicide or turned up jumping out of fucking buildings. And this has just been going on forever. If you have money, you're knocking motherfuckers off. It happens. Well, yeah, like I said, if you have the yeah. money to fucking get away with it. Yeah. And if you have the cops on your sides and judges and fucking you have dirt on people and you have lots of money and you're infiltrated into the system and you are the system like you know he's he's too dangerous to be left alive you know he's he controls the courts I remember me <laughs> mace windu and the fucking <laughs> that's what they're doing okay and um it's strange that over the years many people that had very heavy lawsuits against rich people who have famous names turned up dead in a so-called civilized country like the united states <laughs> very strange Camp Guy said very, what, very was Hoffa a character featured in the latest Scorsese movie The Irishman yeah yes. we, we brought that up um, actually The Irishman is essentially about uh, the death of Hoffa and that The Irishman aka Frank Sheeran uh, was the one who killed him because Frank Sheeran apparently wrote a book about uh, that whole time period and when he was on his deathbed, I guess he said, oh, I was the one that killed Jimmy Hoffa, even though they were friends, like he like turned on him and stuff. But as I said, uh, that was a great movie, uh, which we reviewed, but most of the experts that I've seen like talking about this case um, say that it was probably bullshit, that Frank Sheeran probably did not. He was there, like he was around, but um, they don't think that he was the one that did it. I think even like some people even said like the Iceman that Kuklinski did it. Didn't he say that he killed Fr Jimmy Hoffa? I don't know. I don't think he. I don't think he did. But I, no, I mean, I he said it, but I don't think he actually did it. I think he just said it because it's a famous case, it and he's like, like, yeah, I want in on that I action. Don't I don't remember him actually saying that he did it. I think he did. Yeah. Although. The way Kuklinski was, it wouldn't surprise me if he led you to believe that he did it, but then he kind of denied ever telling you that he did it. That way there's plausible deniability. <laughs> it's probably like something. Kuklinski did do some shit. I don't know if he oh, did Oh, he everything. did, yeah. I don't know if he did everything that he said. But, some of that stuff sounded like, well, where's that cave? Yeah, some of this where's stuff, the and we did a show about him before, yeah. and I think I kind of came to the same conclusion where, I mean, he's dead now, right? So he can't, like, come get me. But, um... <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure he's dead. Yeah. But, um... Even though he did do, like, a lot of horrible shit, he was a hitman. No one's denying that. But I think that he was one of those guys that, to kind of inflate his reputation, mm. would take credit for a lot of things or, like, say he that he did do. this, that that he didn't really do. Or yeah. made it seem, like, a lot more gross and graphic yeah. just so people would be afraid of him. Um, you I know. still would have called him Mr. Kuklansky. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm not saying there weren't legit reasons <laughs> yeah. to be afraid of him, because there were. Yeah. I'm just saying he probably didn't even need to, like, inflate the shit. But yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure he probably did, though. So <laughs> I don't think that he actually killed Jimmy Hoffa, but I'm pretty sure, like, he either said outright or implied that he had. Yeah. But, but like I said, I think that's just because it's, like, easily one of the most famous, like, missing persons slash murder cases in U.S. history, right? He was a big dude. He was fucking very hot-blooded. But he could kill you cold-blooded fashion. And he was just big enough and meaty enough to just slip up behind you and just fucking choke you out into oblivion. He needed, needed weapon. But he did use them. He used every method. Including explosions. 
Remember that? He planted bombs, mm -hmm. poisons, shotgun blasts to the face. He was well-rounded. He did everything. <laughs> he was a well-rounded hitman. One dude he just killed with a wire. Oh my God, that'd be a good t-shirt yeah. too, wouldn't it? Well-rounded hitman. Yeah. With, all, with a bunch of different weapons on it. Yeah. That'd be super funny. Killed a dude with a wire while the dude was taking a piss. Remember that? That's Went not, up behind him, garroted him, turned him around. And not him cool, Kuklinski. Like I mean, at least let him finish sat there peeing. smoking a cigarette while he was dying. And then fucking dropped his ass and walked off. That's yeah. cold ass shit. That's a cold shit. shit. Yeah. Cold ass shit. Like I said, can't even let the guy finish pissing. <laughs> shit. Uh, he was trying to keep it off of it. <laughs> yeah, just... Ew. Yeah. See, that's a problem that seems like it yeah. could really easily could have been avoided. It's like you just wait till he's done peeing. And then no, you don't have to worry him. about it. Well, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to kill this dude when he's like on the on the can, yeah. like with explosive diarrhea. Well, that's like what you like do that. in special forces and stuff. Yeah. You get them when they're fucking not ready. So, they're, you know, you're trying to match. It's not a fair fight. It never is. Well, you know. Yeah. Why would you go into a fair fight? Yeah, that's a, su you'll, that's a sucker's you'll game take, right there. Yeah, you'll, <laughs> you'll, 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 if you're not cheating, then you're not winning. You know, what kind of war is this? You'd be fucking cheating. <laughs> That's how they do it. Uh, That's what makes special forces so special. They're not following the fucking rules. <laughs> That's why we're That's special. why it works. Yeah. Camp Guy says, I wouldn't believe that David Berkowitz has evolved into a gentle Uncle David Crosby type, but a born again Christian. Yeah. A lot of them go like that in prison, though. And I'm not sure how much I... I, I, you know, I just don't know how genuine a lot of it is. Well, I'm not saying, you know, maybe it is sometimes, but... It was a long time ago Berkowitz did that. You change a lot over the years. True. That I mean, doesn't mean he doesn't belong in there, though. Well, yeah, I don't think they should let his dumb ass no. out. Because I, I think a lot of the way, a lot of times that when serial killers or murderers do that kind of shit, it's because they want to look good for the parole board, yeah. you know, they want to get let out and shit like that. So, I don't know. You really, really, really have to be careful with that kind of shit. Uh, Sandra said, didn't the Iceman dance in a gay club in a funny suit and kill a guy while dancing? Yeah. Yeah, I've, yeah, I've heard that story. Yes. That's, that sounds like some shit he would do. He spilled cyanide on him, concentrated cyanide on him. It went into his skin and it killed him. He had it in a drink, like he was drinking it. Like I said, well-rounded. He spilled hitman. his drink on him. And Whoops. he goes, oh, I'm sorry. And he says he was dancing as fruity as he could. And, and he says nobody even paid any attention to him. Spilled it on the dude and then walked out. Nobody thought anything about it. And that dude died later. I just feel like, yeah. not, you know, I'm not giving anybody ideas or anything, but that method seems yeah. really, really good. Like, you'd think that that would seem like the best way to do it. You're not going to get hurt. No one's going to notice anything. You can, you like, to, be the fuck out of there before any of the shit goes you, down. You have to understand fucking, you have to understand chemistry. Well, I challenge you, know. you to find that. Cyanide's used in metalworking, but it's hard to Don't get. Don't challenge me. I can yeah. find it. <laughs> it's used in, used in metallurgy, but it's still, you know, they, they, they keep uh, keep an eye on who gets it. Yeah, and probably for that very reason. Yeah. But I'm just saying, if you can get it, that seems like a really good method because it's, it's low impact. Uh, it's low danger for you. Uh, no one would notice anything was amiss until later on. And then a... you'd already be fucking long gone by that time. Be risky, though. You might accidentally spill it on yourself. That's true. You just, you'd have to be careful about yeah. that. But, I don't know. It's, it seems better than just, like, fucking shooting a motherfucker in the middle of a big public area. Well, he did area. that, too, though. Well, I know. I know. <laughs> he just wanted to get the guy in public. He thought that was the best way. Yeah. Yeah. So he was always around. He, he had people with him all the time. So he had to get him in public. And that's what he could come up with. Like I said, that's, that's, yeah. that's pretty good. Pretty yeah. good. I'm just, you they know. got a video game called Hitman that has a lot of that kind of shit in it. <laughs> In case you want to practice yeah. for a future career. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the, he's bald too, like me, see? <laughs> oh, so that's why you shaved all your hair no, off. You're contemplating a new career move. Yeah, that's what it is. Into the assassination technology. No, I was going to get... Uh, <laughs> was, I'm going straight Vin Diesel on a motherfucker. Camp guy yeah. says they gave him one six ounce tin of tuna fish daily to eat. Yeah, that'll kill you eventually. Yeah. <laughs> Sandra said, "Of course, that's a method Jenny likes. It's poison." Yeah, I'm a big yeah. fan. I'm, I'm a big fan. Women are poisoners. Yeah, I'm a big fan of uh, of poisons. Well, it, it has that it has that romantic witchcrafty kind of vibe to it. I don't know. I just like that. 
And I like the yeah. whole aesthetic around like little poison bottles. Like I said, it's witchy. I'm, I'm into that. Plus, it's like super sneaky. And I like that kind of shit. Um, David June says, I still think we need a gaming show by Tom. Yeah. I'd have to look into it and see how other gaming shows do it, what the format's like, and then see how I would do it. Well, I don't know, because you could just do it the way you wanted to do it. You don't got to, like, watch other one, other ones. Yeah, but it might be interesting to spoon in fucking, you know what I mean, sc- screen captures and stuff like that of the game. Well, yeah, you would have to you do know? that, probably. Right. But... I don't know. I don't watch a lot of gaming channels. Like I said, I like Cinemassacre, like Angry Video Game Nerd, but I don't usually watch the video game ones. I've seen a few of them because they're funny, but um, usually I just watch his movie reviews. But I don't do, I don't really do any gaming, so I don't watch a lot of gaming shows. The ones that I've seen are just like 25 year old dudes like yelling, and I just like, I can't, yeah. uh, you know, that just gives me a migraine, so I don't watch it. All right, so we get ready to start the show? I reckon so. Oh, there's many? something else we want to tell the people. What's, what do we want to tell the people? Well, uh, Got a uh, message from um, our landlord. Oh, yeah. So we're not entirely sure how how this is going to turn out. but Pretty sure the landlord wants me to buy this place. Buy the place or move. Yeah, because the landlords might be selling the house. And we just rent this house. Yeah, I looked at the fucking numbers and the papers and uh, I could buy the place. It wouldn't change our monthly fucking bills. The mortgage would be the same as our payment. So it wouldn't affect me. We could do it. The problem is, is really the, the the really the only really good thing about this house is the location. I mean, it's a good house. Yeah. But for this price, ten miles up the road in Eustis, you can get twice a house for this. Yeah. I mean, fucking, they got houses out there for less than this, built in the 1950s out of stone, look like a damn Spanish castle, look like a damn Colombian drug lord mansion. They got those for sale for the same price as this, ten miles up the road. And those fucking houses are badass. All tile, floors, big arches, look like a damn Spanish castle. I'd have to look closer, more closely at it, but they're, they're fucking big. You know what I mean? Imagine me up there looking like one of the damn drug lord <laughs> up on a top You're going to get a white suit and like yeah, some obnoxious set. aviator yeah, sunglasses? Yeah, yeah, Unbutton your shirt yeah. to here, get a bunch of gold chains. Yeah, and there's fucking decks and Ferrari. shit outside and the fucking garages and shit and Big vaulted ceilings and shit. B- built in the 50s out of stone. Those bitches aren't going anywhere. Cinder block and stone. Thank you, David June, Been for sitting. the show. And here's two bucks yeah. to go for your house purchase. <laughs> right, yeah. I mean, like I said, we're not sure. We're meeting with them tomorrow. Yeah, we're going to see what they want. But the last time that they asked to see us, they wanted me to buy the place. But I was like, ah. Uh, I don't know if I want to, you know what I mean? This is a nice place. I don't want to move. I hate fucking moving. I do too. Everybody All hates right. moving. Moving sucks. Fuck. But this is a good rental, but I don't know if I want to fucking own this bitch. We'll see. We'll, well see, see that. They, yeah. Well, that's what, the price they that's wanted. why we were kind of like yeah. um, ambivalent about it because for the amount that they're asking, yeah. if we moved, like, like you said, like 10 miles away, we could get something like twice this better yeah. for less money because right. this area is like really getting built up it's getting built up this is a and all the and area. all the um house prices are going up right so yeah and the, i mean this house is what like 12 years old 13 years old and yeah. it's got it's it's in good shape still but it's got problems it's, got it's, it's gonna need a new roof it he's yeah. got cracks in the tile in the kitchen and yeah. shit like that the shower we doors need to be replaced fixture yeah, and it's so I don't know. So we're like these are like Mick Mansions. They look yeah. really good. They're real posh neighborhoods that they're in. Um, you know what I mean? Fucking with their own security and everything. But they're not really built to last. Uh, they're built more like fucking cocaine cowboy fucking quick buck type things. And uh, everybody's moving here from other states. So real estate in this particular area right here is going up. So if we do buy this house 15 years from now when it was paid off, this thing would be worth a lot of money, probably. Maybe. As long as it wouldn't be, as long as it wouldn't be the apocalypse 15 years from now. But the thing is, is like, like I said, some of those retro houses from the 50s and the 60s that were built down here during the classic era, these fuckers are bizarre, gorgeous, really. They, they're, they're Spanish houses, Spanish castle looking things. I'm still looking at them. I don't know what they're like to air condition, though. Well, yeah, that's kind of See. like a big consideration. So, yeah, so we're not really entirely sure. Like I said, we got to talk to them tomorrow. They're coming over. Yeah. And 
I don't know. Like I said, I you know the, they're they, not going to kick us out. They'd give us at least ninety days. Yeah, they wouldn't do that because they're and we've been here a long time. They have yeah. a ton of other properties. We've been yeah. here ten years. Yeah. Um. So they wouldn't just like kick us out on the street or anything. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure that they're trying to offload all of their properties. Maybe they're sick of dealing with it or yeah, whatever. They had thirteen homes. Yeah, they own thirteen houses that they rent out. Yeah. So and they're all paid for. Yeah, they, most of them are. Yeah, this one th- is. Yeah, this one's uh, entirely paid for. I think he's gonna hit me because he tried to hit me with four hundred twenty-five thousand. I was like, nah. Three hundred twenty-five thousand. No, four hundred. Oh, four hundred twenty-five. No, I just was like, nah. That's too much. It's too much for this area. For you, this, you for can get a new house. Four twenty-five. Uh, not in here. Not in here. Not here. But like ten miles up the fucking yeah. street. Four hundred twenty-five almost gives you twice this house. Five hundred thousand will get you a fucking mansion. And we can actually afford that. That's only like uh, two grand a month. Yeah. About that. Which, well, that's what the mortgage would be. Yeah. And it's twice the size. Which I mean, the rent here is eighteen hundred a rent. Yeah. So it's it's already eighteen. So. So it's already not that. that bad. And that also covers lawn crew. Yeah. Yeah. So. And security. Know. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's that's. And pool. That's what the HOA. The thing is, that's though, what is the that, HOA. Like. That fucking five hundred thousand house was nicer than this, a lot bigger, and had a pool. And it fucking, they didn't have to worry about housing commissions. It was on his own piece of land. Yeah, because HOA And it was only about 11 miles from here. I looked at it. Yeah? Yeah, it looked good. 11 miles? About 11 miles. Mm. Right outside Eustis. I don't know. I consider, like I said, I, you know, I don't want to, like, move so far away that it's going to be a pain in the ass to get to, like, downtown Orlando and get into Sanford and stuff. But, I mean, another, like, 10, 11 miles isn't that big of a deal. All right. So, I don't we'll know. We'll just see what they say. For we'll me. have to see what they do. It's like, I yeah. Mean, if it comes we... at me a good price, like, uh, we could buy this. I don't, that would save me from having to move. Yeah. It wouldn't affect the monthly payment, and you could always, we could always sell it. That's true. And get out of it. That's true. Yeah. But, you know, we'll see how it goes. Like I right. said, they're not going to kick us out on the street. I, don't, right. I hope not. No. <laughs> but I don't know. If we do have to move, I don't know how long they're going to give us. Yeah. Um, I hopefully we'll be able to make shows, though. Probably might miss some, but that's months down the line, probably. Yeah, I would think. Yeah. So, yeah. So we're kind of, like, in transition at the moment because we don't know if we're going to, like, be able to stay here or if we're going to have to, like, go somewhere else. Yeah. You know, that's all it is. But like Everyone's I said, we're asking we're, if we would consider moving because of the heat. Uh, no, I wouldn't. I would, but you know, because I, I, I hate the heat here. It's like because I, 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 I'm from here, so I'm like really sick of it. But I don't. I'm not entirely sure where I would want to go though, because there's like a lot of places that I've been to that I really liked. But living somewhere and visiting somewhere are two different things. So I'm not really sure, like where I would want to go if I could pick anywhere. I don't know. I'm happy with Florida. Well, yeah, I know you are. But yeah. like I said, was, I, I really don't like the weather here. <laughs> I just really don't. <laughs> but, you know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? All right, Sandra so said, I don't think we have gated communities in Germany. I never heard of that. It's like its own town. Well, sort of. Kind of. <clears throat> They're all built around the same time. It's got gates. Security to get in. You need cards or you need, need something on your uh, window of your car to get in. There's private security in the side. And usually there's a community pool, community, yeah, community, gym, community, community center. Sometimes there's a gym, although our yeah. our neighborhood doesn't have one. They'll bring in food trucks and fucking they'll have fit. Yeah, they had a whole like there. little food truck thing yesterday. Yeah. Got little parades. Yeah, parades inside. <laughs> and, <laughs> Shit uh, like that. All the houses are built around the same time and they all kind of have the same style. And there's like a housing commission. Everybody has to have... The fucking grass cut. You got you got fucking old fucking what's his name? BTK. You got, you got BTK running around town. You cut your grass, or they'll find you. Um, you have to. Or you, you got to paint your house you every paint your few house years. Every few and there's only like a, a certain amount of like uh, acceptable colors. colors. Yep. That way, it looks like an, a, a Disney amusement park. It looks like a theme park. Kinda. Kinda. It, the, the place looks like a theme park. All the houses are on the same theme. Yeah. Yep. So nothing's out of place. I wouldn't say it's sterile, but it's posh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know. They're nice. It's yeah. It's it's a nice. It's but a like nice I said, neighborhood. a lot of them are made quickly. And you yeah. Can, and you so can, some of them are like expensive, but they're not really built with yeah. top of the line. They're not meant to last. No. Because the people that build them and buy them tended to like plan to stay in them for ten years and then sell them and move. Yeah. 
and somebody else gets them. Yeah, I don't know. So, like I said, this this house I think is twelve years old, thirteen years old, something yeah. like that. It was built like that long ago, but you know, it's still like in decent shape. But it does have like some. That's why I was talking about some of the traditional Spanish houses that are here. They were built them back in the fifties and the sixties. They were built to to kind of look timeless. They all kind of look like eighteen hundreds, kind of Spanish eighteen hundreds maybe. Um, and they were built out of brick and stone and stucco so they're they're permanent they're structurally super sound they survive storms men been sitting there forever yeah because that's kind of something you, that's a consideration you have to take because yeah. this can this like survive a hurricane <laughs> right no the fucking those things have been sitting there since the 50s they've been hit many times and no they're fine and uh they look good it's just that like i said they're they're spanish style look like a castle yeah yeah. Thank you, David June. Have BTK tell me to mow my grass and pick up dog shit. <laughs> Gotta understand something. <laughs> if you're living in a community like this, an upstanding community, you have to cut your grass. Three and a half inches. <laughs> Take your dog somewhere. If the dog poops on your lawn, pick it up. Get a Ziploc bag, turn it inside out, put your hand in the Ziploc bag, pick up the poop, to turn the bag inside out, zip it. Put it in your pocket. <laughs> If you don't put it in your pocket, people are going to watch, see you walking around carrying a, you know, a bag of dog shit. You'll, <laughs> you'll look fucked up. <laughs> put it in your pocket. It'll smush a little bit, but it won't go through. It'll get nice and warm. Yeah. I On a will... cold day, it'll warm you up. <laughs> I will say, in this neighborhood's defense, like I said, um, you know, the Seminole Wakaiva Trail is, like, right behind the house. And, like, a lot of people, like, jog and ride their bikes and sometimes ride horses on, although you don't see that that much. Um, I almost never, like tons of people walk their dog on that trail. I almost never see dog shit on that trail because 99.99% mm. of people pick up yeah. half their dog, their dog's shit. Yeah. I very rarely see dog shit. I see shit sometimes, but it's usually wild animal shit. Like sometimes yeah. I'll see like bear shit or something like that, but I hardly ever see dog shit. So, yeah. you know. Good on everybody. All right, let's go ahead and start the show. We've been in this for about an hour already. Probably. We got well, chip 48, 48, 48 minutes. minutes. It's time to do it, people. Okay, y'all ready? I know you guys love the sidetracks and shit. <laughs> we got to talk about some serious gangster. Serious gangster type shit. Where the fuck is Tila anyway? Oh, I don't know. She's not in there. No. Okay. She she, doesn't, she doesn't she's not love present. Us anymore. She, she missed class. She doesn't love us anymore. That bitch don't love us no more. She's missing class. Well, no, she's over there in San Francisco, and then she's like, what she's doing is she couldn't get home. She had to jump all those hurdles of human feces and fucking drug needles and shit <laughs> as fucking as fucking San Francisco fucking spirals down the toilet Xanada said why can't Tom channel a more pleasant serial killer like Bundy or Son of Sam Ted Bundy, <laughs> Ted Bundy just talked like a fucking yuppie though hey well you know yeah, yeah, hey you know it's just uh, average yeah he guy. just talked like an average, average white, white douchebag of the, of the time yeah yeah well you have to understand you know yeah, actually oh did we a... i okay before we get into before we get into the jimmy hoffa thing can i just say you remember you guys remember we did the sidetrack show wednesday night and then tom was like insistent that we had to go out afterwards so oh yeah yeah, yeah. we That's ended up i almost forgot about this so we so we did end, end up going out like to yeah. mannequins and it stormed like we yeah. left and it was like fucking pouring yeah, down she's fucking sitting there and i was like god time. damn my it fuck. what the fuck you I'm made me like put all these clothes and now my all my makeup's gonna wash off because yeah, i'm like, like That's it. i'm shit. going back home i'm going back i was home. like no, like, no you came all the way down here so we yeah. gotta go and guess what it was at mannequins on wednesday night it was karaoke night karaoke yeah it was fucking karaoke there was like seriously i think there was 10 people there like yeah. all night long because the Sing weather the was shitty yes yeah, um yeah but it actually ended up being like kind of funny though yeah um, they had one dude he was about i don't know 60 skinny he's wearing a sequenced fucking top and bottom fucking bell bottoms real tight he had long fucking curly hair he looked like he looked like he looked like fucking robert plant robert plant Imagine if Robert Plant decided to do Gay Night in Vegas, that's and kind of had flat and hadn't like fluffed his hair. And out. hadn't fluffed. That's what he looked like. All right, and he was he sang all fucking night. He wasn't bad though. He yeah, he was, he was actually. And he, he was singing to us at the table, and he go to other table. He was definitely the star of the night. I'm trying to think. Definitely oh, I remember he sang uh, "Getting to Know You." Yeah, yeah, that I was remember his first one. He drove everybody out of the damn club <laughs> with that, and then he fucking started singing. 
And then a friend of mine was up there singing fucking Ozzy Osbourne. Okay, that was pretty good. Yeah, he, yeah, he, he sang did. Mr. Crowley. Mr. Crowley, yeah. I helped him sing that one. I was singing next one. <laughs> Maybe we ought to go back and do it again. <laughs> I tried to try well, to get me to sing, and I was like, I, "Well, I, no, you went to the DJ and was trying to get, hey, like play something, like play some Duran Duran or some Morrissey or something, so she'll that. get up." Yeah, you did. No, I didn't you told him it's like, yeah, I, yeah, I remember. Because mm. I came over there, I'm like, remember. "What do you do? Are you like doing some like shit behind my back?" And mm -mm. you know, no, it's was just. He's like, "Yeah, get up there and like sing Duran Duran or something." And I'm just like, "I'm not singing. No, I, Leave I, me alone. I, that's not what I told him. <laughs> I asked him what was up. I said, "Can you have a pretty good night?" And I said, that, "And I said that uh, you know, so I'm Tom, and uh, that's my girlfriend Jen. We're friends with uh, with Big Tom. That's all I said. Big Tom. Yeah, Big Tom. He says we do with the posters and shit here. Mm -hmm. he, says, he says if you guys if you guys need any posters, just fucking talk to Jen or Big Tom. We'll do it for you. That's what I said. And I kind of I kind of laughed too because the DJ because he was just playing regular '80s music like yeah. when there was nobody singing. He had a cute girlfriend though. She could sing. Oh, that was his girlfriend? Okay. His girlfriend, yeah, yeah, she got up there and sang. Yeah, I think yeah. she sang that. What's that song? Drops of Jupiter. Who the fuck yeah. does that song? I, don't know, I can't remember. That's some 90s shit. That's some 90s shit. Because um, as soon as she started singing, I'm like, oh man, I hate this song. But I'm like, oh, actually, yeah. she can sing though. Um, but yeah, so there was kind of like, so he just played like 80s shit. But then I laughed because he played, of all things, he played the Dennis Leary song, Asshole. And like, yeah. then he karaoke it. And I just yeah. died laughing. I actually, I, I actually really like that song. I, I still know all the words and everything. I used to have it on my phone. Yeah. It might still be on there, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. Train. That's the name of it. Yeah, that's who does it. I can remember who did. James uh, said that in our uh, Iceman episode that Iceman did say he uh, was, I told you, was yeah. in a party that killed Hoffa. Okay. He did say. He I did say. that. I don't um, believe him, though. I don't believe him either. No. I just Nobody does. No. Like I said, he's just showing off. <laughs> I don't think the, t the time wouldn't like really he's that dead, right? He's yeah. dead. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. No, they wouldn't have used a dude like that. I kind of feel like no. No. And it, well, the thing about it was that Jimmy Hoffa had to know that he was in danger. So I kind of feel like maybe the scenario was they probably had somebody that he trusted. That's what I was gonna say. It was you know? one of his friends. Yeah. That did it. Had to be, because he no. wouldn't go with them otherwise. Because no. no. he'd be like, "Yeah, no, I'm not getting in it's that always, car." It's always, it's always the the main mo is it, it's one of your friends. Yeah. And really, when you think about it, that's the humane way. Think about it. True. You know what I mean? You don't have an enemy that's killing you. It's one of your friends. It's yeah. not really a hate thing. They're killing you out of self defense because they know you're going to talk. Yeah. So instead of making it a bad experience, they're keeping you calm. And, you know, the minute your back's turned, they fucking hit you with something, knock you out, and then choke you to death or whatever. Yeah. And you didn't even know it hit you. Or they pop you in the back of the head, want your friends talking to you, the other guy fucking shoots you. Yeah. Something like that. Bees has said... It, it, they're comfortable and talking and don't even see it coming, and it's their friends that do it. That's 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 the best way. Bees Nest said, Sammy the Bull said Iceman was full of shit, too. Mm. Yeah. Like I said, he said a lot of things. I'm not saying that he didn't kill a lot of people. He's full of shit he on did. that subject. But yeah, I don't think he was full of shit on everything. Maybe on but a few he just things. like he just embellished a little bit. He just embellished. The whole thing about the cave and feeding guys to the rats during the cave, I don't buy it. He would tell people where the cave was. It's a good story. So, yeah, good story, but I don't believe so. <laughs> the story about the ice cream man. I don't know if I buy that. Oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah. That the ice cream man taught him everything about it, and that the ice cream man was going around killing all the kid killing the parents of the kids and shit and that he'd learned from him. I don't think... He saw that in a horror movie, I'm pretty that. sure. <laughs> I don't believe that actually happened. I remember that movie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, Oracle said, our oldest cat died a week ago today. I'm still feeling rocky about... Oh, I'm sorry about that. That always makes me so sad when people say that. Uh, yeah, Beast Nest said he wasn't a hitman for the mob. Uh, yeah, all right, so... It's hard to know what, what is the mob and what isn't. I, I yeah, it's a very it's a very way. nebulous Nebula. concept. Sure. People who may have been criminals probably hired him to do things every now and then, but hiring him would have been he dangerous. He was a freelance contractor. Yeah, he's a freelance contract. Hiring him would have been dangerous though. He had to come back and killed you because he knew that you, he knew that you paid him to kill somebody. So that's leaving a damn. Uh, you know what I mean? A, a loose yeah. hand. Somebody can like finger me for this yeah. shit. So I'm going to pop this bitch too. Wouldn't be surprised if you go here, here's a thousand dollars, kill that dude. And he goes there and kills that dude. And you give him the thousand dollars. And then he comes back and goes, thank you for thousand dollars. And a couple days later, he comes and kills you before you, yeah. before you get pinched. 
I wouldn't trust that dude. He said that he was paid $40,000 for killing Jimmy Hoffa. I'm just not buying it. I don't buy it either. No. I don't think so. No, I think his friends killed him and nobody was paid anything. It was just to uh, keep from getting in trouble. Yeah, just, you know, cost you doing business. Yeah. Just he was going to blab, so somebody needed to take him out. Probably. Yeah, I don't think it was done with hate either. They just, he was a security threat. He was a security risk. He had to go. Probably. Yeah. Well, like you said, I think that happened a lot back then. Yeah. They didn't kill you because they didn't like you. They killed you because they thought you were going to, like, roll over on them. Yeah. Which I think was the They didn't situation. want to go to jail. Yeah, which I think was the situation here. All right, so let's kind of go into uh, the history, context, stuff like that, before we get into talking about the disappearance, which is kind of like the end of his life, right? So let's talk about... Uh, so he's born in uh, Brazil, Indiana. I didn't even know there was a town called Brazil in Indiana. Oh, man, every, every fucking state has an Athens, too. Well, I know that. Yeah. I know that, but I didn't know everybody was like, I didn't know there was a Brazil, Indiana. But now now I know. Uh, so Jimmy Hoffa, or James Riddle Hoffa, because his mom's maiden name was Riddle, uh, he was born on Valentine's Day of 1913. Now, what ended up happening was that when he was seven years old, his dad, who was a coal miner, died of lung disease. Uh, probably because of like the coal mine shit. You know what I mean? A lot of them had the, got those lung diseases, right? So his dad died. And, um, so pretty much from the time he was 14 years old, he kind of had to like drop out of school and get a job to support his family. Cause presumably he was the oldest, uh, child, right? So he actually never finished high school far as I know, cause he had to drop out when he was 14 and start working. Now, during this time period, like I said, early 20th century, 20s, 30s, stuff like that, like prior to the Depression, um, you know, they didn't have a lot of the labor laws and stuff like that that are on the books nowadays. And there was a lot of uh, strife between companies and workers. Uh, A lot of the, there was a lot of strikes and stuff like that. A lot of strikes like ended in violence. Like a lot of companies would like pay off cops or like, you know, criminals or whatever to kind of like, you know, beat up people that were striking or whatever. So there was like a lot of uh, tension on both sides. Let's call it tension. (laughs) It was worse than that, but it was like a lot of violence on both sides, right? And then when the Great Depression comes along, like in 1929, um, then you kind of have a problem where you have all the workers that like kind of want to unionize, but then the labor pool was so large because there was such large unemployment that companies could pretty much like do whatever they wanted. They were just like, well, okay, if you want to unionize, you're fired because we have like a whole line of dudes, you know, lined up like for your job. So, you know, so there's that whole thing. So like I said, there was a lot of violence around this time period. And uh, so this is kind of the context that Jimmy Hoffa comes into. Like I said, he had kind of seen the uh, working conditions that his dad had been working in Uh, And it ended up dying of lung disease because the, uh, you know, conditions in the coal mine were not ideal. So that might have been something that sort of like forged his early identity, I suppose. Now, so in the early 1930s, uh, Jimmy Hoffa, who is now like 19 years old, uh, he participates in his first uh, labor dispute, I guess you would call it. So what he did was he, uh, he had been working kind of like, you know, just working class type of jobs. And he got together with a bunch of warehouse workers who worked for Kroger, which is a grocery store chain based in Detroit. So these, all these uh, workers have been working on the loading docks and were, it was, you know, it was like really hard work. They weren't making enough money to really live on. I think, believe it was something like 32 cents an hour or something like that. Um, and another thing that the company would do was that when there wasn't a shipment coming in, they would basically like you'd be on call you had to be on the um you know on the loading bay right but you know waiting for the shit to come in so you could unload it but they weren't paying you for that time they would only pay you for the time that you were unloading the shit they wouldn't pay you for all the time that you were waiting for the shit but they wouldn't let you leave at the same time you know what i'm saying so so a lot of workers thought that was kind of unfair, which it is, you know, why, why should you have to be there on call and they're not paying you for it? So that they were kind of like disputing that. Um, so, you know, you wouldn't even start getting the hourly wage and wage until the shipments came in and you started unloading the shit. 
So what ended up happening, uh, you know, a bunch of the workers, including Jimmy Hoffa, who, like I said, he was 19 at the time, they said, okay, well, here's something we can do. When a shipment comes in, um, which this particular shipment happened to be a bunch of strawberries and they come in on ice. So obviously you have to like pack them up and get them in the like warehouse so like pretty quickly before the shit spoils, right? Because they don't have like, you know, fancy refrigeration and all that shit like we have nowadays. So... Jimmy Hoffa and the other workers said, well, you know, if we just like stand here and leave all the shit out here until, you know, they meet our demands, then, um, you know, maybe we'll get them to budge on it. And that did actually work uh, because it was a big (coughs) shipment and Kroger did not want to incur the loss that would have come with all of these strawberries going bad. So they said, "Okay, fine, we'll actually pay you for when you're waiting around rather than just paying you for when you're unloading the trucks. So, uh oh. Moving further ahead into the <laughs> Moving future. Moving further ahead into, into the future. The future. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting closer to my destination. Oh. Sorry, I couldn't swallow. Yeah. Okay, so this particular, um, you know, thing being like, it was kind of like small time because it was really only one company and they weren't really asking for anything super crazy. They were just saying, hey, can you like, actually pay us for the time that we're here instead of just the time that we're moving around. You know what I mean? So Kroger said that they would do that. Like I said, it was limiting, but, uh, you know, Jimmy Hoffa, I guess his sort of role in, you know, leading or organizing this particular strike, um, kind of made him, you know, put him on the radar, I guess. Now, a bunch of the people that he was uh wor- he that he worked with at the time that worked at the Kroger uh you know grocery store at that time that were unloading that helped him with the strike um would kind of stick with him for like years and years like going forward would like be part of his inner circle or whatever um they actually called them the strawberry boys because you know it was strawberries so at this point uh in the 1930s he kind of gets a little bit of a name for himself in Detroit And so he decides that he's going to uh, join up with an established union uh, so he could like kind of help them out. So he starts, so he joins up with the Teamsters. Now the Teamsters had actually been around since the late 19th century. They're called the Teamsters because it was originally just, it's like a, um, like a shipping union. It was like net, you know, in the thirties it was truckers, but back in the old days before they had, trucks obviously it was horse-drawn teams so they had like you know wagons with like horses uh drawing the teams so that's why they're called the teamsters thank you david june i'll be buying a co-worker a fat boy t-shirt just gonna pay it off with this chat message you later for details okay all right all right <clears throat> so thank you very much uh for that so he joins up with the teamsters uh like i said who had been around for a long time they were it's mostly like a trucking union uh or shipping industry union so basically uh all the him and the other strawberry boys that had like helped him out with his uh initial strike um you know they kind of like applied to join the teamsters so the teamsters let them in and uh noticed that jimmy hoffa was actually a very good um activist very good organizer uh he was good at like getting people you know people he was a likable dude and everything like that so they gave him a job as an organizer um, and kind of uh, wanted him to sign up new members uh, um, among the truck drivers in Detroit. So that was kind of his first, you know, big introduction, I guess, to like the labor movement. He would go around. <laughs> One thing they said he would do was that when the truckers were like asleep in their trucks, he would go up and like bang on the truck doors and like wake them up. And then he would like start talking to them and like try to get them to like join the union right so that's kind of uh what he did and he was actually very successful at this um because at this point in the 1930s when he had joined um the membership in the teamsters had kind of like it wasn't going down but it wasn't really going up either but him joining um actually got a new a lot of new members into the union because he was a really good at like convincing people to join it now, um, so <laughs> this, the thing about it, it's, it's funny too, because when I said he would go around like knocking on the truck windows, they said a lot of times he would get, um, 
one of the first things the truck driver would do was that he would come out the truck door like swinging the tire iron or whatever because he thought somebody was like robbing his truck because that was something that would happen a lot like if the trucker you pull over to like to rest like truckers do nowadays at the rest stop and um you know so it was like some fucking highway robbery going on somebody would come up and try to like steal all the shit out of your truck uh so so he uh he didn't get too be he didn't get beat up during this time period but it was kind of like i said it was kind of like a rough time around this time like with a lot of the uh disputes and everything so you know but he was uh i think the reason that a lot of people liked him and that a lot of people related to him he was a little dude i think he was only like five foot five or something like that and he came from a very very working class background like i said he never graduated high school he started working when he was 14 and he always worked like kind of manual labor and he so he came across as a very like regular joe type of dude and so a lot of people could relate to him and I think that's why he was probably uh, really good at what he did. Now, so the thing about it, though, is that because of the violent disputes between companies and workers, a lot of unions at the time, even though some laws had been passed under Roosevelt that, you know, you technically, in some cases, couldn't be fired for trying to organize a union, um, that wasn't always the way shit played out in reality, even though technically you had the right to do that. Uh, because, you know, a lot of companies and stuff like that would use strong arm tactics. So at this point, like the unions were kind of like, well, maybe we need our own muscle. We need to start doing the same shit that they're doing so we can kind of get, uh, you know, get some of what we want. So basically, you know, like I said, there were a lot of really bad, um, you know, conflicts back then where some people got shot, killed uh, and whatnot. So I think this is kind of where the Teamsters started getting hooked up with the mob in sort of small, because it, it was kind of like their hired muscle type of shit because they knew that they were going into these conflicts and that that maybe sometimes uh, cops or other like criminals or something like that might be paid to shoot at them or kick their asses or whatever. So they felt like they needed something to fight back against that. So that's probably why this whole mafia Teamsters shit started out and why Jimmy Hoffa came to be associated with certain members of the mob. You looked like you were going to say something. Yeah, I was going to say... Um, <clears throat> um, David Jean was talking about shirts and stuff, all yeah. right, which which reminded me. Bee's Nest, he's got, he keeps bugging me. He says he wants some shirts. He wants some news designs. Oh, okay. Want an o OCP design, for, you know, like from Robocop? Easy okay. to do, all right? Want one of those done? Well, let me write it down. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm going to shoot the screen for it, and I want to do a Canon Films logo. Well, shirt. I still have the logo. I have the logo you have for that, that right? I just haven't. Those would be good sellers. I think our I, I think I think our subscribers would like those. Yeah. The Canon film ones is fucking universal. I think a lot of people get a thirteen o'clock labeled on the back, Canon films. That bitch looks badass. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like Canon's I said, it's gone. Yeah. I have the yeah. logo. I just haven't yeah. like shot the negative. We gotta of it shoot yet. it and get it done, and I'll do it. Yeah. Place an order for it, and I'll make them. I got the screens. Yeah, we got like a bunch of yeah. Uh, we got a bunch of yeah. All right, bees. I, I told you, bees. I told you I'd do it. He's been sending us gifts and shit, so gonna help help him out. Yeah, I'll send him some shit. Okay, so well, let's see where was I? Okay, so Jimmy Hoffa mm -hmm. actually got a lot of his experience in labor organizing from a dude named Farrell Dobbs, um, who was the head of the Minneapolis local chapter of the Teamsters, and like I said, this was kind of like. Um, it's basically a thing where Dobbs, he was kind of like using, like I said, a lot of, uh, the corporate, you know, the company's tactics against them using a lot of violence and stuff. Um, and he was actually able to do, make a lot of wins like in that situation. So I kind of think, like I said, that's why a lot of this shit was going on at the time. Um, you know, so it was kind of like, it, it, like I said, you kind of had to get involved in this. That's basically what it was. So I kind of like, I got to go to the bathroom. Okay, you, you. <laughs> you need to take a break, huh? Yeah. Go ahead really... and go to the restroom, Jenny. Yeah. Go I rest. Mean, go, go talk. Go take a bath. Go talk about. All right. So we, so I here mean, we are. You said you know about this, so talk about it. <laughs> All right. She's going to, looks like Grandpa's, 
Grampus Hammer just showed in. What's up, Grampus? Xanadu's drinking fucking kombucha. That's, there's nothing in that, Grampus. So anyway, she's kind of, she's telling me, oh man, keep talking. I'm gonna fucking say whatever I want to say. I think it's a good idea, though, to have uh, OCP shirt. You know, the big fucking Omni Consumer Products from fucking Ro Ro uh, Robocop? That'd be a good, good shirt. The logo is really good. And Canon Films is very similar. And I, you know, I know a lot of people fucking grew up watching those fucking cheesy ass canon, canon action movies. They were fucking good, you know, for as bad as they were. And because that studio is fucking defunct, you can just make a shirt on it, you know. I think fucking you guys might like that. I think she's coming back. Think of here. Which brand I should talk about already? I was talking about the shirts. We don't. We, 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 <laughs> see, she's policing. Me. I came in and you weren't talking. <laughs> I said, "Here she comes." I know. I heard you. <laughs> I said, "I want to." Um, I, I think those two designs would be good. I think they'd be very popular. Okay. Canon, Canon, and OCP. Okay. Well, yeah. I wrote. I wrote it down. Yeah. Like I said, I have the Canon. One right. Already. It's easy. Yeah, and it's easy one color prints. But I haven't. I they just haven't great. done the negative. Yeah. Yeah. That's all. If I can come up with something else, I'll think of it. Yeah. All right. So basically, okay. So this is kind of, like I said, this is kind of like a complicated, <laughs> this is just like so much like fucking complicated shit. And I'm trying to like not to lose my place on all these fucking notes, but you know how it goes. So, um, so they're basically trying to get together all of the, these kind of like disparate unions right this is kind of where the afl cio came from um you know because they're all kind of fighting against each other different like turf and everything like that there was a lot of violence like i said you know that was going on not not only between the companies and the unions but also between other you know factions of the unions shit like that so basically okay so in all this kind of like violence that was going on you know as the teamsters as these unions were kind of organizing at a national level. Um, Jimmy Hoffa, he goes and uh, reaches out to this um, guy that he knew that was a friend or a friend or a family member of one of his former girlfriends. Um, so she had married after they had dated, like when they were younger, she had married this dude named Frank O'Brien. Now Frank O'Brien uh, was actually a driver for a Kansas City mob boss. Now, Frank ended up dying not too long after, you know, they, you know, started talking to each other. I don't know how he died. I don't know if it was like he got bumped off or he just died like regular. But uh, Frank and Sylvia, who was his wife's name, they had a son named Chucky O'Brien. Now, Chucky O'Brien would kind of become almost kind of like Jimmy Hoffa's like adopted son, sort of. Now, Jimmy Hoffa had actually married um, this girl... Come on in, Pokey. Open the door. Well, hi. She opened the door on her own. You opened the door on your own, huh? Good girl. Good yeah. girl. It's all good. She's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> You're not trying to keep me out, are you? No, I'm not trying to keep you out. Oh. He had actually married a girl that he had met. She worked at a laundry, and um, he met her during a strike, like where the laundry workers were striking for better benefits, better pay. Uh, and they kind of hit it off. So they married. They had a couple of kids, but they also had this other kid like Ch he wasn't a kid kid but you know a little bit older named chucky o'brien who like i said would kind of become um sort of like jimmy hoffa's adopted kid and he would also kind of like factor a lot into later shit that like happened to him now sylvia who was like i said jimmy hoffa's former girlfriend and who who he kind of first approached and they kind of got involved in the mob shit she actually uh after her hu first husband died she ends up getting involved with this other gangster named Frank Coppola, and that was Chucky's godfather. Now, this dude was kind of pretty instrumental in really getting the Teamsters involved with like all the mob people, right? He was kind of like their the gateway, <laughs> the gateway drug, I guess. So basically, the, so that was kind of like a um, like that. Seven. Did we lose connection? Look. It's still green. 
It's still, must be just my tablet. Maybe it's just your tablet. Okay. I mean, my shit's still green. Okay. Uh oh, buffering. Somebody says. Mm -mm. Okay. Well, hopefully it comes back. My light's still green. Okay. Just give it a second. It didn't go red. I mean, it went red a little while back. It's but not showing live for me. Well, hopefully it comes back. Let's see. This is like, oh man. You're back. I shouldn't be. I'm now at high speed. Yeah, you buffered Bert for a little bit, but it's good now. Okay. Yeah, I didn't lose my connection, right. but, you know. Okay. So, 1937, Jimmy Hoffa gets, um, he gets elected to the presidency of Detroit Local 299. Now, he stayed president of this um, even after he got, like, um, he was, like, the leader of all, pretty much all of Detroit's local chapters of the Teamsters at this point. But Detroit Local 9 299 was the one that he was kind of most associated with. Um, now at this point, I guess it was like they were, uh, he got a draft deferment actually for World War II because, um, they thought that he would do, like he was able to successfully argue that, um, <coughs> that he would be more valuable stateside, uh, because he was helping run the transportation sector. So he, um, got off and got to stay here and do what he was doing. Now... Like I said, it, it seemed like after the kind of like violence, after all of the labor unions kind of became mob associated, but it wasn't, you know, they had actually gotten a lot of the things that they wanted. So it wasn't, you know, so much fucking uh, fighting and shit like that going on all the time. Um, basically, Jimmy Hoffa was actually like a pretty um, popular dude, particularly in the Detroit area in the manufacturing and the shipping sector, because all of the guys that got unionized under the Teamsters, um, their wages went like way up uh, and they got a lot more benefits. So a lot of them, even later on, like when they found out like about all the mob ties and everything, they didn't really care all that much because yeah. they were basically like, hey, we're feeding our families, so. It's funny hearing you talking about the Detroit area during this era, back when it worked. Me and Granther's Hammer, who's in the, there's an ex-cop in the comment section. We grew up among the ruins of Detroit. I lived on lived in 2nd and West Hancock once I got out of damn Detroit, near Cass Corridor for a while before I joined the Army. And it was funny because Detroit looked like Beirut, a bombed-out, empty hulk of a city. You, can, or you could rent a whole building for a couple hundred bucks. You could, the goth kids had a shit ton of fun there, man, at City Club and fucking the shelter. We had a good time there, but it was just funny to see a fucking vacant city, a huge metropolis just go. It's all torn down now. A lot of the shit that I remember is torn down now. The houses around it. But um, I think everybody will tell you that um, the conduct of these labor unions had a lot to do with the destruction of Detroit. And we went to high school with a guy named John Copera. John Copera is a he's a big executive in Ford Motor Company now. He designed a lot of stuff for Ford Mustang. He made the new uh, several of the new Mustangs back when 04 came out. He was behind that. And Copero, man, he was a fucking really good, really good dude. I mean, fucking Grampers remembers him. John was the shit. There was a lot of talent in that area. But the corruption of these dudes here destroyed Detroit. They destroyed Detroit. That's why movies like Robocop appeared on the back of this shit. Grampers will tell you. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> it's funny, man. The actions of just a few dudes at the top can create a culture of fucking corruption that eventually can just bring an entire city down, just like Raz Al Ghul out of damn fucking Batman. Like, this city is too evil to... to <laughs> too evil and corrupt to, to survive. It must be brought down. It's like... It, that's kind of what happened. And it wasn't just those riots. Like they had race riots and it never really recovered, but that wasn't the whole thing. It was also these unions. You just couldn't do business there. They just squeezed it and squeezed it and all the money went away. Yeah. I'm done. <laughs> it just ran. Well, I know. It just well, ran. Well, I'm never sure when you're done, so I'm I always ran, have ran, to ran. so I always have to pause. No, I'm just talking about what the greatness that was Detroit. You have to you had to go there to see it back in the day. When it was just a corpse of a city before they tore it down. It was just magnificent. It was like urbex, ur urban explorers fucking heaven, you know? It was beautiful and abandoned, just ruins. Yeah. 
And it was just because of the corruption. Corruption sucked all the money out of it. Yeah. Globalization. It all went to China. It, although, you know, you have Ford and GM still, but it's just not what it was. Hearing this time, you know what I mean? Hearing about this time, it was an empire back then. Like in Detroit helped us win World War II with all those goddamn Sherman tanks. They built a lot of cool shit. They were a good people. The Michiganders. <clears throat> it's all gone, though, though, though now. It's, it's changed. Go ahead. Well, everything's changed. Yeah, yeah. That's just the way of the world. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of them moved away. Yeah. So, yeah. So, like I said, we're now we're, like, in the 40s, 50s. Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? Uh, a lot of the truck drivers, like I said, that were in the Teamsters, they actually were able to get a health and welfare fund. They got, like, a pension. They got, like, better pay and shit like that. So they were very happy about that. 1952, uh, Jimmy Hoffa became one of the Teamsters National Vice Presidents. Um, the president at that time was named Dave Beck. Uh, Hoffa was the second in command. So at this point, the Teamsters moved their headquarters to D.C. And uh, Jimmy Hoffa moved there part time. Um, so basically what ended up happening, uh, Dave Beck, the president of the Teamsters at that time, uh, sort of got into like some legal hot water. So Jimmy Hoffa was kind of essentially running the shit uh, while he was, you know, doing the shit that he was doing, like getting into trouble or whatever. Now... What ended up happening with Beck? And they don't necessarily know if, like, Jimmy Hoffa maybe, like, gave some tips to, like, whoever was investigating just to get him out of the way, or if it just happened, like, randomly or somebody else had anything to do with it. Um, so what ends up happening with Dave Beck is that there was a committee on union corruption uh, headed by a senator named John McClellan from Arkansas. Sorry, there's, like, a mosquito in here or something like yeah. that. Um so, uh, so basically what happens, they have, they start having hearings, uh, on this particular issue. Now the hired counsel at the time for these, uh, for these hearings was, uh, the very famous Robert F. Kennedy. Now this is before, this is prior to, uh, JFK becoming president, obviously, um, you know, JFK, who was Robert F. Kennedy's older brother, uh, was then a Senator and he was also on the committee. And they were kind of like looking into, like I said, you know, new regulations for unions and because there was so much corruption. Now, what ended up happening was that Dave Beck, who, like I said, was then the president, um, he didn't do so good, <laughs> like at the hearings. And um, he what ended up happening was that every time they asked him a question, he would just basically be like, take the fifth. I take the fifth on that. Take the fifth. If you're not from the United States, taking the Fifth Amendment is that's you don't um, you have the right to not in incriminate yourself. So a lot of times they'll just plead the Fifth Amendment saying, basically, I don't want to say anything and you can't make me. So that's kind of what he did. Um, and because he did that, uh, didn't really didn't really like read too well with the public. So he was kind of like um, going to be ousted. Right. Um, he would actually eventually end up going to jail, although that would be a few years down the line. Uh, at this point, these hearings, which I said were very, very, um, I mean, the public was, uh, they were on TV. So like a lot of people were watching them and it was like, you know, millions of people were watching it. So it was kind of like a big deal, like in the media at the time. Now, what ended up happening too, was that because of these hearings, the AFL CIO decided they wanted to kick the Teamsters out of their, uh, organization. That was a four to one vote. Um, just because they said we don't want to be associated with all of that uh, corruption and, you know, the media is kind of making a big deal about it, so we don't really want to be known with them. Now, at this point, um, so Jimmy Hoffa, because Dave Beck is in such hot water, he is sort of the, the de facto head of the Teamsters at this point. And it seems like maybe he could have you know, step forward because like I said, he was a popular uh, guy. He was a well-liked dude. So he could have come forward and kind of said, yeah, I'm going to like root all the corruption out of the Teamsters. And he kind of did that, but it didn't, I don't know if anybody really bought it necessarily. Um, Jimmy Hoffa actually did have to testify before the McClellan committee. And for whatever reason, Robert Kennedy really got a fucking hard on for, 
getting rid of this dude, right? It's like they, so like, because remember I mentioned earlier that Robert Kennedy and JFK and Jimmy Hoffa were like <laughs> blood enemies. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was like, it was a big deal. And I'm not entirely sure why. Um, Jimmy Hoffa did not like the Kennedys because he thought that they were um, essentially like Silver Spoon you know, they, they had grown up in wealth and it's like, they didn't know because, you know, Jimmy Hoffa was like more of a working class dude. And he's like, you know, you never had to work for anything or anything like that. So I think he kind of like, didn't like him because of that, because he thought they were maybe out of touch. Might've been some other reasons as well, but that was uh, kind of one thing that I saw brought up. He thought they were just privileged, you know, like overly privileged and they didn't really know how normal people lived. Uh, and like I said, for whatever reason, Robert F. Kennedy decided he really, really hated Jimmy Hoffa and he just made it his fucking sworn mission to put him in prison. Right. Um, you know, so it's kind of like, it's, it's interesting too, because the Kennedys, um, were kind of like that. I mean, they made most of their money from like bootlegging, right? Like in prohibition. Kennedy, yeah. Kennedys, the Kennedy, you know, People don't like to talk about this, but we got the internet now, so we can be truthful. The whole Kennedy empire was a fucking bootlegging empire. They were fucking Irish gangsters, American Irish gangsters. And there was a huge rivalry between the Italians and the Irish gangsters when the Kennedys got elected into presidency. The Italians were like, fuck, man, the Irish now have the presidency. Why can't we have it? There was some theories that could possibly be true. I saw some of the evidence that might, might be true. That Kennedy was assassinated by some guys, basically some guys of the Italian mobs that were jealous that the Irish got the presidency. The Irish got the presidency and Bobby Kennedy, the president's young son, or young younger brother, decided to go to war with the Italian mob through the criminal justice system. All yeah. Right. In New Orleans, they had an Italian gangster named Carlos Marcellus, who was friends with an ex-CIA agent. I'm forgetting his name. He was a gay dude, fucking bald, had alopecia. He he was. Oh, a, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, he was a, a part of the Free Cuba movement. With what's uh, that dude's? I'll probably think of it like yeah. 15 minutes from now. He, that dude was friends <laughs> with Lee Harvey Oswald. Oswald was pissed off about the fucking Bay of Pigs and and the Free Cuba movement. And he was, there's a connection there. Could have been that Marcellus and this ex-CIA agent and Oswald pissed off behind two different things. Oswald pissed off about the Free Cuba movement and the Bay of Pigs. And Marcellus, an Italian gangster who's pissed off about Bobby Kennedy, said the best way to save the Italian mob is to kill JFK. And that will de disempower Bobby Kennedy and they'll stop investigating the Italian mob. Fuck them. They're a gangster family anyway. There is a good chance that John F. Kennedy was killed not by the Italian mob, but with the support of the Italian mob. He was actually killed by Lee Harvey Oswald. But Lee Harvey Oswald was pissed off about the Bay of Pigs and the betrayal of the Cubans. At the beginning, the betray of, at, there's a whole book about it. I read it back in the day, called Mafia Kingpin. It's either Mafia Kingpin or Mafia Kingfish. I think it's Mafia Kingpin, and it's about a guy named Carlos Marcelo. So if you're interested in it, read it. It's a very good book. So uh, yeah, the Kennedys were bad, but you got to be bad to achieve power. Good people don't ever achieve power. That's why you're poor and broke when listening to this program. You're a good person. Bad well, people rise to the bad. top. <laughs> All you got to do is go to the toilet and you will see that shit floats. Okay, <laughs> shit floats. Well, I don't know if that's always true. Uh, yeah, shit floats. <laughs> Depends yeah. on what yeah. you ate. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. The people that run the fucking this world bullshit are not trustworthy. Do not trust them. They're bad. Santa has said, Tom is right about this. It's been a bone of contention for us Italian Americans for a long time. I'm yes. not joking. It's brought up at family reunions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was back before the Italians were white. 
<laughs> now nowadays you could have an Italian president, nobody would even. I don't notice. even think anyone would nobody really even notice, notice, except nobody maybe even like super old people. Yeah, nobody would even notice. Because, like I said, even when I was growing up in the seventies, yeah. and I read shit from the fifties where like people were talking weird about Italians, I'm like, what the fuck's wrong with Italians? <laughs> What they're not white suddenly? That's weird. Yeah, I did that. Only never, old people love it. Never them. occurred to me. In the seventies, old people would think like that. But that was all like, dead. yeah, that they're was like dead. some shit that my grandparents would. Yeah, say. they're all dead. But I did not understand it. Yeah, I did not understand. I'm like, what are you even talking right. about? <laughs> and it's my prediction that Hispanics will be white people, and they're white people now. I mean, we fucking party with fucking Hispanics and forget that they're Hispanics. <laughs> Because it's just dude, I forgot you were Hispanic. Yeah, well, it doesn't matter. We all listen to the same music. We're all in the same fucking club. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's what I said. Goth is goth is its own. I got reminded of that shit by fucking a Starry Night last time I saw him. You know, fucking not last time. That was the second, the third time. Fucking Michael was like, "It's so cool to be up here in Orlando and hang out with white people." (laughs) And I looked at him. Wait a minute, you're Hispanic. He goes, "Yeah." (laughs) And so to me, you're just a person, man. Because Miami is heavily Hispanic. There's no white people there. They don't, you know, they don't understand us in, in Miami. They understand us here because they grew <laughs> up listening to, our, to, you know, the kind of music that we, you know, fucking The Cure and shit like that. You know, they like that kind of music. And in general, here's the thing. A lot of people think Hispanics don't listen to that. No, there's a huge goth scene all throughout Central Fuck and yeah, South they America. They fucking Mexico listen. City. Like yeah. I, we were talking about that on Wednesday. Yeah. Night. Mexico City has a massive yeah. goth scene. It's just, they consider it kind of like European and Northern, and it's, it's kind of ethnically alien to them, but not spiritually. I mean, they got Mexicans that love Morrissey, that know those lyrics and sing them in English. There are many, okay. many, many uh, Mexican Morrissey, Morrissey bands. cover bands. Yeah. One of them Mariachi called... bands that do Morrissey music. Mexrissey. Yeah, Mexrissey. Are they called Mexrissey? Yeah. They're actually pretty good. Because it's a it's lot a of terrible crossover. name, but they're but it's but they're a good band though. The Americas <laughs> are the Americas. Central and South America, North America, very similar in, in, spiritually. Um, the Central and South Americans, growing up in Brazil, I'll tell you, man, Brazil. They understand the theatricality and the emotion of goth. They understand that they're going to reinterpret it, but they know exactly. They love drama, drama and theatricality and it, it's right up Which there. Which is, man, that's what guys are all God, yeah. about. They understand it. We love that shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't love drama like as in like people making drama just for the sake no, of it. But I'm we're not. talking about like theatrical. The theatrical drama. Yeah, yeah, we like that. Yeah. We like that. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Zach. Hey, y'all. What's up, Jenny? You look good with your hair down. Thank you. Love the headband you got going to Betty Page thing going. Yeah. yeah. I just kind of just threw this on at the last minute. I didn't really. Because I didn't feel like putting my hair up. And then I was just kind of like, eh, I guess it looks like It was hot. Up. So she put, had her hair up for the last couple shows. Yeah. Because it's such, I like having it shaved. Because like I said, it's nice not having all that hair under there. Yeah. But today I was kind of like, oh, it looks. Because sometimes it'll look okay. Like it'll look okay down in the mirror. But then I'm you know on camera and i'm like oh my god that looks like shit so then i have to like do something else with it Lilo but... says italians identify as white i yeah. live in europe and travel there for... yeah i know that everybody knows this yeah but there's something about but old, old america old like grandparents or even great grandparents yeah at this great parents right there was a thing where italians were like considered like not white like they people. were non-white and like i said even i grew up in the 70s yeah. and i thought that was weird in the 70s yeah. that was more like a 50s and before and thing. it was because and and before the italians the irish were non-white yeah which that's fucking weird which the irish are like some, of the, some, some of the whitest people they're white as fuck they're gingers <laughs> but it and if you go back in history of north america and you start reading it it's not so much a thing of the 1700s, but a thing of the mid 1800s. There was an Anglophilia. There was this, there was this uh, kind of like idealized Anglophile-ness that you had to be English. That that was the white person. It was like some H.P. Lovecraft. Yeah, shit. like H.P. Lovecraft. Well, right. he just thought you had to be like an English person, right. like an upper class English person. Right. Anybody that wasn't like an upper class then English person, then you're not even white. You're not even white. Yeah. yeah. Which is right. super weird. Which was weird because the people that were doing this were very, were alienated from England. They were, this was a theoretical England in their mind. 
Yeah, it's like that's that, not who they were. No, no. All right, and they and were like mixed. H.P. Lovecraft never went to fucking England. No, he didn't know nothing about it. He lived his it, whole, pretty much his whole life it, in Providence, was, Rhode Island. Right, and then they'd look at a person of Irish descent and they'd go, "Ew," you know. But the thing Even is, this nowadays, bitch, you're probably Irish. I kind of feel like I kind of feel like even nowadays it's probably like not as much as it was. But when I was there in the 90s, I feel like there was still a little bit of I don't think it was like any kind of real kind of. But there was still kind of like a little, you know, the Irish and the Welsh, like the English didn't like the Irish and the Welsh, like the Welsh were like sheep shaggers and shit like that. They They were savages and stuff. But I think mostly that was just like being funny. It didn't seem like they were really. I mean, I'm sure there are some, like, extremes, right. but... All that shit was re- theoretical. If you actually look at the data over time, the ethnic makeup of the United States hasn't changed that much. There's more people. But it was always about thir- 13% black. And um, it was always about 40% kind of Indian or Hispanic or Mesoamerican. And the rest of it was white and some Chinese. It's still kind of like that. Now you have Indian and some Middle Easterners, but there's not enough of them really to make a difference. Yeah, I mean, that's like, that's like a tiny yeah. percentage. And they were thinking like this kind of even back in the 1800s, 1700s. It just, it just hasn't changed as much as people think that there. No, it really it hasn't. hasn't. It really hasn't. There has never been as many black people as there are now. There's never been as many white people as there are now. There has never been as many Indian or Native Americans or Mesoamericans as there are now. The, the population, everybody's population has expanded because of technology. you got agriculture where they can feed them. And there's also a lot of admixture. But there was a lot of admixture back then that yeah. they're not telling you about. All through the 17 and 1800s, especially during the expansion period, white guys that were moving west tended to marry Indian women. And they had children that tended to marry white people, sometimes Indian people. There was They were always like some mixing. There were also black people that were doing this, marrying Indians and, and vice versa. So it, it, it's always kind of looked the way it, is, it does now. It's just people are, yeah. are imagining that it didn't. They don't know what they're talking about. They have, they're not really looking at the, the numbers. The golden honky years. It's like the golden honky years. Yeah. <laughs> Which never existed. If you go back to the old 50s, you could go back to the 50s Hollywood fucking movies, black and white movies. If you actually pay attention, a lot of those people in those 50s Mex- movies were Mexican. They're Mexican-Americans. Well, they just, just like really gave them different names. They gave them names. And they names. dyed their hair and yeah. shit like that so they wouldn't look like that. Yeah. Well, on black and white film, they wouldn't look ethnic, but they were. I'm calling it. Look at like Rita Hayworth and yeah. shit like that. She yeah. was Hispanic, yeah. There were also like light skinned black people. They in those just movies. dyed her hair red and gave yeah. her a different name. There were also light skinned black people in those movies that fucking you didn't realize that they were light skinned black. The, the actual audience, either they didn't realize or they didn't care. I don't think they cared as much as people think that they do now. Well, as long as yeah. you could pass, I don't think anybody was thinking about. As it long that as hard. you seemed to, as long as you spoke English and, and you were dressed right and you behaved well, you were charming. I don't think they really cared that much. Maybe Especially not. Or, or like I said, I don't think it was anything they really thought about. To nah, extent, nah. probably not. I don't think they uh, cared that much. T- Tyler, the guy says, "Old America was weird. Whites racist against what was essentially other whites." Yes. 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 That yes. doesn't make any sense to me. Right. It wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't racism. It was more like ethnocentrism. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. All right. It was about their ethnic tribal identity, but their identity was Anglo, but they probably weren't English. Yeah. They were probably German and Irish, mostly. There were just not that many British people. Yeah. And when you look in British history, it's kind of gray who's British and who isn't. They were, because they're fucking Saxons and Normans and all kinds of weird things. I mean, like I said, you can go back and just, you know, every, you go back far enough in time. They were all white people. Everyone's African. So like, don't worry about it. Uh, thank you, Zach. What's this here marinara sauce? Is that an Italian? Thing? Yeah, it's Italian. Yeah, that was kind of like that was something I read a book that was written in the fifties, and it was it wasn't exactly that, but it was something like that, and yeah. I just I was like, what? Yeah. Look in, <laughs> in that cookbook that Jenny and I sell, some of those dessert recipes like the eclairs are straight from the fucking thirties from a cookbook that I have, a Duncan Hines cookbook. That cookbook is the shit. It'll teach you how to make mayonnaise. It'll teach you how to make ketchup, all right? Uh, it'll teach you how to make just basic components. 
but it has in a foreign food section and in the foreign food section is spaghetti yeah and it teaches you how to make spaghetti and that's, the sauce that's hilarious and there's a whole segment to explain to you what oregano is so exotic right <laughs> And if you were to actually read what the fucking marinara sauce for that sauce, it would be terrible by today's standards. Terrible. Terribly, well, terribly spice, plain. Well, spices weren't invented in the yeah. United States until... It would have been tomato paste. It, all it was was tomato paste, sugar, salt, water, um, <laughs> and oregano, and pepper. That's it. I'm like, wait a minute. Where's the meat juices? Where's the hamburger? Where's the sausage? Where's the, you know, where's the garlic? Where's the, that's not, not, not even that was in it. So what the fuck were they yeah. even doing? Where's the parsley? They didn't know how to eat. Where, yeah. Back then. Well, they didn't have access to that shit. Yeah, I know. And Italian food, as we know it today, evolved from something a lot more rudimentary. <laughs> it was a lot more simple. The original pizza was just a round piece of bread with oil and vinegar on it. It had one stripe of green, which was oregano leaves, another stripe in the middle that was sliced tomato, and another stripe of white on the other side, which was sliced pieces of cheese, mozzarella cheese. The red, white, and green. You see the white, white, red, white, and green. The colors of the Italian flag. That was the first pizza. It was like 1920. Yeah. Right Red, white, green. Yeah. It wasn't all together. It was separate. And I think it was offered at a an Italian at a Olympic event, if I remember correctly. That's where it first appeared. Yeah. Yeah. We're getting all these like weird. It's not. It's not trolls. They're not being like. Uh... We're getting spam. Yeah, it's just spam mostly. Yeah, you can spam. Get rid of the spam, people. I'm done. I'm working on it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's like I don't. They're not like saying anything substantive, so I'm just. It's whoops. just emotion, emoticons. Yeah. That's it's weird because that seems like there's um there's been a lot of that going on just um yeah. as comments like yeah. on some of the um videos like uh the recorded ones and stuff. It's like I don't know. I guess it's like sex bots or whatever. I'm not. <laughs> I think they're just passing through it. Yeah, probably. It's just, you know, this. I think this one's another one. Let me just... Whoops. Okay, I don't know. Sometimes if you, like, do the thing and you're not, like, quick enough, it'll delete some other shit that you didn't mean to delete. So if I delete anybody accidentally... The going there says the white birth rate will jump between a certain amount. Look, don't believe any of those fucking forecasts of the future. No forecast of the future has ever, ever been correct. That's why I don't bother with it. The same demographic doom that they predict today is the same demographic doom the ancient Romans were predicting back during the Roman Empire. <clears throat> um, birth rates have a lot to do with fucking income. People become wealthy. They stop having as many kids because they, can profess they become professionals. But they die out. And certain professions die out. And then people get poorer, so they have a little bit more children later on. Uh, nothing is in a straight line. Everything kind of goes up and down over the centuries. I don't History worry about anything. History is wavy. It's very wavy. <laughs> the supply of people wax and wane depending upon demand. And the way technology is now, there isn't much demand for people. So you could predict that everyone's numbers will eventually decline. Because even in India, they're declining. Because their standards of living are rising. It, everything, don't worry about it. Everything works out. There will always be people. I'm not worried about it. No, I ain't worried about it. I've never been worried about it. It's just Why do that, I this panicky bullshit. There will always be people. <laughs> there will always be enough people to meet the demand. I might need another drink. It might be time for you to make me another drink. Give it to me. Z Zanada. I'm not rich, so I need to have five kids. I have time yeah, still. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can have five kids and, like, put them to work on the farm or, you know, sell them for organs. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so, yeah. So, where was I? We got, like, fucking distracted again. What else is new? 
All right. So, like I said, we're talking about the uh, the McClellan hearings. So, like I said, now, uh, what's his face? Uh, Dave Beck didn't come off too well during these hearings, like I said. And, you know, the Teamsters were kind of like, yeah, we don't so much want this dude running the shit anymore because he just takes the fifth on everything. And, like, the public was like, okay, well, what are you up to if you, like, won't say anything? So, pretty much, I mean, Jimmy Hoffa had to testify at these hearings also. And he was kind of like, okay, well, I can't just sit up there and like take the fifth on everything because that didn't work out so well for Beck. So he's like, basically he took the defense where if they asked him like some shady shit, like, or some sideways shit, he'd just be like, well, I don't really recall that happening or, you know, so he would kind of try to get around, like he would still answer the question, but he wouldn't like really answer, answer the question. You know what I mean? But he was like a lot sneakier about it. And honestly, I, I listened to... Because like I said, these were all um, televised. So I listened to some of the um, some of the uh, hearings. And actually, I mean, Jimmy Hoffa does actually come off sounding like he sounds like a like a little bit evasive, but he still sounds like he's answering the questions kind of intelligently, but not really saying anything. So he was like pretty good at that. Um, so like I said, you know, more than a million people. Thank you. More than a million people watch these uh, on TV. So you know, this was kind of like a big deal. And honestly, it ended up working out well for Jimmy Hoffa because, um, you know, he had all these politicians who were, you know, clearly gunning for him and asking him like all these really, you know, asking him and being like a little bit hostile toward him, I guess. And he was kind of able to deflect a lot of their questions without looking like he was deflecting them. So I think the public kind of saw him as saw him in a more positive light maybe than they saw Dave Beck. So, uh, basically kind of like, um, it, it was kind of a thing too, where the public kind of started seeing the, uh, you know, the, this hearings, these hearings against the Teamsters and against Jimmy Hoffa, like it, the public opinion started to change where now it looked like the politicians were just picking on him um, and then it was coming like a witch hunt. Cause like I said, you kind of had like McCarthyism and shit like that going on too. So I think a lot of the public were kind of turning against him. They're like, you know, just leave the dude alone. It's why you like being so obnoxious because like I said, uh, McCarthy was actually on the McClellan committee as well. So it was, you know, it was kind of like a whole thing where they just thought they were like picking on the dude. Right. Um, so it kind of ended up making Jimmy Hoffa look you know, put him in a more positive light, perhaps. Grafters, you're back. Grafters is back in the conversation. You missed it, bro. I was talking about me and you growing up in the wasteland of Detroit and the way it was and how that fucking, they, they, they blew the empire. All that damn corruption helped to destroy Detroit. And then the unions eventually pushed all the fucking business out to China. We watched it fall. When we were kids, it was already ruins. It was like a, some a urbex explorer, fucking urban explorer's fucking dream. Now it's all gone. They tore the shit down. So, like I said, so the public kind of had a more positive uh, view of Hoffa at the time, like I said, because they thought that he was maybe being persecuted, um, even though there was a lot of evidence, obviously, that um, that there was a lot of corruption going on. But a lot of people didn't really see Robert Kennedy in that positive a light, too, because it seemed like he was going out of his way to just, like, persecute this one dude like it was a personal vendetta or something. So it kind of looked like that kind of thing. Although, that said, uh, the evidence against uh, Jimmy Hoffa was so good, or so everyone thought, that uh, Bobby Kennedy said, if he gets acquitted, I'm gonna jump off the Capitol dome. He basically said that. Um, he didn't exactly get acquitted, but it was a hung jury. So I heard that somebody sent Robert Kennedy a parachute like after that, just to be like, eh. like he didn't, you know, he, like I said, he didn't get acquitted necessarily, but it was a hung jury. So it was like a mistrial. Uh, so Jimmy Hoffa kind of, uh, got off on that. They didn't really conclude, um, you know, there, there was really no concrete conclusion on the matter. Uh, so like I said, Jimmy Hoffa takes over as president of the Teamsters. Cause like I said, Beck kind of got in trouble. Um, so basically it's kind of like, all right. So remember I said, that, you know, he, Jimmy Hoffa was like kind of, uh, he was married and he had kids and everything and he was like a big family man and stuff, but he was also kind of like a workaholic. Um, and he, 
he was actually pretty good at maintaining an image of he didn't want to be seen as like kind of like elite or better than anyone else because i think that he really didn't like that was one of the things that he didn't like about the kennedys is because he thought they were children of privilege um and that they hadn't worked for what they had and you know they weren't like working class so he did have like a nice house but it wasn't like a mansion or anything and he had like a little vacation house and stuff but he tried and he tried to like have an old car and shit like that he didn't really want to like put on airs or anything uh so like i said that was kind of uh, another thing that he didn't like about the kennedys because he thought they were rich people who had never like lived in the real world or anything like that now interesting this is kind of weird <laughs> i came across this in an article uh, and I just, I thought this was uh, kind of strange. So basically, I mean, uh, from by all accounts, um, Jimmy Hoffa and his wife um, were, I mean, they stayed married for ages and they were apparently like very happy together. And even though Jimmy Hoffa was kind of known as like this real, um, you know, uh, he, he was just kind of, he was a scrapper. He would just go out there and get shit done and everything like that. And he was kind of, uh, acerbic. Uh, he apparently was not like that at home with his wife or kids, shit like that. Um, but this is pretty weird. So at some point he's living in the family home with his wife and kids. And remember I brought up that ex-girlfriend of his, yeah. Sylvia Pagano, who like had, was one of the people that like introduced him into like the, the mob life and everything. Um, later on, she came and like lived with them, which I thought was kind of weird. Now she was the one who was the mom of Chucky O'Brien, who, like I said, was kind of like, uh, Jimmy Hoffa's adopted son. So some people have speculated, oh, maybe he knocked Sylvia up like a long time ago. And so Chucky was his actual son, but I don't know if that's true or not, but you know what I mean? He was a little bit older than the other, uh, than the other kids, but you know what I mean? So it's just kind of, and like I said, Frank O'Brien, Chucky's dad was dead by this point, uh, because he had been a driver for like a mob boss or whatever, but you know, I don't know. So I just thought that was like kind of weird that, Hey, Hey, got to my ex-girlfriend is going to like move in with us. Is that cool? <laughs> I don't know. I just think that's so weird, but apparently it worked out. Okay. <laughs> Cause I guess her and the, her and the, the wife, Jimmy Hoffa's wife were friends. So, you know, whatever. Um, now, interestingly, in the 1960s, a lot of the uh, labor unions, obviously, were, um, uh, you know, were going with the uh, Democrats. However, uh, because Jimmy Hoffa could not stand the Kennedys, uh, he was not going to get uh, on board with that <laughs> because he really couldn't stand them. So since JFK was running for president, um, basically, Jimmy Hoffa's like, yeah, no, I'm not going there with that shit. Uh, so he started working with uh, Richard Nixon, who was at that point the vice president under Dwight Eisenhower uh, and was also the Republican nominee for president in 1960. Now, after Kennedy ended up winning the election, obviously, in 1961 um, and made Robert Kennedy the attorney general, at that point, because Robert Kennedy still had this vendetta, essentially, against Jimmy Hoffa, he decided, well, now I have, like, all this power behind me, so I'm going to go after him uh, big time. Like, they were kind of, they were kind of, like, uh, sort of obsessed in general with, like, getting, yeah. like, busting organized crime and stuff. But for some reason, they really had a particular yeah. hatred for Jimmy Hoffa. Like I said, there was a blood feud between them. Yeah, it was just like our Italian friends in the comment section said. It was a fucking... It was it was a rivalry between the Irish and the Italian mob families also. Essentially, Essentially. That's what it boils down to. The Italians got the presidency because they were the wider of the two group at that time. So they could make it. They could pass as an Anglo. And then they turned around and went and they would fucking turned on the fucking Italians. We're going to wipe these fucking organized crime to better America. Bitch, you're an organized gangster. You were fucking rum runners. Well, that's kind of like fucking, what gangsters yeah, do. Yeah, that's what a gangster does. So all the Italians were fucking, who were in the know knew exactly what this was. It was cold-blooded. Because I tell you what, I'm going to be honest. Had the Italians got the presidency, they wouldn't have done that. They wouldn't have done that. That was a fucking, that was a Kennedy thing. That was a Kennedy thing more than anything else. Those bitches spent too much time at the goddamn fucking country club, at the golf, you know, fucking playing tennis and shit, chasing around, chasing around Marilyn Monroe. Zach says we need. They to were get, uppity. We Motherfuckers to, got uppity. 
We need to do a show on Nixon Watergate. Yeah, we probably yeah. should. Yeah. And somebody earlier said we should do a show on the Kennedy. What's too. funny about Nixon Watergate is that would be small potatoes by today's standard. Nixon Watergate would be nothing compared to what they do now. They get away with it and it never even hits the fucking news. It's, an, it's just that it happened in a time of American innocence. I'd rather do Nixon Elvis. Nixon Elvis is more, a lot more interesting than fucking Although Nixon's. we talked about that a lot yeah, when we I'd talked about Nixon the movie. <laughs> Where you have a president and a king having a summit. That's a lot more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Camp Guys talk about the. There's a movie called Frost Nixon, which is. Uh, which actually, I th- I'm pretty sure I saw in the theater. Which is kind of like this really famous uh, interview that Nixon did with this British uh, TV presenter. And that's that's actually a really good movie, too. But yeah, it's Elvis and Nixon, that was that movie with Michael Shannon and uh, that child molester, uh, yeah. Kevin Spacey. So, wasn't he a child molester? I don't know. They all are. Yeah, Kevin Spacey. He's, yeah. he's that sketchy <laughs> shit. Yeah. That, that child molester. But look. Allegedly. <laughs> the Irish got the presidency, but the... The Italians always had New York, you know. They still have New York off and on. Yeah, I re- although I don't really know how much, like, the mafia, in the sense of, like, the old school mafia, is still... I'm I don't sorry, know, Cuomo a... fucking struck me as a goddamn I mean, they're mafia. Still, they're probably still around, but I don't <laughs> think it's like it used to be. No, it's not like it was. It's not like it used to be because the Italian mob all made it. Yeah. They made their money, then they got into... F- the ultimate, the ultimate goal of any organized gangster is wide mainstream societal acceptance. They want to go straight. They want to be good people. That's why they, that's why they made as much money as they, could, as they did, a, a successful one, is because they were trustworthy. They were good people. All you got to do is just see Cocaine Cowboys on Netflix right here, right here in Miami. The best guys who made all the money were actually nice guys. They weren't bad guys. They went bad over time because they didn't want to go to jail. But they wanted mainstream acceptance. I mean, fuck, they were on ESPN racing their fucking speedboats in public. When the, when the FBI was looking for When the FBI was them. looking for them. Looking for them. <laughs> and they were young. They were real young guys, Not man. the brightest Fucking balls. late teens, early 20s. It's they were making thing. several million dollars a month. <laughs> all right. That'll go to your head quickly. They were Cuban guys, and it went to their fucking heads. You know, what I mean, they were, but they're experiencing the American dream from their point of view, and that was being at your mom's house, and the mom opens up the closet and finds millions of dollars in fucking cash in your fucking closet. Man, you're seventeen. I find millions of dollars of cash. That in was my the closet. American dream. I keep opening okay. it, but there's nothing in there. But they didn't want to be outlaws. They didn't see themselves as criminals. They're trying to actually go mainstream um but that's eventually what happened to most of the italian mob they made enough money to where they just bought restaurants yeah it's like they don't have to yeah well because the thing about it and we kind of talked about this before when we were talking about cocaine cowboys is that yeah yeah, um you know if you're able to like make a life for yourself and organize crime yeah Yeah. the money's good but you're always uh, looking over your fucking shoulder you're always looking over your shoulder because you don't know when somebody's gonna fucking whack you and it's probably the same thing in the mob I mean it is the same thing in the mob it's like yeah you can make a lot of money but you don't know if like somebody's gonna like fucking roll over on you any second or if somebody decides they don't like you suddenly and they're just gonna like pop you in the back of the head one day a lot of them became millionaires and then took that money and then went straight with it bought restaurants and real estate and then you never heard of them again because then their their children grew up straight, and then they inherited that wealth. Yeah, and they're just regular Americans now. I mean, I'd like to have millions of dollars too, but it, I don't think it would be worth it. Like living that way all the time. Making millions of dollars is a problem in itself, in certain ways, when you don't have any ways of explaining it. Because then you're kind of afraid to buy things. You have all this money, and you're afraid to f- buy anything big. Um, Because you can't explain where the money came from. It's a high-stress lifestyle, even though... See Cocaine Cowboys on Netflix. That was one of the things that... That will explain it to you. They will tell you. That was one of the things when I was listening to the McClellan hearings uh, on YouTube, was that Robert Kennedy kept asking, like, Jimmy Hoffa, it's like, hey, you had this $20,000 or whatever amount it was. It's like, where'd you get it from? And, like, all Jimmy Hoffa would say, I I acquired it. Or, you know... He would just say, I saved it. He wouldn't say, like, where he got it from. You know what I mean? 
gets to the point where you're making so much money that there's no way to lose money. If you lose money, you don't even notice. The cocaine cowboys would have safe houses all over a fucking city where they would take girlfriends so the wives didn't find out in places they could stash cash and product. And they would forget about cash. They would sell a fucking safe house. And then later the news and the people would report, we found $20 million in a fucking attic in this house. Where did this come from? The I would never, know. I would never, I would never have reported that shit. Fuck no. I'd be like, oh, yeah, for and, me. <laughs> and they were making so much that they were forgetting about pallets of cash. They're just, oh, we forgot about that pallet. Oh yeah, there was that. There was yeah. that twenty million dollars. Like twenty million bucks. I in wondered cash. where that was. Yeah, Can you I imagine? forgot all about it. Can you imagine? You know. I wish that'd be nice. But like it'd I said, nice I, w- I wish so I bought much, a house like that. It'd and be I was, nice to have so much stress on you and so much money that you would forget about a measly twenty million dollars. Oh yeah, we forgot about that money. Yeah. Well, like I said, I just you know. I, I would like to buy a house and find $20 million under the floorboards. But yeah. like I said, I would absolutely not report that. No, to hell no. Fuck and me. imagine you find this $20 million, right? And then you're stressing out, oh, they're going to come back and get it. That Those motherfuckers, they know I have it. They're going to kill me. They know I have this goddamn money. And little do you know, it's a fucking 20-year-old fucking gangster who's forgotten all about that money. That's what he makes in a week. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> fucking funny, man. It is, yeah. Camp makes your get, problems seem makes your money problems seem very small when you hear a story is like that. Watch Cocaine Cowboys; it'll fucking explain. Camp it all. guy says just a million or two would be enough for me. Yeah, I know. same. It's like that. You live I, on a million. Honestly, I could easily live on a million. Those dollars. dudes would forget about where they stashed twenty and not, not notice that it was gone. I mean, because I don't know. I have, I have very simple wants. Yeah. To be honest with you, I don't. I don't need all this shit. It's like let's go to Vegas and spend a yeah. million dollars in the casinos and like drink champagne and with fucking gold flakes in it and shit like that. Fuck that. Yeah. I don't want to do any of that crap. I don't need a plane or a boat or any kind of shit crap like that. It's ridiculous. Ridiculous. Is Zanet is telling me I need to watch the original Cocaine Cow? Yeah, that's the same director. Yeah, it's the same guy. Same, like, same guy. well, because he started out making like two or three documentaries before he made like the series, but they're all like about the same thing. Also, somebody yeah. said that you need to watch The Sopranos, which actually I need to get around to watching that too because that's supposedly like a really good show, and I never did get around to watching it. Like, I know all the plot points that happened because just over the years from hearing yeah. about it, but I have never. Tired of the watching. guy says if he found something like that, he'd leave it alone. He's afraid they'd come back. No, I, I disagree. If you found it, it's because they forgot about it. And it wasn't a big amount of money for them. That's what history says. When they would find pallets of fucking cash in Florida houses up in an attic, they found it because those dudes forgot all about it. And it was like $20, $30 million. But that was just nothing to them. Yeah, I mean, if they were that concerned about it, they should have gone to get it. Yeah, it wouldn't have been there. never been been there. If they needed it. The reason why you found it is because they didn't even know it existed. It was, yeah. They forgot all That's about what it. I would figure. I'm yep. like, well, I'm going to the bank right now. I'm putting yeah. this in my freaking It's like the place. myth of buried pirate's treasure. <laughs> pirates did not bury treasure. And if they did bury it, you wouldn't find it because they'd go back there and get it immediately. Yeah, they're not going to let it sit around if they really needed it that Yeah, moment. but I researched buried pirate treasure thing and there were people that scoffed at that. The, the money was never buried. It was always divided up amongst the crew. And it was spent very quickly, a lot of it. Well, yeah, you don't want to, like, keep that no. much money around. Somebody will, like, swipe it off you. No, they bought stuff with it. Yeah. They bought property, which is strange. But it makes sense. That's not that strange. You, well, you're thinking of them as savages. But no, they, no, of they bought not. Pr- property and houses, yeah. and they bought things with it. They weren't dummies. They, they, tur- <laughs> uh, they turned a liquid asset into something solid as quickly as they could. Yeah. All right, so let's see, where was I? Yeah, Tyler Guess is kind of like a how a normal person forgets pocket change. Exactly. Jeffy Art says, hell, I'd settle for 500K. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Holy crap, that's probably more than I, that's more money than I've ever had in my whole entire life put together. So, you know, <laughs> just saying. Uh, so, yeah, so now that uh, Bobby Kennedy is uh, the attorney general, so he's going to take out this vendetta. Like I said, under the auspices of we're going after the mob. Um, but in, it seemed like specifically he wanted to go after Jimmy Hoffa. So they even called his, uh, <laughs> even called his like kind of group 
uh, that he created to go after them to get Hoffa Squad. That's what they called it. Now, at this point, though, even though the Kennedys were, like, giving him shit, Jimmy Hoffa is still uh, president of the Teamsters at this point, and he has actually gotten it up to 2 million members uh, by this time in the 1960s. And um, because of that, uh, they actually had, you know, you pay your union dues. So the union, the Teamsters had, like, uh, quite a bit of money. So basically what he wanted to do... um, he got like a, he was able to kind of like negotiate national contracts for truck drivers and shit like that. Like I said, he was kind of like a well-liked, well-respected uh, dude and was good at like getting what he wanted. And so the fact that he was, uh, and they know that he was doing this, like I said, that he was giving uh, kickbacks, um, you know, lowballing contracts to various companies, um, you know, people kind of knew that he was doing that. It wasn't like a big secret or anything, but because he was doing good shit uh, for the people in the union, for the workers and stuff like that, everyone just kind of didn't really mind too much about it, I suppose. Uh, Because like I said, sort of everybody was corrupt at the time. So I feel like everybody kind of looked the other way, you know, as long as the end result was all right. So it was kind of that type of shit. Now, um, so what happened in 1964... Uh, he was actually able to bring this contract called the National Master Freight Agreement. And this brought uh, about 400,000 long haul truck drivers under a single union contract, uh, which was actually, like I said, was good for those 400,000 people because they all got like really good wages and benefits and shit like that. So like I said, he, he was doing some good for the world, even though everybody kind of knew that he was doing some shady shit on the side. Now, uh, as I said, he had been through these hearings. Everyone kind of knew there was a lot of um, evidence of corruption on his part, but he had, uh, you know, at the first hearings, he it kind of was kind of like a mistrial. So he didn't get in trouble uh, for it at first. But because uh, Robert Kennedy was the district attorney, he kept like going after them. So, or going after him rather. So he had to like spend all this money for his legal defense. Um, he was kind of able to evade legal consequences for a couple of years, but he eventually ended up getting prosecuted. Now, what ended up happening was that uh, Jimmy Hoffa and some other dudes, they bought some property in Florida, um, which was not ideal property. Maybe it was like some, hey, I got some swamp land in Florida to sell you, but... They said it wasn't swamp land, even though we might be buying swamp land in Florida soon. (laughs) We probably will be. All of Florida is swamp land. I hate to tell you, pretty much. Um, You know what I mean? The only reason that they like actually built some shit on it was, I mean, Florida is almost all swamp land. Got to tell you, it's good swamp though. It's partially Dagobah. Dagobah. You just gotta hope you don't fall in a sinkhole. It's or, hot. Three or your months shit doesn't. Or your shit doesn't flood. Real hot. (laughs) Fucking three months, three or four months out of the year. I would say more like six months out of the year or more. As soon as it gets down below 80, I'm fine. Oh, see, I want it to go down below 50. No. That'd no, be no, nice, no. and that no. hardly ever happens. Just spoiled, man. I'm not it's spoiled. Idealistic shit. Idealistic I'm not shit. spoiled. Well, no, there is places like that where there's weather like that, just I know not that. here. I know. Just it's, not just, here. it's just not here. Not here. Um, yeah, so he buys. they buy some uh, kind of like shitty real estate in Florida and started selling it to union members as like retirement properties right um and uh the property had like even though it was kind of crappy property they kind of like marked it up a lot and what jimmy hoffa was doing even though like i said the people that were in the union were getting their benefits and were getting their pensions and stuff but jimmy hoffa was kind of like scraping some shit off the top um to get loans from a florida bank to kind of get into this whole like real estate shit that he was uh doing now what ended up happening with that was that i guess like investigators were looking into that kind of shit so he was like all right well um i gotta kind of like get rid of the of this land so my name's not on anymore so they had to like do some like shady shit over here like some creative accounting as they call it so they're like doing that over here and uh this creative accounting over here the investigators were kind of like oh now we're doing this over here because that's kind of what we thought you were gonna do so okay we're gonna look like more into that so uh, 
the thing too is that he was doing some shady shit like uh, him and this other guy that was in the Teamsters had set up this essentially a shell company that was like a trucking company and they registered it under their wives names um so there wouldn't be like conflicts of interest shit like that um and he would do shit like like no bid contracts stuff like that so this is the kind of like corruption that we're talking about um so basically he started what he started doing too was that he started loaning out money from the teamsters pension fund to mafia bosses and they were building casinos in Las Vegas. Yeah. I know so that Jimmy Hoffa's, you know, funds There's were... There's whole movies about that. You guys Yeah, have seen yeah. It. It's a whole thing. So, yeah. like, a lot of this shit in Las Vegas was built off of, you know, this money that he was, like, funneling yeah. to that. Early Las Vegas was yeah. mafia and... But you also got to forget... You, you can't forget Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes was involved in a lot of that also. That too, yeah. When We did a show about that yeah. too. But, uh, but yeah... So he basically, because what he had done was he had reorganized the board of directors of the Teamsters so that he kind of had final say of like where the funds were going. Like I said, everybody was still getting their pensions and shit, but he, they were making so much money that he was funneling a lot of it off to the mob for favors and stuff, you know, so they could like build casinos out in uh, Las Vegas. Now, what ended up happening? So the shell company that he had created, uh, he had incorporated it in Tennessee So what ended up happening was that he got charged in federal court in Nashville for this particular thing, for setting up this company. Now, when he was charged with this, he also either bribed or attempted to bribe several of the jurors, um, but he hired like intermediaries to pay them off. So um, he was hoping to, like, get a mistrial because he's like, look, if I could just pay one juror to be like, hey, yeah, no, then that'll be a mistrial and that'll give me some more time to, like, sort some more shit out. Um, So that kind of works for a while. Uh, So he got off on that thing just from, like, bribing the jurors, right? But then um, another guy that he knew in the Teamsters uh, who knew about the little plan that they had uh, kind of turned on him and started cooperating with the federal prosecutors. Uh, he was given immunity and he testified about the jury tampering. And uh, so basically Robert Kennedy and his little get Hoffa contingent said, woohoo, we got a really solid case here. We have somebody that was in on the shit uh, and knew about the jury tampering. So they started like going after him. So they set up a new trial this time in Chattanooga instead of Nashville. Uh, because they figured change of venue would be better because uh, Nashville, they were kind of familiar with the case, so they moved it to Chattanooga. Let me mention something. Okay. This is going along with the same thing you'll find out if you read a book called Mafia Kingpin that has Carlos Marcelo in it and fucking the whole JFK assassination. And it kind of focuses in on New Orleans. If you go to New Orleans, even to this day, you'll, you'll sense a slight New York accent in that area. And it's become it's because of mafiosi from up north in the New York area and even Detroit. And the, we're taking their money and they were sending it down south and investing things down south in this era, because the south was not very well developed and in, in, you know compared to the north, and it was a lot more lackadaisical when it came to fucking laws and paperwork. So they could buy businesses. It was like a money laundering type of operation. And the South was a lot easier to corrupt. They didn't ask questions. They still kind of don't. Oh, you got money? Yeah, we need money here. Yeah, sure. Come here, buy buy some shit. Hey, we're all good. That's kind of the way it was. And they're doing the same thing in this tale. They're buying things through Tennessee. It's odd. Very odd. But you had to understand the United States at the time. It's not as easy to do today. But back then... Yeah, you can't get away with a lot of shit that you used to be able to get away with. (laughs) Back then, you could take dirty money into the South and buy something, no questions asked. That's why they're doing it. And New Orleans was built that way. New Orleans was always a pirate city, even way back in the 1400s, before there was a United States, or before New Orleans was... uh, 1500s, 1600s, actually, I think. 16 is when, when it started. Before there was a United States... New Orleans was running strong through contraband. 
it was just the way it was. And that went on into the gangster era. The downtown New Orleans accent has New York in it. That's those gangsters. Go ahead. That's all I was going to say. All them gangsters. Gangsters. Yeah. Xana is saying, Jenny's really good at keeping her spot in the story. Thank you. That's because yeah. I have notes. Yeah. <laughs> I, have, I have like a little thing over here that has notes on it. Just sometimes I lose my place because it just all yeah. it's a big wall of text. So, you know, if I'm drunk enough, I'm just kind of like, wait, where the fuck was I? David June says, Jenny sold me as a storyteller years ago. Tom grew on me now. I love him as well. Yeah, fuck you, David. This channel became one of my favorites. Thank you, Xanada, uh, for the super chat. Here's a five. Good job, Jenny. Thank you thank very you, thank much. You. Um, David June says, what I like about Tom is he, it used to feel like he didn't like the show, but now he embraces it. <laughs> what are you talking about? No, I always like the show. Grandpa's was... Hammer, Tom's three degrees of separation to Jimmy Hoffa. Yeah. Mary Lynn Rice Cub yeah. was in Punch Drunk Love with yeah. Philip Seymour Hoffman. Okay. Philip Seymour Hoffman was in Scent of a Woman with okay. Al Pacino. God, I hated that movie. Uh, Al Pacino like was uh, was Hoffa and the Irishman. Okay. There you go. Yeah. And then Victor says, Jenny is the best. Oh, thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Ty- you're saying that because Marilyn Rice goes my ex-girlfriend yeah. from high school. Yeah. Tyler, the guy says, I think it's funny that Vegas is called Sin City when New Orleans exists. Yeah, I I always felt like Vegas felt like the the kind of um what was that thing that they used to sell on the infomercials? The Bedazzler. That's the bedazzled version of New Orleans. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Does anybody see what New I'm Orleans, what I'm going with that? New Orleans was always about women, strip clubs, booze. Um, gambling all your money away. Restaurants. Waking yeah. up in a pool of your own For vomit. Hotels. Not remembering what happened. Yeah. Your bank account has been completely cleaned out. They didn't have gambling there. All right. Now, <laughs> recently, we're talking about eight, late 80s, early 90s, Biloxi became gambling. Uh, out of the two between New Orleans and Biloxi, and I, I lived in past Christiane for a while, which is outside of Biloxi, Mississippi, um, I'd take Biloxi. Biloxi's nice. Our friend moved there. Um, lesbian girl. Uh, what was her name? Month been over a house. That's lesbian does not. Oh. That doesn't narrow it the down. A cute Hispanic girl was over here at the house. Fucking, we were great, great friends with her man. But she's been gone for fucking six years now. Gia. Gia. Oh, okay. Gia lives in Biloxi. I only say that because I knew she'd like moved to New Orleans like years ago, and I hadn't seen her in a while. She time. moved to New Orleans, but then she uh, she liked Biloxi better, so she stayed in Biloxi. Biloxi's a lot is new, and it's fucking nice, and yeah. Gia's cute. You guys would like Gia. Yeah, Very she's cute. rad. I haven't Very seen cute. her in ages. Yeah. Although she was at a show, what like a year or two ago? She was. At, I feel like she was in a Starry Night show. We saw her at Will's yeah. Pub, right? Because we were like, "What the fuck are you uh, doing?" Here? That was about three. Away. I'll show you. I'll show her Gia. That was um, maybe like. I don't think it was that long ago, was it? I mean, uh, I know it was more like about three years ago. I know I'm getting old and like time is going really fast and everything. Yeah. But I thought it was only like two years ago. I'm pretty sure I know it was at Will's Pub. I remember that. So yeah. this Will's Pub. So it was probably a Starry Night show. That's Gia. Yeah. Yeah, she's super cute. Yeah. I love the way you said that, that lesbian girl. I'm like, yeah, well, I'm trying to Do you know, do you know how many lesbians we know? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, that's not really helping me. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, here's a real good picture of Gia. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a good picture of her, actually. Yeah. That's a good picture. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so where was I? It's everybody's talking about how how I can keep track of my notes, but like I said, I have notes, but sometimes I lose my place. Okay, so like I said, they had an anonymous person uh, who was supposedly in on all of this stuff. So he's like, okay, so he, uh, you know, turns on Jimmy Hoffa and is like, yeah, I'll tell you all about this jury tampering business. Um, so what happened at this trial, which was in Chattanooga, was that Jimmy Hoffa was found guilty of uh, jury tampering, also like fraud, some other charges as well. So in uh, 1964, Jimmy Hoffa actually got a five-year sentence. What? Oh my goodness, what? One more time? What's the matter? She's saying one more time, okay. Oh, poor baby. Okay. Listen to her talking. Yeah. She just comes in and she's like, hey, hey. I got some shit I gotta do. She's like so weird because did I tell you guys this? She's like super into like the closet in, in my office. There's nothing in there, but 
for some reason, she thinks there's something super exciting in there. So she will come in here and like scratch at the door and then like turn at me. She'll like look at me with her little face and she'll be like, me, me, She wanted me. to go out the back door. Oh, poor baby. Yeah. She better be okay out there. We'll check on yeah. her a little bit. It's only quarter past eight here. So yeah, so he ended up getting five years uh, and he did some like appeals and shit, but none of them uh, worked out. So he ended up turning himself over to state custody and he got uh, put in prison, Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary. Um, during the time too, he also got his second conviction and that was misuse of pension funds, uh, which he might have got a, like a 20 year sentence, although he didn't get that much time. So like I said, he had a five year sentence and there was like some shit added onto it. Now, um, it's kind of like around this time period, like I said, a lot of, uh, they were going after a lot of like organized crime, uh, you know, leaders and shit like that. So Jimmy Hoffa wasn't like the only person to like kind of go away at this time. Like as far as like gangsters were concerned, there was a lot of that shit going around. So you know what I mean? So by the time that Jimmy Hoffa gets to prison, um, there's some other gangsters in there <laughs> that he can hang out with. So... Uh, one dude that he was kind of hanging out with a little bit in prison was a gangster named Anthony Provenzano, better known as Tony Pro, uh, which is a great gangster name. Just going to say, I think he had a brother named Sammy Pro, which I thought was very funny too. So there's a the whole pros like Provenzano. You want to hear something really funny? I was like watching a documentary about Jimmy Hoffa and I think it was the Buzzfeed one because they did one about it. And somebody in the comments said, every single name in here sounds like a dish at Olive Garden. <laughs> They're asking me a good shirt, good, good <laughs> shot of the shirt. Somebody wants to buy it. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It's the Tyrell shirt. It says genetic replicants. More human than human. And it says the same thing in Japanese. Well, sort of. Sort of. <laughs> I mean, I typed Japanese. it in English, but in Japanese yeah. characters. Yeah, we try to do, like, the good... I, I get the good shit from, yeah. like, uh, Jiffy shirts. Because I like the softer shirts, which yeah. are a little bit more expensive, but I like those better. They're saying Blade Runner just out on Netflix. Yeah, if you guys have never seen Blade Runner, then there's something fucking wrong with you. Which so version it, is on Netflix, though? Is it, uh, like, yeah. w one of the 50 bajillion different versions? Uh, Yeah, I like the fucking new director's cut that has the fucking... Um, the... Uh, <clears throat> The unicorn sequences back in that lets you know that Decker was a replicant. Yeah. And the original the original story, he was a replicant. So a lot of stuff that was cut out of the original screenplay that you can find, even the sketches from it of what they were gonna shoot. And I like the uh the sequel. What was Blade Runner twenty forty nine. Right. <clears throat> Excellent movie. I loved that movie. Some people were like, oh, I don't know. They don't know. They don't know Blade Runner lore. That same director is doing Dune, and everything I heard from reputable people who have seen the new Dune, they say it is badass. So I can't wait. <coughs> I think it's it's gonna be good. I think. Yeah. It's gonna be good. It's the same dude that did the new Blade Runner. I trust that guy. I think he's a Spanish yeah, he's, director. He's French, I think. <coughs> French or Spanish? Denny Villeneuve. He knows. He knows the subject matter. You cannot do the Dune story in one movie, so you're not going to see that. It's probably going to be two or three movies. But Dune done right is going to be badass, and I liked the De Laurentiis Dune. It was very rushed, though. You could tell it started to move real fast. Well, and even David Lynch was just kind of like, man, you guys are like <coughs> fucking with me so much. I can't do what I want to do. Right. And it's like he didn't even want his name on it in the end. That should have been a a, 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 um, a, a three-movie set like Star Wars. But De Laurentiis, Dino, Dino Studio, man, I'm getting off on Dino. I love Dino De Laurentiis Studios. They had some badass fucking sci-fi. I liked um, Flash Gordon, Conan 1, Dune. They had a lot of really good shit. They had a lot of misses too. And they were not very good with money and that studio went under. But um, De uh, Dino De Laurentiis fucking films left us a good legacy to build on. That's, just, that's all I got to say about it. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, Tyler, the guy says, I'm still having trouble accepting that David Lynch directed that. Me too. It's like, it really does not seem like a David Lynch movie at all. The new one that's Other than out, Kyle MacLachlan being in it, it does not seem like a David Lynch movie to The me. new one coming that's supposed to be coming out, they say, is badass. That is everything Star badass. Wars should have been. Everything it's everything the original can. Dune should have been. They say it's great. And, and on the back of that Blade Runner prequel, I'm going to say, okay. I own that Blade, Blade Runner prequel. It's good. It's a masterpiece. Um, maybe it's not what people expected, but I was satisfied. Very satisfied. I was too. I loved that movie. Yeah. We saw it in the theater, and then we saw it again. Like I've seen, we've yeah. seen it a couple times, like on Blu-ray. Yeah. It's like some people were hell bent on Deckard as, as a human. Why would he be a fucking human in this story? Why would he? Be? And I'm not really all that concerned over whether no. he's a human or. Of course, a he was a replicant. Of course, he was a replicant. The Blade Runner was Gaff. Gaff, the guy who spoke city speak, the Mex the, the Mexican American guy with the blue eyes. He was the Blade Runner, not Deckard. They had a replicant doing that job. Yeah, they had the like, technology. Like he said, "Why wouldn't you?" Yeah, why wouldn't you? You think a fucking a real man is gonna fucking do that job against the little fucking Blade Runner? No, he's gonna use technology. So they they use Deckard. But in the in the pre in in the second in the sequel. They let you know that Decker was special, though. There was a reason for him. And it's because him and Rachel conceived a child, which was not supposed to happen, between replicants. They were artificial humans. They weren't supposed to have kids. But you just got to see the movie. Who knew? Who knew? Oh, well, you, you made that shit too good. That's why. Well, the guys, you know. Should have made the lady replicants without wombs. Tyrell mm -hmm. and fucking um, the dude who owned that new company knew that making these replicants is a waste of time. Why don't you just make them reproduce like humans and then you can take over the earth? Makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Because yeah. something has to dominate and you don't want it to be humans because they're not as good as replicants. It's from their point of view. They're not as good. They're I'll, not as good servants. I'll agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. So where was I? So okay. So Jimmy Hoff is in prison, and he's uh, meets like so, like I said some other gangsters that were also s happened to be serving time uh, yeah. around the same time period, including Anthony Provenzano, otherwise known as Tony Pro, who was from the Genovese crime family. Who, like I said, I kind of feel like maybe they were some of the ones allegedly. Don't come for me, uh, hitmen. Uh, that maybe were behind the whole Jimmy Hoffa thing. I just put somebody so, in time out for saying that the new Blade Runner was garbage. You're in time out. You're in time out. You didn't understand the movie. You're in time out. People cannot like movies. It's, no. It's okay. Time out. I mean, I did love that movie, though. Yeah. I thought it was amazing. Uh, but yeah, so uh, what ended up happening, though, while the two of them were kind of like at first, like buddy-buddy in prison and everything, but then uh, something happened. No one's entirely sure what, but... Maybe Jimmy Hoffa was, like, trying to make friends with, like, a rival, uh, you know, crime family or something like that. So him and uh, Tony Pro had a little bit of a falling out, uh, which developed into kind of like a grudge. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, you know, so Jimmy Hoffa did his time in prison, uh, was, by all accounts, an exemplary prisoner. Uh, didn't complain, just did whatever he was told to do, just kept his head down, whatever. Um, now, honestly, what ended up happening, too, was that... He got, this is how kind of popular he was. He got reelected as president of the Teamsters in 1968 while he was still in prison. Um, even though a lot of Teamsters, like I said, they knew that he was guilty of corruption of the charges that had been brought against him. But they, I mean, most of the union members were just kind of like, yeah, but everybody's doing that shit. So, and you know we're getting paid and we're just so it's fine they weren't really all that bothered about it uh so yeah they re-elected a president even though he was still uh in prison um he was in prison for a while he was up for parole a couple times but was denied even though he was you know good behavior so uh basically it's kind of like so okay so because he's in prison he was re-elected president right but obviously he couldn't run the shit from prison so what he did was he appointed a friend of his named Frank Fitzsimmons uh, to serve as acting president until he got out. Now, what ended up happening with that was that Frank Fitzsimmons, 
he said that he was going to run the Teamsters uh, as, you know, I'm just going to be exactly what Jimmy Hoffa would have done. Um, and as soon as you get out, you can have your position back. I'm just like the interim guy, uh, you know. But that's not really how the shit turned out because it really did seem like Fitzsimmons was maybe kind of like, hey, I'm kind of liking this president thing, so I'm just going to like do this shit. So uh, basically, though, what ended up happening was that Frank Fitzsimmons was not really... I feel like he wasn't as well liked as Jimmy Hoffa. He wasn't maybe as experienced in, or he wasn't as good at kind of getting everybody on the same page as Jimmy Hoffa was. Um, he wasn't that skilled of a leader. So what he ended, what Fitzsimmons ended up doing, which is something that Jimmy Hoffa would not have done, was Fitzsimmons decided he was going to give more power back to the leaders of the locals. Now, I mean, on paper, maybe this sounds like a good thing, but all it did really was like give more power to like kind of smaller fiefdoms. And then they all started like infighting. Whereas when Jimmy Hoffa was running the shit, it was more like centralized and everyone was kind of getting along better. So the fact that they kind of decentralized the power didn't work as well as maybe you would think it might. Uh, so, you know. And the thing about it, too, was that so what ends up happening is that all of these smaller, they you know, they didn't really have the power of like this national thing, like backing them now, because now they're all like more localized and it was easier for local mobs, local gangsters to take over the smaller, you know, locals, uh, which wasn't like I said, which wasn't something Jimmy Hoffa would have uh, been happy with now. What ended up happening, too, was that while Fitzsimmons was running the shit, he would, um, something that Fitzsimmons would would have done that probably Jimmy Hoffa wouldn't have, uh, you know, was that he would send, like, thugs to go around to, like, local businesses and get protection payments. So he was doing, like, mob-type shit. You know what I'm saying? Um, he would go and get protection payments to let the company remain non-union. Like, so he was essentially, yeah. So he's like going around with thugs saying, you know, give us some money and like, we'll keep a union out of your shit type of thing. Which, like I said, was not something that Jimmy Hoffa would have done because he was, you know, as much as he engaged in gangster-like tactics, he did actually seem to believe in, you know, letting like working people in the unions like believed in their cause. So he wouldn't have essentially like <laughs> bribed companies into like saying hey we'll keep unions out of here if you you know give us give us these payments or whatever so it was kind of like that kind of shit so frank fitzsimmons he um eventually ended up he's like basically what he wanted to do even though him and jimmy hoppa were uh, at some point were friends he's like well uh i decided that even though I told Jimmy Hoffa that as soon as he got out of prison, thank you, John Robertson. Love your podcast. I heavily identify with a lot of what Tom says about the South of Mississippi, me being from Arkansas. Thank you, Jenny, for inspiring me to become an amateur horror writer. Well, awesome. Thank you very much. You kind of get on that, man. A lot of good writers from the South, man. A lot of good writers from the <laughs> South. Sure. <laughs> David Jim, Tom, you wouldn't block me. You love me. Yeah. Stop <laughs> fucking around in there. I'll block a motherfucker. I'll block a motherfucker at random. Well, and the drunker he I'll gets, he's just going to start. At my, at the, he probably block me if I, I will said block an minute. innocent motherfucker. Punishing the guilty, anybody can do that. I punish <laughs> the innocent. Do not fuck with me. Not, when I'm, not when I'm in this state. <laughs> not when he's in this state. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to know. You don't want to know. <laughs> but as Sandra's talking about, she really couldn't make it through Conan 30 minutes out. And she was like, You got to see Conan, Conan, Jeremiah Johnson. Fucking Apocalypse Now. John Milius was involved in all that shit. That's fucking high testosterone stuff. But it, it is allegory. Conan is allegory. It's epic storytelling. Just Conan 1, not Conan 2. Conan 1. Yeah, Conan 2 was a little the rent. Mm, yeah. They're it's good. okay, but it could have been a lot better. Conan 1 is prehistoric Star Wars. All right, just keep watching it. Just watch the, and you have to be in the epic mood. It kind of unfolds slowly at the beginning, but it's cool. You just gotta let it go. 
You will like it when Valeria probably shows up. That's Conan's girl, girlfriend. But they're like partners in crime. They're both thieves. They're stealing, stealing shit from an evil cult. So it's okay. Yeah, and it's got it's got uh, James Earl Jones in it. Plays Dulce Doom with a snake head. Yeah. Well, part of the time. And it's uh, Dulce Doom and his cult are kind of like an allegory for fucking communism, probably Marxism. John Milius was a fucking strong, strong anti-communist. He didn't like. Um, he also did Apocalypse Now. There's a there's a lot of fucking parallels between Conan and Apocalypse Now. They have the same ending, actually. Go ahead. Okay, so at this point, uh, Frank Fitzsimmons, like I said, has decided, hey, I kind of like being uh, president of the Teamsters, even though I told Jimmy Hoffa that when he got out of prison, I was going to let him have the shit back because I'm only the interim president, but in the end, like, fuck him. I'm going to, like, fucking do what I want. So what he ends up doing, um, obviously the Teamsters had not endorsed uh, Nixon running for president in 1968, but... Uh, they decided to do so in 1972, and they gave a contribution to his Committee to Re-elect the President, uh, or CREEP, as it's known, which always makes me laugh every single time I read it. Uh, they might have given him a million dollars, allegedly. Uh, they're, no one's entirely sure. Um, but one of their conditions was, they said, okay, um, Nixon had to commute Jimmy Hoffa's sentence. Uh, they basically wanted him let out. But a stipulation that they added on to that with Frank Fitzsimmons' alleged uh, insistence was that, well, you can let him out, we'll give you all this money, but you have to say that he's not allowed to engage in direct or indirect management of any labor organization until 1980. That's the year that his prison sentence would have ended. So they're basically like tying his hands. Uh, they're getting him let out, so it looks like he's the good guy, but they're also ha adding the stipulation that he can't do any labor organizing until he would have got out of prison anyway. Uh, and that was like Frank Fitzsimmons wanting to like move in on the fucking, on his territory, right? So December 1971, Jimmy Hoffa gets uh, let out. So he gets let out of prison. He goes back to Michigan uh, and reunites with his family. They were obviously very happy to see him. His wife was like thanking Nixon for letting him out and everything. But as soon as Jimmy Hoffa found out <laughs> that one of the conditions of him being let out of prison was that he wasn't allowed to engage in any type of union activity uh, whatsoever until 1980, he was pissed off uh, because they didn't tell him this before they let him out. So, uh, so yeah, so he got out. He was like really, really mad about it. And then he's kind of like, look, he's like, if I'd have known that this was how it was going to go down, I would have just stayed in prison like and done out the rest of my sentence because this is some bullshit. So he actually tried to sue the government, claiming that this restriction on his movements was unconstitutional, um, but it uh, didn't really uh, go so well. So what he decided to do, uh, he goes back to his, uh, you know, his regular, his Detroit local 299, and he goes and just starts working there like low level, figuring, well, I'm just going to like work my way back up. Because uh, technically I'm not like an organizer, I'm just like working at the thing. So he was like doing that. Now, uh, so essentially what happened was that after Nixon ended up resigning in 1974 because of the whole Watergate bullshit, um, Jimmy Hoffa said, okay, well, maybe uh, now that Gerald Ford is in, maybe I'll get the restrictions lifted and I'll be able to like go back to my regular job again. But in 1974, the district court in D.C. Uh, said that no, the stipulations uh, were... The president is perfectly within his powers to like say that you can't do that shit. It's not unconstitutional. So, um, you know, because his crimes had been tied to the leadership of the Teamsters, they actually allowed the, um, you know, the conditions to stand. So he was not allowed to go back to doing what he was doing. Now, apparently what happened here, since Frank Fitzsimmons was still uh, the head of the Teamsters at this point, because like I said, Jimmy Hoffa was out of prison, but he was not allowed to come back and work for them anymore because of the conditions of his release. Um, the thing about the mob was that they were way more into like Frank Fitzsimmons being the head of the Teamsters because he was a lot uh, easier to work with in that he would pretty much do whatever they said, whereas Jimmy Hoffa, not so much. He was more like you know, contentious toward them and shit like that. So they liked having someone, I guess, more pliable uh, at the wheel. And uh, so, you know, they weren't really, uh, 
the mob were not all that keen on having Jimmy Hoffa come back and be like the head of the Teamsters again because he was too hard for them to work with because like I said he he was only using them for his own ends he wouldn't like necessarily do whatever they said and they didn't really like that so what they thought too was that because Jimmy Hoffa was so popular that if he did come back that there might be all of these new conflicts like among the crime families among the different teamsters there might be all of these different feuds among the different factions and that might uh turn into like a nationwide clusterfuck uh type of thing at this point we have a dude named russell buffalino who was called the silent don now he was the head of the philadelphia mafia and uh, he apparently was kind of like, he was kind of coming into the scene and he was kind of telling Jimmy Hoffa, hey, like, shut your face and just like, you know, sit in the back of the room and let everybody, because nobody like wants your involvement anymore uh, because your presence is getting to be a nuisance. Uh, so like I said, this is kind of why I'm thinking that th at this point they had him like uh, whacked. Now, Jimmy Hoffa, perhaps to his either credit or something, he was not going to let the mob tell him to sit down and shut up. He was pissed off about the conditions of his release. He was pissed off about the mob telling him to shut the fuck up. So he was just going to go right out there and like fucking, you know, uh, what he started doing was he, he started going out essentially in public and saying, hey, my ex friend, Frank Fitzsimmons, who I put in the president's position while I was in prison thinking he was my friend. Um, I'm going to come out and expose him and all of his mob connections. Uh, and that kind of would have put a lot of people in real uncomfortable positions. Uh, and it's like I said, I don't know if that's a credit or a detriment because Jimmy Hoffa had some mob ties himself. So coming out publicly and exposing all this stuff would have also exposed him as well. But maybe he was too pissed off to care at this point. I'm not really sure. Um, so at this point, uh, it's late 1974. And allegedly, no one is sure. Thank you, Victor. This is the second time I've ever drank during the show. I'm usually at work. Oh, mm -hmm. only the second time? Wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, we're drinking too. There's a conversation going on in there between Sandra and all the other little heavy hitters about... Conan, Apocalypse Now, and Jeremiah Johnson. It's all going on people's lists. Yeah, they are all kind of the same story. They're all Conan stories. Jeremiah Johnson is the American Conan. Fucking Apocalypse Now is the Vietnam U.S. Army Conan. Conan was Conan. It is... They were all kind of allegories and lessons on self-building. And also masculinity and what it means to be a man. But in Conan, also what it means to be a woman. Uh, and it, it's philosophy. Nietzschean. It's Germanic, Sandra. You will like it. That's some Germanic shit. It is idealized, but it's also mythology. Okay? And that's in all those stories. Jeremiah Johnson was mythological. There was a man like that, but those are just tales that he told. He probably didn't do half or one quarter of what they said he did. Conan is the same way. That was made by a Texan. Crazy ass Texan. Fucking, what was his name? Fucking Howard. Robert E. Howard. And that was, it was idealized masculinity. Nowadays they probably call that shit toxic masculinity. But it's not toxic. It is a creative masculinity. It's about defense, defending, and growth. And how women play in with this. And reproduction and... And what it means to be friends and what, what fucking a bromance is. All that shit's in these movies and all of them. Because that's John Milius wrote and or directed all those. And Milius was the shit. Milius was also fucking kind of like and sometimes kind of loved and lampooned in Hollywood for his beliefs. Um, but directors, other directors did respect him. You know, he did Red Dawn also. Uh, but they did respect him. He was a, he was a good dude, and he was a big talker. What was the, the great Lebo Big Lebowski? Did, big Lebowski. Did, in the Big Lebowski, they fucking had a character who was supposed to be John Milius. Yeah, it was that, based on him. Or that's what I've him. heard. Yeah, it's based John on John Goodman's character. John Goodman's was character was based. Ba 
He shut was, the fuck up, Donnie. Yeah, shut the fuck up, Donnie. He was just kind of a man's man, kind of a... He was a Jewish dude in Hollywood who was right-wing, kind of an Ariel Sharon-type guy, big into stuff that other Jewish dudes like Spielberg and Lucas weren't... They weren't into that. They're like, that's kind of fascist. He's like, oh, fuck you. You're not a man, dude. He was that kind of guy, you know? But he was... He knew what he was talking about. It's just another approach, another angle of it. I believe it, all these different viewpoints should be shown. I like them all. They all have their strengths and weaknesses. But out of these, out of the directors, the classic directors of that era, Milius. John Milius was my man. That was the Ariel Sharon of fucking uh, of directors. I liked him. David Jean says, "Is it better than The Shining?" Trick question. Hardly anything is better than. Is the Shining. what better than The Shining? I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. Conan, probably. Uh, no. Sandra said, when Tom talks about it, it sounds awesome. Tom's descriptions are better than the movie. <laughs> no, fucking no. Apocalypse Now is one of the best movies ever fucking made. <laughs> Apocalypse Now is one of the best movies ever made. It's just that it's a war movie. Some women aren't into that. Conan is also kind of like a war movie. That involves cults in a fucking another age. And she liked Jeremiah Johnson. Sandra liked Jeremiah. It's just... They're all kind of the same story, in a way. They're just in a different setting. Go to the restroom. Make Grand Theft Hammer said, every two or three years, the FBI digs up a horse farm or woodlot in suburban Detroit based on a tip. Yeah, and I kind of saw, I was watching a documentary about it where they dug up some horse farm and then they dug in one place and they're like, yeah, we didn't find shit. He was supposed to be like in a fucking barrel or something. And then, like, uh, this one dude comes on and is like, yeah, well, they had the map upside down or something like that. And they were supposed to be, like, digging over here and they digged over there. I don't know. I kind of feel like, like I said, if it was the mob, you'd think they'd have better ways of getting rid of somebody than just, like, putting them in an oil drum and burying them. I kind of feel like, why don't they throw them in a wood chipper or something? I don't know. But whatever. So, uh, so yeah. So, we're talking about uh, Russell Buffalino. Um, and allegedly, like I said... Um, he kind of like warned, uh, Jimmy Hoffa a few times. It's like, Hey, shut the fuck up, set the fuck down. Um, he was too much of a troublemaker. Like I said, they liked Fitzsimmons being in charge of the Teamsters cause he was a lot easier to work with from the mob point of view. Um, Jimmy Hoffa was more of, like I said, a troublemaker. So basically, uh, Jimmy Hoffa perhaps to his, uh, you know, or perhaps unwisely decided he was going to get like all fucking pissed off about it. So he starts saying, yeah, well, I'm going to, um, you know, go to the feds and tell like Fitzsimmons and talk about Fitzsimmons mob ties and like expose everybody. At which point, allegedly, Russell Buffalino, maybe, uh, maybe authorized a hit on him um, with Anthony Provenzano, also known as Tony Pro. Uh, he was the one that was supposed to do it. Like I said, nobody knows if this is entirely true or not because everybody tells a different story. But allegedly. July 1975. Uh, Jimmy Hoffa gets an invitation uh, from a dude who was a mobster in Detroit named Anthony Tony Jack Gioc Giacalone. And he's like, okay, we're going to have like this meeting with Tony Pro because uh, we know you guys are beefing. So we're going to sit down and have a meeting and we're going to work everything out. So they schedule this meeting. Now, at this point, Jimmy Hoffa has got to be thinking, probably this is not, like, I'm probably, like, my ass is in danger here. I would think. Like, he wasn't a stupid dude. You would think that he kind of knew what was going on. Um, now, at this point, like I said, if you've seen the movie The Irishman, which... Most people that I saw like talking about this in documentaries, writing about this and various things, think that Frank Sheeran, otherwise known as the Irishman, uh, is full of shit, that he wasn't the one that did this. But according to his account, uh, he was a friend of Jimmy Hoffa's. He was uh, led the Teamsters in Del He had a uh, local in Delaware. And he was supposedly, I don't know if this is true or not, but he was supposedly a hitman, like kind of on the side. That was like a side gig. Um... So supposedly he was going to be along as like protection, like Jimmy was going to bring him along uh, as protection. So what happened? Uh, Jimmy Hoffa writes a note um, and leaves it at his vacation house at Lake Orion. Now, this note says that he was supposed to go for this meeting at 2 p.m. 
on July 30th at a restaurant like called the Macus, the Macus Red Fox. This was in uh, Bloomfield Township, which is a suburb of Detroit. Now, what they were supposed to do, I don't know if they were like supposed to like meet in the restaurant. I think they were just going to use the parking lot and then they were going to go somewhere else, like somewhere non-public so they could like talk about shit and not be like monitored. So apparently what ha what happens is that Jimmy Hoffa is driving from his lake house in Lake Orion and he's trying to get hold of this other dude named uh, Louis Linto, uh, who was also maybe kind of like a muscle type of dude. So he apparently tried to get in touch with that dude, but he couldn't get in touch with him. So he ends up going to this meeting by himself. So he gets to this restaurant and he goes to a payphone uh, at 2.15 and he's basically like, look, I was supposed to meet these dudes at two o'clock, um, Tony Jack and Tony Pro. He was supposed to meet them at 2.15. And he's like, these bitches haven't shown up yet. I'm um, just sitting here waiting. And he tells her that I'll be back at the lake house at four o'clock. So apparently he was waiting there for an hour and a half and nobody turned up. Um, now at this point, uh, so nobody comes there. Like, so he's supposed to meet somebody at two, but nobody shows up. So according to several witnesses, Jimmy Hoffa just went into the restaurant, ate some lunch and then came back out. And then he was waiting more in the parking lot. And then he goes back in and makes a phone call to uh, Louis Linto from a payphone in the basement. And this is the last record they have of him. Um, several people said that about 3.30 p.m. they saw like a burgundy colored sort of like Mercury Marquis, I think it was showing up in the parking lot and maybe he got in the car with like two or three other people and then it drove off. But essentially that's like the last time that he was ever seen alive. So he doesn't come back home that evening. His wife starts freaking out as she would. Uh, then the morning after that, she calls her kids and tells them, Hey, uh, your dad never came home. Uh, his daughter, Barbara, uh, was in St. Louis as she flew back to Detroit at the time. Now she was pretty sure that i mean everybody's pretty sure that he got murdered like i said um the only question is who did it and where he ended up um i think for a little while because i saw some like um some footage at the time of like his son and his daughter and they were kind of like saying hey if you've kidnapped our dad like for ransom or something like that like please please bring him back and all this other kind of shit. But his daughter says, at least she said later that when she was um, coming to Detroit, after she heard that her dad hadn't come home, she was pretty sure that he had been uh, murdered. So uh, investigators start, they, they're pretty sure early on that, yeah, he probably got whacked. So they start looking for his body, uh, which if you know anything about the Jimmy Hoffa case, they never define that shit. They're still every now and then are still like kind of following up some tips, looking for the shit. Um, yeah. So I think somebody brought this up earlier, probably the most common myth. This is the one that I always heard growing up was that Jimmy Hoffa was buried beneath giant stadium in New Jersey, which at the time of his disappearance was actually being built. Uh, so basically like the, the New Jersey mob, it's like they bumped him off and then they just poured him in the thing and then concrete was poured over him. So they'll never like find it. Um, now that giant stadium was torn down actually in 2010, uh, but obviously they never, never found any bodies in there because I don't really think that's uh, what happened. Uh, some other people said that he, that his body got taken to New Jersey and dumped in a landfill that was supposedly like a big, uh, mafia body dumping area. Cause like I said, that was kind of like a thing, like the mob, a lot of, people that were in the mob own shit like landfills, sanitation type of facilities, funeral homes, that kind of stuff, which if you think about it, that's like a really good thing to own. If you really have a lot of bodies you need to dispose of. Thank you, David June. Make me a drink, Tom. <laughs> shit, man. I'm drinking fucking apple pie right now. Is it? Yeah. It's cake, cake flavored vodka and apple juice. It tastes just like apple pie. Try it. Try it. Try it. in my face. Just like apple pie. Strong, too. 
That's pretty good. I don't. It doesn't taste like apple pie. It tastes like um. More like apple. What is that? I've tasted like it a before. bear claw, like an apple. Yeah, cinnamon. yeah, yeah. What do they call that thing? Like an apple. Like an apple fritter. Apple fritter. It kind of tastes like apple an apple fritter. fritter. Yeah. It's very sweet, though. I don't think I could drink a whole thing of that. As drunk as I am, I can continue to drink. Well, I'm convincing Sandra to watch, to watch fucking Conan. She liked Jeremiah Johnson. Yeah. Yeah. You would like you would like Conan, and you'd like Apocalypse Now is actually the best out of all three. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, that is the shining of war movies. It's good. Really good. But watch Conan. Conan is like an opera. It's like a Germanic opera. It's like the Nibelung. It's mo- mostly music and score and friendship and fighting some stuff and some some allegories for life's lessons and when you get done watching it if you don't if you don't understand it all I, I did we did a whole show on what all that stuff meant men stealing the power of women for their own power yeah not that all. people all this kind of <laughs> shit that they do yeah it's all in there that Quit cult, taking my power that cult was doing that seducing women and the through the power of the feminine to empower themselves to fool the women to cause everyone in a circle jerk to eat each other so they could have power they weren't producing anything so they had to resort to cannibalism it's it's a good it's a good allegory for things i don't know why but that just reminded me of this i was watching some like uh old hotel hell on tubi last night and every time there was a commercial break there's a commercial on there for what's it called? Fexi. It's like a birth control yeah. foam or gel or something. And the whole premise of the commercial is that a woman, I don't, I'm not really entirely sure what the logistics of this are, but it's a woman who is like living inside her own vagina. Yeah, yeah, we saw that commercial. And ever like at the every beginning time I of the see commercial, it, I'm like, I'm this chick's pussy. It looks like a fucking welcome fucking to my pad. vagina. She says. Yeah, and I'm going like. Man. And like the inside, it's like all carpeted and like pink and stuff. I'm like, man, that's, it's like the top of the Sands Hotel. That's pretty awesome. I'm like, fuck, I want to rent that room. I'll be deep in that shit. <laughs> and she's gonna be in the pussy with me. I can't understand it. <laughs> How does that work? I'm so in she, the pussy and she's so, in there with me. We're talking. I'm in the pussy. Yeah. Well, that's talking. what I'm saying. But Fuck. honestly, that's a pretty successful commercial, though, yeah. because it's like one. It made every, me like laugh out loud every time yeah, I saw yeah, it. Yeah, I was drinking at the time. Fucking Jenny's going. We're in her pussy, and she's talking. Yeah, I was like, like, dude, like, we're in her and pussy. I'm, like, right I'm gonna shake myself. And I'm like, <laughs> what? We're in her pussy? She says, Yeah, we're in her pussy. Yeah. She's talking. I'm like, so we're in her pussy right now, and it's all like, fucking yeah. red, fucking pink, and fucking background it looks wow. like inside a hotel i was like wow and who's the inside of my vagina was that and fancy like, well and i had to stop myself i would want to like run and live in there too yeah i'm like i'm like jenny i'm gonna live inside my own vagina to be the interior of her pussy. I was like, yeah yes. yeah she's in her own pussy telling us all this shit. yeah like, i was oh. like don't ask me how it works it was like all oh, meta i was like <laughs> <laughs> it's a funny commercial though. so kudos to whoever came up with that concept yeah, right, because yeah. i was just kind of like all right i see yeah. where you're going with that i like it i like it but yeah <laughs> I don't know why that just reminded me of that. Because you were talking about like dudes stealing like women's power and stuff, and yeah. I was like, oh, like that woman that lives in her own vagina. <laughs> the woman that lives in her own vagina. Ooh, that's a story prompt. I should write a story about a woman that lives in her own vagina. That'd be a pretty good story. All right, so um, yeah, so this whole landfill thing, like they dumped him in a landfill. Uh, the landfill that they supposedly dumped him in, that has been searched, uh, but they didn't find any human remains there, so probably not. Um. Now, some other uh, theories say that he was buried in a shallow grave near the murder site. Uh, yeah, we're going to go back and move the body later, but they never got around to it. Um, I kind of don't buy that either, because like I said, this is the mob. Uh, body disposal was kind of one of their things. So if they were going to do it, they would do it in a way where like the bitch wouldn't be found, which obviously they did in this situation because he hasn't been found. I don't think there's anything left. And like you said... There was one theory. This is this is the theory you would hear to, right? Where he was just put in a car. Yeah. And then it was Grandpa's, compacted. Grandpa's hammer said the same thing even before he spoiled the shit. Before the show even started. But I believe he's right. You have to understand that this is an industrial city. Heavily, heavily linked with the automotive industry. And in the Detroit area, there's a bunch of scrap yards. And the mob had friends working in all those goddamn scrapyards. There's no reason to bury anybody. There's no reason to do all this fucking weird shit. Like Grandpa's talking about feeding people to pigs. There's no reason for that in Detroit. Especially when you have so much power within the audio industry and all the, all the fucking industries that are, surround it. 
Hoffa was disposed at an industrial level. You take him and you do what you always do when you get rid of a body. You put it in the goddamn trunk. That's step one. Then you take the car. You say, well, we're going to put him not only in my car, we're going to put this motherfucker in a junk car. And we're going to take him down to the scrapyard where our friend's on duty right now. And we're going to squish him. And we're going to have this car crushed. So you put him in there and what they do is they fucking crush him, crush the car into a cube a couple feet on a side, and then they take that cube and they throw it into a pit of fucking molten fucking metal to reclaim all that metal. That's what that's what I believe is most plausible based on everything that all the evidence that we have. That's what happened to Hoffa. He was vaporized in molten metal. Well, they have had some other I can't remember who it was that said it, but one of the gangsters that supposedly knew what was going on said uh, he's part of a Japanese car right now. Yeah, he's part of a Japanese car right now. That's, well, I don't know about that's, now, that's, that's but back it, then. <laughs> because with a system like that, the dudes running the scrapyard would would not even know what the hell was going on. It's just that a gangster friend of theirs said, crush that car. And they okay. were like, yes, sir. They don't know what's in the damn trunk. Well, they're not going to ask questions, no, are they? Because then they're going to get fucking popped. gangsters. They're all friends and shit. These are all friends. Okay, yeah, fine. They're not putting two to two about this and that, and they're not going to rat anyway. And then when they're crushing that car, they're handing out $100 bills to everybody. That's what happened. Whatever biological material was in that damn trunk was crushed down to a tiny space. It hit that molten metal and was vaporized. That seems like the best way to do it. I mean, like yeah. I said, you know, we're talking about the movie The Irishman, and I'm pretty sure, and this is another theory that was going around at the time, I'm pretty sure that this is what they uh, portrayed in The Irishman, was that uh, they just shot him in the head. Like, he got in the car, they took him to a house, they shot him in the head, and then they took him to a crematorium that one of them owned, or, like, was owned by a friend of theirs, and they just threw him in the fucking uh, crematorium. The crematorium would still Which, have bones and fucking shit. Well, like yeah, that. that would work, too, but it's kind of like, well... You know. And you're calling attention. You're now going to a place where they're... Now, nah, I believe, and I believe, I'm believe i agreeing with Gramthers, based on the, the Detroit solution to this problem for these motherfuckers here would have been to scrap the car. Just put him in a car and scrap the car. Beowulf said that's how Christine was made. Yeah, I yeah. kind of... That's maybe why. That's the first yeah. thing I thought of like at the end of Christine where they crushed her into like a cube. Back in the heyday of Detroit, those scrap yards ran 24-7. There's no reason to even fucking... No one Make would even fest. notice, probably. Nope. Just show up and go scrap this car for us. Okay. Psh. Yes, sir. There it is. Like I said, no one would even think nope. about it. I mean, they might think about it, but why? Like, yeah, they don't know what that is. Right. So, I don't know. That does seem like kind of yeah. lately. There would have been nothing left. Yeah. And then there is none of this reason, none of this worry about, well, where is his body? Where was he buried? There well, like no I said, the burial. best way to avoid that is to, yeah. like, make sure that there isn't There a is body. no body. To like pour it in the acid yeah. plate, put you it could in go acid down to the bottom of that something. You could go down to the bottom of that. Feed it to a shark. You could go down to the bottom of that molten slag and look all you wanted and you'd never find a body. That shit was a reduced to smoke. <laughs> Along with the plastic and all the other shit that was in that car. Yeah. I mean, like I said, that seems like that would be That's probably the best. That, that would be like the best yeah. way to do it. That would so, be the first thing you go to because they had access to that technology. So that would be just the first fucking no-brainer. Put him in a trunk and crush the car, have it fucking send it to the scrapyard. That's yeah. A, that's a... So, yeah. So he disappeared in 1975. Uh, seven years later, uh, July 1982, he was officially declared dead because, like I said, they have no idea where he went. Uh, murder case remains open, but inactive, uh, as they call it now. Now, one of the first biographies of Jimmy Hoffa after he was after he disappeared let's let's be honest yeah. he was murdered uh this dude named dan moldea he uh did a lot of research and talked to a lot of different gangsters that would have known what was going on and he thought that maybe his theory was because like i said i i kind of feel like this came back into like the public consciousness because of the martin scorsese movie the irishman which was about frank sheeran who that whole story about him, like, yeah, we picked him up in this uh, car and, like, we took him to this house and shot him. Like I said, the FBI actually did investigate the house that Frank Sheeran said, and they did find blood there, 
but they were unable to match the blood. I've seen like some sources say it wasn't uh, Jimmy Hoffa's blood and some saying like the results were inconclusive. Like they couldn't tell whether it was Jimmy Hoffa's blood or not. They did find blood in the house that Frank Sheeran said that they had shot him in, mm -hmm. but that doesn't necessarily mean that's where they shot him. My boy Grampers, we went to high school together. He's ex-cop in case you guys are just jumping in the show. He fucking knows Detroit real well. We both fucking came up there. Um, he said, many a body has, quote, disappeared in the Detroit scrapyards. Yes. It's another place. It is a very industrial place, especially back in those times. All the equipment, the technology was there. They would not do anything out of the ordinary or crazy. They would go right to the fucking easiest way to dispose a body. They had, a, they had fucking connections with all those scrapyards. They just would have put him in a trunk and fucking said, scrap that car. And that's what would have happened. You never would have found that dude. And he wasn't the only one. Fucking Grandpa's right. They probably did that to, regularly, on a regular basis to other dudes. They wouldn't have done anything special. Why bury a dude? Because then you're worried about fucking somebody digging him up. And then that's work. Scrap the fucking car. Gone. Granther's Hammer points out, uh, dig up any Detroit house floor and there'll be dry blood. Exactly. And yeah. that's why they couldn't say, yeah. you know, yeah, that's where he was killed because they're like, yeah, there was blood there, but it's like, that could be anybody's. Yeah. That could be anybody's. Who knows who was murdered in this fucking house? But uh, yeah, so Dan Muldale, like I said, he was a biographer. His story was, he didn't think that Frank Sheeran was the dude that killed Jimmy Hoffa. Because like I said, that was kind of the basis of the whole movie, The Irishman, because Frank Sheeran on his deathbed, that was his deathbed confession that he said he killed him. Most people think that he was full of shit, that he wasn't, they're, they're not saying he wasn't there or he didn't know about it, but they don't think that he was the actual one that did it. Um, so what this particular dude thinks, he says that 3.30 PM, like I said, um, Jimmy Hoffa had showed up in the, at this restaurant parking lot because he was supposed to meet these uh, Tony Pro and uh, the other gangster dude at uh, this restaurant and they didn't show up and he waited there for like 90 minutes and then, so Chucky O'Brien, like I said, who was kind of like his foster son, right? Shows up in the parking lot um, in this Mercury Marquis. In the car also was Salvatore Bergulio, who was kind of like this other gangster. Now, this particular biographer thinks that actually it was Salvatore Bergulio, who was the dude that actually killed Jimmy Hoffa. But no one will ever know because that dude was murdered only three years later. So, you know, yeah. um, nobody knows if that's uh, who it was or not. Now, he seems to think, uh, this particular biographer, Dan Muldale, like I said, seems to believe that Chucky O'Brien, who, like I said, was kind of like a son to Jimmy Hoffa, wasn't really, didn't really know that this was going to be a hit. They just invited him along, like you said, because they didn't think that they thought that Jimmy Hoffa would be suspicious if like just these other gangster people showed up and it's like, Oh my God, they're going to like fucking whack me. But if Chucky was there, like maybe he'd be like, oh, okay, I'll get in the car. Cause everything's legit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Which like I said, that sounds like some shit they would do. Oh, hold on. Sandra jumps in and goes, Detroit sounds like hell. I have to Google the pictures. <laughs> Look, Robocop was based upon Detroit as it was disintegrating. A lot of the Detroit downtown area had the, the Robocop, OCP, Omni Consumer Products Feel. It was the American version of Siberia, like Tenkelgrad, where they made all the tanks, for, you know, shit like that. But that was just downtown. The place where me and Gramthers fucking were growing up in high school, but I, it was also Brazil for me too, I'd switch between the two at that time, was actually very positive uh, and it had a lot of promise for the future. It felt like Hilldale from the Back to the Future fucking movies. That's that. It was like all American, mom, apple pie, Chevrolet, very American, very fucking Michael J. Fox. That's kind of how it felt. Bob Seeger, um, hey, get a job with the company, be a company man, you'll make money, everything will be great. You'll have a big house, rotating credit, you have a bunch of credit cards, you'll have any kind of car you want, your car will have a turbocharger on it, you'll be able to fucking get a blonde wife with a fucking redheaded girlfriend, it fucking won't matter, it's just endless growth, tomorrow is a utopia. That's an industrial utopia. That's the way it felt. 
Americana before before all that shit got shipped out to China. <laughs> Because uh, that's it was very very positive in the suburb in the suburban areas, at least where we were in Trenton. It didn't last though. Fucking um, yeah, the American dream, kind of falling apart. You know, I don't think grim. it was ever really a thing. Well, when you were a kid, you thought it was. Yeah, but that doesn't mean it was really a thing. But that the thing meant is, you is were that... a dumbass kid that believed. No, bullshit. but your parents—that's the way it was for them. Sort of? And for their parents, it was the way for... No, Granthers, tell her. They all were... Why are you cr- acting like I'm not the same age as you? No. I was, remember. <laughs> it, but it was that area. <laughs> that area around Detroit. No, it was super fucking positive. And every time you went back a generation, it was more and more positive because they, they all kind of had it made. Yeah. Well, you have to think, too, that back in the day, yeah. people had a lot lower expectations. Uh, no. Also. No. 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 They, they had it made. They were, they were doing very well. Very well. They were all in those unions, and they were making a shit ton of money. They were moving up and buying big houses. They, they owned things. It's just that it, it kind of hit a bubble, and politics and the unions fucking destroyed all that shit, and they shipped it overseas. We were kind of... Me and Granthers were growing up in the time where they were just starting to ship it overseas. Uh, a couple of years later, I left. Uh, what was that? I guess that was in 87, 88, 88. Maybe about eight, late 88 is fucking when I left. And then soon after that, it rapidly started to fall apart after I left. Even though it had collapsed once back in the 60s. It wasn't as good as it was in the 60s. 50s and 60s was even better, evidently. It was a place of rapid growth. It was the... Uh, Detroit was rivaled De- uh, New York. Easily. Easily. It was the industrial center of the United States. They made all the cars. They made a lot of money. Even Tucker was around for a while. But it was mostly Ford, Chevrolet, Dodge. They just made them all. They had a lot of fucking money. Tyler, the guy says, being in crime sounds like hell. Constantly worrying about who wants you dead. Yeah, we brought that up earlier. We were talking about cocaine cowboys and also this situation. Uh, the money's probably is nice, but you know you're always worried somebody's gonna like fucking shoot you in the back of the head, which doesn't sound like a lot of fun. Grandfather's Hammer says Detroit is a hellscape, but the suburbs are classic Americana. Victor says Detroit just needs a little gentrification. We'll be back. The burbs are still booming. Yeah, I've heard that too. Like a lot of people actually uh, live outside. And Grimther said, I now live an hour west of Detroit. Woods and lakes and wildlife. God's country. Super beautiful and yeah. pastoral. Oh yeah, that's another thing that I forgot. Michigan has fantastic woods and, 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 and a natural beauty. Especially up towards the Great Lakes area. Where there is not a big difference between Detroit and Canada. And Canada is kind of like a fucking one huge fucking national forest. I mean, it's pretty up there, but it's cold. It's the American Siberia. It's one of the coldest places in America. You also said, what I'm exactly, what was this last fucking comment? I want everyone to know that Tom is exactly the same as when we were in high school. Just more worldwise, but same exact humor and insight. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you haven't changed much. Though. No, I think <laughs> you're pretty much, a, you think your character is pretty much set by the time you're fucking 16, 17. You stay about the same. It just adds, it adds on to it. And then you die. You just get crankier. Yeah. I'm not cranky anymore, <laughs> though. Started bumping that test. I feel fucking good. You're still kind of cranky. <laughs> yeah, sometimes, sometimes. I was cranky before, though. I mean, I've all, I've been cranky my whole entire yeah. life, so you know what I mean? <laughs> Since I hit teenage yeah. years anyway, so yeah. I've been cranky my whole life. But, uh, no, I, I mean, um, my friend Steve still lives up there also. I could live in, 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 in Michigan. It's just, uh, it's not, it's cold a lot of the years, and it's it's, nice. it's not really the center of fucking attention like the way Florida is. Florida is kind of like the new version of California. I lived in California, too. It's kind of like California But like Part I said, two. the way things are nowadays, your location is not as important. It's not as important as it, as it was, be. but... So... Yeah. Which, in a way, kind of, like, opens shit up, because it's like, hey, man, if I'm going to, like, live... Well, out in kind of like the middle of nowhere, but you can still, as long as you still have Wi-Fi, you're well, Sophie it's still came, good. Sophie came to visit us. Sophie's kind of typical for for Michigan. That's the way the people are. 
Um, they're they're good people. I don't know, I don't know, Grampus, if you know Soph, but Soph, Sophie is actually friends with Jason's little sister, and I met Sophie through the show, and fucking we didn't realize that that's how small the world is. We didn't realize that we basically are fucking cousins. If you know, if I know you through Jason and fucking Steve and fucking Trenton, then you're like a cousin. So Sophie's kind of like a cousin. But uh, remember Jason's little sister? Fucking that was that was uh, Sophie was friends with her. Yeah. David, she, June, didn't, she didn't go to Trent High though. David June says I'm disappointed. There's been no wigs tonight. Fuck man, these motherfuckers. You okay, forgot all okay. about your wigs. We all about a goddamn wig. Oh my god. I'm going straight into the future with this shit then. Going straight into the future. Who's it this talked about this? David June said. All right, David, here you go. All right. Going Do straight. Do the wig. I'm going to the bathroom. Going straight Conan. I'm going to the bathroom again. Shit. Go ahead and go to the restroom. <laughs> going straight Conan. I'm going to get my fucking. Go ahead. No, no, no. I'm going to go ahead. Now, where's where's the brush? Where's the brush? No, I got to brush this shit. It's over by the on air sign. It's not by the on air sign? Oh, that's it. Yeah. It's by the illustrious on air sign. Yeah, Detroit was a trip. I gotta take Jenny down to Detroit. Maybe uh, take her to a uh, city club. Take her to city club and the shelter. I haven't been there in forever, although I have run into some people over at uh, fucking Barbarella's downtown, Orlando. I had a couple of girls that uh, were from Michigan that was going, still going to city club pretty regularly, and they, they said it was still pretty good. This is a weird place. But yeah, Grandpa's mentioned it. He said outside Detroit, the suburbs out there are like pure Americana. Yeah, they, they, they are. Midwest Americana, I'd say. Um, kind of a Scandinavian background, most of them. Scandinavian and Czech. And Czech. Uh, you have a lot of Eastern European people. A lot of skis. Kowalski. Nowalski. Everybody's got a name that ends with ski at the end of it. Honkies. You know, that's how they are. A fucking good friend of mine named Mike Kowalski, he was, ended up owning a damn... Remember Mike? Little skinny-ass Mike ended up owning a damn ambulance company. Running ambulance... He was a paramedic for a while and then got into the ambulance business because, of course, you know, Detroit needs lots of ambulances. And uh, he owns an ambulance business. Go ahead. Gee, thanks. <laughs> Go ahead. You stole my brush. I got the brush right here. It doesn't matter. <laughs> He's like fucking... Your wig's like all low on your It doesn't matter. <laughs> You're all like fucking... I mean, I was almost like to the end. So what I was going to say was that even though... Uh, so this uh, Mercury Marquis that apparently Jimmy Hoffa got picked up in, which like I said, a lot of uh, witnesses did say that they saw him get into this car with like two or three other dudes. They did actually find that car later. And they did find a single hair in there that belonged to Jimmy Hoffa. That doesn't necessarily mean that he got killed in that car, though. That just means that he was in there at some point. Although I think they did, like, put, um, you know, kind of cadaver-sniffing dogs on the car. And uh, they smelled Jimmy Hoffa on the back seat and in the trunk. So, not sure. Like, some... Some sources said that he never left that particular car. They just left him in that car. But like I said, that car, I don't think was crushed because they investigated it later and they found like... Why would you it. crush your, your car? Well, I don't know if that was yeah. anyone's car. I think that was a rented car. Rented car, okay. To be honest well, with you. But still, you wouldn't crush that too because then that would fucking cause... That would cause Well, problems. yeah, they'd be like, hey, where'd like, that, car that car go that, that, we, that we rented to you? You're going to crush an old junk car that no one will question why yeah. you're crushing that. So that's not the original car that they killed him and put him in. They probably they might have put him in another one. Put him in one, one. car and they might have like him. knocked him out. Yeah. And then put him in another one. I kind of feel I like that's probably him. the most likely scenario. It probably knowing the mob, the way they would do it is somebody slipped up behind him while it was it, the dude Hoff is talking to his buddy and they're fucking you're planning something in the future. He's not seeing it, but somebody else is coming up behind him. Maybe he's in the seat behind him. Pop pops in the back of the head with something real small, like a twenty two. Or 32. Nothing big, nothing that makes a bunch of noise. And then that kills him. And then they put him in the trunk of that car. And then they go, okay. And they got all shit all pre-planned. Then they drive that car to the shit car they're going to crush and put him in that car. And then they put somebody else to drive that car. And then that person drives that car to the scrapyard. 
and he's probably a lower echelon guy, but they got a big dude with him watching him. Maybe they're following him in a car, you know, to make sure that he crushes it. It's going to be something like that. Beowulf says, what year is this happening? 1975. 75. 1975. 75. That was the year you could get away with all kinds of shit back in those yeah. days. I mean, that does sound kind of likely. Yeah. Um, and it also sounds likely, like I said, I don't believe the thing that Frank Sheeran was the one that killed him. I think it was um, uh, whatever that dude, like uh, Bergoglio or there was another dude named, and uh, what was the name? Andretti or Andretti or something like that. Um, he was one of the ones in the car, but... The fact that they had Sheeran in there, who's a friend of his, was probably, like, to put him at ease. Because, like I said, I'm sure he was probably, like, on guard. He probably knew, like, people were out to get him and shit, right? Yeah. Um, although, I will say that uh, I saw an interview with a dude that was Jimmy Hoffa's driver. And he said, you know, I had coffee with Jimmy Hoffa, like, the day before he disappeared. And this dude... Uh, he even he knew that like some bad shit was going to happen. He's like, man, you, you really need to be careful because people are like, gunning for you. And he said, allegedly, that Jimmy Hoffa had told him, my people won't harm me. Yeah, those are the ones that killed him. <laughs> well, and I mean, the fact that they had like one of his friends yeah. along to. And like I said, maybe that dude didn't even know that they were like going to bump him off. They just said, hey, we're going to like do this thing and we're going to have a meeting. And why don't you come with us? So I don't know. I don't I don't know who knew about it. I don't know who was in that car. But, I mean, it's pretty obvious that he got in that car in the parking lot. Yeah. Because a lot of people saw that. But that was the last time that he was seen. It's kind of funny how mafiosi fucking don't, don't follow their own rules. Because it was well known, even in, 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 in his time, in Hoffa's time, that usually the ones that get you are your best friends. But I guess you're kind of in denial. You don't think your best friends are actually going to be the ones to pull the trigger on you. Well, and the thing about it, too, you is, don't that, want to think that. is that sometimes higher-ups yeah. might say to your best friend, hey, I'm going to whack you yeah. if you don't help us whack him. Yeah, well, they're doing this for mutual survival. They're all afraid to, of going to jail. Yeah. He's a security risk. He's got to go. Well, if he starts talking to the cops, who are the first ones that are going to go to prison? His friends. Yeah. Because he's got information on all his friends. You know, he's, he's going to implicate all his friends. So those are the ones that are going to get him. And they don't have anything against him. They're just seeing him as kind of like a stupid motherfucker who's going to talk to the cops. You know? And, you know, he's just doing what he's trying to do because he's being squeezed. He's just trying to stay alive, but we can't let this happen. Okay. Come on, Jimmy. Let's go get something to drink. You know what I mean? It's that, it's that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Kind of like a good analogy would be like in The Walking Dead when your friend's been bit. Okay. Yeah. It's not his fault that he's been bit. You don't hold it against him, but you got you got to kill him. Or he's going to turn into a zombie. It's that's the mentality you're talking about. This is business. Yeah. Yeah. He's going to turn because he's being squeezed. And Tyler, the guy, makes yeah. a very good point. Friends in the mafia aren't friends. Not really. Yeah. No. Well, and like I said, that's another aspect of this whole, and this is what we were talking about when we were talking about cocaine cowboys, is you can't, in that business, you can't trust anyone. Even people Unless that you're are... you're not going to jail. Yeah. Well, even people <laughs> that are supposedly your friends, and you yeah. can't, you really can't, and that really sucks. That would be like a shitty way to live. Yeah. Because you can't, what if you got drunk and like said something incriminating, and it's like now that person that you thought was your friend is going to use that against you. Um, you know, you can't relax around anybody yeah. because you never know um, if that person's really your friend, if they're just getting close to you to get information or if they're just like trying to step on you to get to a greater position or whatever it is, you can't ever like trust anybody. And I kind of feel like that was the situation here. And maybe I don't think Jimmy Hoffa was naive, but, um, cause he knew the game. He knew the shit that was going on, but it seems like they still fucking got to him anyway. Yeah. Because I think he was naive enough to think that maybe there was a couple people that could still be trusted, and apparently there was not. He was grasping for straws. He was thinking that he's he was different. That's what it was. No. 
Well, everybody thinks that. Everybody thinks that. Everybody thinks that. And he it got, always gets you in trouble. He was getting squeezed. He got bit. He was a security risk. He had to go. He didn't think his friends would do it. But they're all his friends. They were they were his friends, though. They liked him. It's just that his friends are all start... Their, their own survival is paramount. Everybody has to fucking survive. Well, and like I said, and the you're thing... you're not going to go to jail. The thing about year. it, too, yeah, not only are they afraid to go to jail, yeah. but if higher-ups are squeezing them to like yeah, get so rid of this dude right there's basically like look we're gonna bump you off or are you gonna right. fuck up your family we're gonna kill right. your family yeah. Yeah. if you don't like get in on this there's no choice it's almost kind of yeah like, it's, it's, they it's, don't really have a it's choice. like a military operation yeah basically so they just well, wait he gotta go he's gonna lead to us we gotta it's all about foiling investigations okay, well and that's so. essentially what they were doing because right, jimmy yeah. hoffa i mean like I said, credit to him for at least being ballsy enough to like stick to his principles. But the fact that he stuck to his principles and he basically came out and said, "Hey, I'm gonna like tell everybody about your mob ties." Yeah. Maybe maybe yeah. not such a smart thing to do when like you also have mob ties. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying, because uh, they're gonna like come get you and be like, "Oh well, I guess we need to shut you up then, <laughs> permanently." So I kind of feel like that's what happened. Um, you know. So I, I don't think anyone's disputing. I know there are a couple like fringe theories out there that uh, that he actually uh, was alive. Well, he wouldn't be alive now because he'd be like a hundred something years old. But um, that he was alive for a long time, like in mafia custody, or that he was in the witness protection program. I do not buy that at all. I think ninety nine point nine nine percent of people are pretty sure that he got bumped off. They just don't know who exactly who was the trigger man and where exactly the body ended up. Yeah. That's really the only yeah. mystery. Sandra, if you want to see another couple cool Detroit movies, all right? I know you like these movies. You're trying to put America into the into perspective. See Beverly Hills Cop 1 and 2 with Eddie Murphy. <laughs> he starts off as a Detroit cop who has to go to Beverly Hills, all right? And you see the difference between Detroit and Beverly Hills. 1 and 2 is great. 3, nah. But one and two are. I don't are even really remember good. three. What happened in that one? Three was poorly written. But here's the good thing: on the back of Coming to America two, which is a good movie. Yeah, I like. It was all right. It was all right. It's not as good as one, but it's good. Uh, really fucking. The, that other movie that he came out with was fucking badass. I like that one about fucking. Um, is about Rudy name? Ray Moore. Yeah, Rudy Ray Moore. What was it called? Dolomite. Is Dolomite my name. is my name. God, that movie was so good. Great movie. <laughs> Masterpiece. <laughs> That movie was so good. There's supposedly going to be a new Beverly Hills Cop coming out. I had heard that also. And I would love to see that. Fucking, I love the Axel Foley character. Fucking, for me, fucking, Eddie Murphy was Axel Foley. That fucking was a good character. Detroit fucking cop who he, who is kind of crooked, but he was a good guy. He was a good guy. But see, Beverly Hills Cop 1 and 2. Very good. Some, well, hi, Fun Pookie. movie. Fun movie. Good 80s soundtrack. Um, Got some, you know... Yeah, it's got some funny humor in it and fucking some action happens and some Americanisms happen. America, 80s Americanisms happen through that through both of those whole fucking movies right there. They're a good movie. I mean, you have to say, though, that in the 80s, like a lot of those movies were idealized to a certain extent. Yeah. But they captured the spirit. They did. They captured the but spirit. But they were to a large extent idealized. They were mostly idealized, but they, there's something about the soundtrack and the way things happened. They captured the spirit of the place and time. They were very good at that. Can I say... At least, at least, at least that movie was. That's why it's remembered. Yeah. Um, you know, they didn't always, but a lot of them did. One thing that kind of made me laugh about a lot of, particularly John Hughes movies in the mm -hmm. 1980s, which I love. I'm not saying that. But I'm uh, I'm thinking about like Pretty in Pink, Pretty, like Molly Ringwald's character. She said she watched him back in the day, but she didn't remember or anything. Yeah, and I don't. Uh, I remember the first one, but I don't remember the second or the, the third. The second one. one was kind of like the first one, but better. It had a bit bigger budget. Yeah, it was good. But one thing that I thought of was that, particularly Pretty in Pink. Yeah. Um. Molly Ringwald's character was supposed to be, I mean, she had a single parent who was a dad who was unemployed. So they were supposed to be like lower middle class. And one thing that always struck me when I watched that movie in the 1980s, I'm like, they have a nicer house than I have. Yeah. She has a phone in her room. I don't have that. Mm. It's like, what the fuck? What yeah. are you bitching yeah, about? Kids didn't have phones. <laughs> kids didn't have, really have phones. I did in their later. Rooms. Later. I did teenager. later. Yeah, but not. Because um, yeah. we had a shared line, so I did yeah. have. But um, when I first saw that movie and like whenever it came out in 80, 
2005 or whatever it came out, uh, I was kind of like, what are you bitching about? It's like, that's way nicer than my house. You have a car? I don't have a car. <laughs> what the fuck? You know what I mean? So it was kind of like, I don't know. That was like really funny to me. So things, so even poor people like in those movies back then, like had more shit than actual poor people. <laughs> but I don't know. And some of the like super yuppie characters were, I mean, I did know some characters like that, but it did seem like it was like exaggerated. Grant just comes out because people talk about Detroit movies. Grant just says, B mile for Robocop. Eight mile. Eight mile. Eight mile. Yeah, I, I got my I got my fucking glasses on. Mm. Eight mile. Robocop. Grand Torino and Gross Point Blank. Yeah, I remember those. Oh my god, Gross Point Blank was yeah, so good. Yeah. I saw that in the theater too. I haven't seen that in yeah. a long time. That was John Cusack. I have a very fucking soft heart for fucking Reb Beverly Hills Cop one and two though. They just me and Mike used to watch those things. Me and Mike Kowalski used to watch those things. We just fucking loved Axel Foley. We thought fucking Eddie Murphy was funny as fuck in that. And the, the 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 humor does kind of translate over time. Humor tends to get stale as it ages. Yeah, we were it's, talking about that. Yeah, we talked about that earlier. It's still pretty good. It's a good character. Another one. There was a couple other movies as I really liked. Fucking uh, Golden Child, aged pretty well. It was a fun movie to see again. Although I will say I did I loved that movie like yeah. when it was first out in the eighties. I didn't yeah. like it as much watching it now, but I still liked it. I, liked I didn't it. like it as much as I did back then. And then uh, I need to rewatch Vampire you know, in Brooklyn. Really good. It aged. Yeah, well. I liked that as well. It aged well. You know another one that I watched a lot like back in the eighties that I need to rewatch is Romancing the Stone. Yeah, we want to see that one again. Um, yeah. I think it's on Hulu or yeah. something like that because I saw it when I was scrolling through. I was like, oh man, I need to like fucking watch that again because I saw that a million times in the eighties. Yeah, I liked it. It was the budget version of Raiders of the Lost Ark. That's how I remembered it. it. I felt it felt like Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah, it was like, like an romance. adventure romance. Yeah, like type. a romance version of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah, right? I exactly. thought it was good though. I, I liked the chemistry between Michael Douglas and uh, Kathleen Turner. Around the time that came out, though, fucking Commando One came out, and that bitch was Commando, and that bitch was kind of like a like a video game on screen. I still yeah. like that movie as cheesy as that shit is. I mean, so so over the top. Right over the fucking top. It. That fucking broke. That broke off. It and and there was another movie that had Dolph Lundgren that I associate with fucking with fucking Commando called Red Scorpion. Remember that? Yeah, I remember that. I haven't seen it since I was a kid. I mean, yeah. And I don't I, remember if it's any good or not. I remember liking it. It was Dolph Lundgren being kind of like an action hero. <laughs> Red Scorpion. He was a Russian. He was a Russian version of fucking of Arnold. He, of course he was. Because of course, yeah. You had to see it. You know, I want to see that one again. Too. Tyler, the guy says, Stir of Echoes is the only movie I've ever seen that had an actually realistic looking middle to lower middle class household in it. That was one of the things, and I love that movie. Honestly, anybody that likes ghost story type shit, that is a really underrated movie. Um, everybody forgot about it because it came out almost exactly the same time as that fucking M. Night uh, Shyamalan movie. Uh, yeah. What the fuck is it called? The one with the I see dead people. Oh, yeah. Fucking Sixth Sense. Sixth, Sixth Sense. Sense, yeah. So it came out like pretty much the same week or two weeks later or something like that. So it kind of got overshadowed. But Stir of Echoes, it's based on a Richard Matheson novel. Um, and it's really, really good. Kevin Bacon is in it. But yeah, they actually do show an actual working class family in an actual working class house and a working class neighborhood. And it's like, it's seeing that movie, you like, you see how unusual that is to like see that in a Hollywood movie. Cause I kind of feel like one thing, it's maybe not so much nowadays, but I kind of feel like something that I saw a lot in the eighties was that um, they'd put these characters in movies that were living in uh, situations that I was like, okay, you're a teacher or you're this or that or a cop or something like that and you're living in this nice house. It's like that would not happen in real life. Yeah. Uh, everyone's living in like way better conditions than they would actually be able to afford. Yeah. Um, which was something that I noticed. Like I said, and it was something I noticed a lot in John Hughes movies because... You know, even the working class people in there like lived in nicer conditions than I did. So, and they were supposedly like didn't have jobs and shit. And it was just kind of like I don't know. It was just like funny to me that everything was like that exaggerated. Getting back to the fucking weird Detroit shit. If you guys want to see something, go on YouTube and you can look at like Detroit's Detroit urban exploration videos. And one of the most interesting ones is Mike Tyson's abandoned mansion. 
There are people that are going in there and making videos of it. That was a mansion that Mike Tyson used to own when he was a champion in his teens, married to Robin Givens, and they'll take you inside of his fucking house in downtown Detroit. Not in downtown, but right outside of Detroit. It's been abandoned for over 30 years. And it's a trip because you know he was fucking Robin Givens up in that place. It's got lofts and indoor fucking swimming pools. And, and it's got all kinds, it's got a big old fucking gate and the, the, the lawn is all overgrown. It's, it's down the end of a private road. Nobody's been in there for a long time. Go, go, go look on YouTube at fucking Mike Tyson's abandoned mansion. It's spooky in a way, but it's just weird. Grafters is in there. He'll tell you it was weird that there was such a big thriving city there that slowly just fucking vanished in an apocalyptic wave of exodus of people and money leaving. He says the, the, the suburbs around it are doing well. My buddy Steve is still doing well there. It's just, it's weird how there was a city that once rivaled New York that is now like a fraction of what it used to be. There's kind of, they've torn a lot of the neighborhoods down now. They've been returned to the wilderness. It's just grass, trees and shit, empty fields. They tore fucking big old fucking brick, whole blocks, whole sectors of fucking neighborhoods are torn down. And they were brick from the 1800s, late 1800s, early 1900s, gone. Returned to nature. It's like a, like an apocalypse. It's fucking weird. There is a downtown area. It looks decent, but it's just office buildings, you know. There's still a few million people there, but... They don't have to be there. They're just living in little apartments and stuff. There's not much of an economy down there. It's all in the suburbs now. It's just weird. Weird. Go check out Mike Tyson's fucking abandoned mansion. It's a trip. It's tacky, too. Tacky. Of course it is. Big old open spaces with a fucking... He's got, he had one place that's a big old open pl space with a swimming pool in it and then a loft where you could sleep and look over, overwatch the swimming pool. And then there was a bunch of other stuff in there. It was very kinda, kinda 80s looking, you know? Yeah. And it was just like, damn, him and Robin Givens were living up in that motherfucker. Back in the day, Robin Givens, remember her? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I remember when all that yeah, shit before they got Yeah, before that shit wouldn't happen. Before he started punching the shit out of her. I don't know if that actually happened. Uh, I imagine it probably did. <laughs> I, there's no telling I, I'm not sure that actually happened he's a nice guy he's got issues uh, but um, I think it was more like that was kind of an arranged marriage and it, money had a lot to do with it her, her mom was involved in a lot of that and he was a young dude you know what I mean I think he had anger issues you know <laughs> it's hard to give a dude that comes from nothing and just give him millions of dollars you know, Robin came from money. She had money for, before she met him, basically, compared to him, at least. But she was looking for money. There's no, there's no telling. Yeah, there's not. I wasn't there. I'm mm. just saying. Yeah. Yeah, Karen Robb is pointing out, yeah, I'm like, how can they afford to live in that home? I kind of feel like that with most movies and TV shows that I watch. Um, people that have certain jobs in certain cities... Like, especially if they live in, like, a big city like New York City or San Francisco or somewhere like that. And it's like, oh, I'm, like, a teacher and I live in this, like, this really nice apartment. I'm like, yeah, in real life, unless you inherited a shit ton of money from your family, that is not yeah. the type of place you would live in. Victor goes, Tom, Detroit's right there. I can see it. Dude, go look at Mike Tyson's fucking abandoned mansion. Fucking... <laughs> Sandra so said, I just looked at it. What she said, Mike Tyson's house has been empty since 1999. Why yeah. does nobody move there? It's such a big thing. Um, you have to yeah. understand, America is large. Somebody should like move in and like squat in it. And <laughs> actually, I might go move and squat in it. I think people don't realize how big the United States is. There, are, there are areas of it that are abandoned. There, are, there are towns that are abandoned. That everyone kind of forgot. They just was left. There. Yeah, and. Um, Nobody lives in Mike Tyson's house because that's not worth anything. And it's on worthless land. Uh, that's all gone. There's no economy to support that. It's gone. 
But go look at Mike Tyson's fucking abandoned mansion. It's there. And there's lots of that. Lots and lots of Well, that. people like a long time ago would yeah. build a mansion yeah. in a place that, and sometimes it was a little bit isolated, but sometimes it was in a place where there was a town not that far away. And then if the town kind of like economically went, you know, declined or whatever, yeah. and then, or that family's, yeah. you know, economy declined, uh, and then they just left it there. Then it stays and there. Yeah. Essentially, like the forest just reclaims it. Yeah. Uh, and then some urban explorer comes across it one day like yeah. hey look at this like mansion sitting here and all their shit still yeah. in it it's, and there's it's lots super weird. and lots of it i encourage you to look at, at urban exploration videos there are whole vacation result uh, resorts that were built in the 60s and the 70s sitting out in the middle of the woods well some of my favorite dan bell videos are ones that yeah. are, i think they're like up in the poconos and stuff yeah. like that um, where, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, that was a, like a really hot like vacation destination, yeah. um, which people still go there nowadays, but not to that part of it. So they built like these old, like these fabulous like hotels with nightclubs and restaurants and stuff in there. And it's like then they got abandoned. Yeah. Like in the 90s, usually they got abandoned. Yeah, there's this concept that everything's crowded. It's not crowded. If you live in a downtown area in an American city, you might perceive the world as being crowded. There are people that live in these cities that whose feet have never been off of pavement or concrete. Their feet has never touched soil. And so in their mind, they're gonna tell you that it's ever overpopulated and crowded. There are whole towns that have been forgotten in America that people haven't been to in forever. Look at, exp <laughs> look at urban exploration videos, you'll see. They're, they will go into houses where the owners died in the 80s and the owner had no relatives and the house has been sitting there untouched since 1988 and everything still works and the power is still on. Because everyone just forgot about everyone it. Everyone just forgot about it. You go in there and the damn refrigerator and the freezer still work. Well, there was that the one video store. that you showed me the other day where, yeah. like, they, they actually went in this house, which had been abandoned. All the furniture was still there, and they, yeah. there were actually still videotapes, and they could they, put them in the VCR and, and like, watch them. And watch, watch a dude's videotape. Because the power was still on. That was that clock maker. Yeah, it was super creepy. And his car was in the damn driveway. Looked like he could drive it. It was All the air was gone out of the tires. Probably all the gasoline evaporated. But it looked clean. It looked like you could... And the car looked brand new, but it was fucking decades old sitting right there. It hasn't been driven forever. And you could live in that house. Nobody's been in there since the late 80s. Yeah, everything's like house the power is still on. Everything yep. worked. You could flush the toilet. It had water, had power, everything. And it looked like the dude just got up and left. No, the dude died a long time ago. And none of his relatives ever claimed it. Nobody owns that house. Maybe the state, but the state forgets about things. They don't care. So you could go right into that house and live in it. And it's out in the middle of the country. But there's a lot of that. Well, I mean, like I said, when the, the few times we've driven out to my mom's house, because my mom lives out yeah. in Ocala National Forest, um, you know, just 10, 15 minutes from here is miles and miles and miles of nothing. Nothing in forest. Nothing. Yeah. It's just so forest. The United States is not crowded. There might be houses out there for yeah. all we know. I'm yeah. sure there probably are. Well, I told Jenny I was in being Mississippi, and I found a fucking thicket of fucking woods and fucking started pulling through it and saw a Victorian house in there. <laughs> it was totally overgrown. There was nothing in it. The fucking floors had collapsed. The windows had all been broken out. It was scary. It was like a fucking cave. But that house was from the 1800s, late 1800s. Well, like I said, 1800s. why do you think people are so fascinated by those urban exploration videos? Yeah. Because... You know, there's still vast swaths yeah. of the United States that used to be like back in the old days, you yeah. know, in the railroad days or whatever, like there was towns there and shit like that. But over time, they just got forgotten about. So there's all these houses that just went back to nature and everybody just forgot they were there because everybody that would know about the people that live there are dead now. So nobody really yeah. owns it. It's just the, kind of out in the woods. The entire town of Centralia is just sitting there abandoned. Look up Centralia. Yeah, because that underground. They fire. had an underground coal that's mine. That's pretty. That's pretty fire. famous. Yeah, it's still burning. Yeah, still burning underneath the ground in a coal mine fire, and the gases that made it dangerous to live there. So they just evacuated the. Place. So there's still a town, but all the houses there. are abandoned. Abandoned. 
sitting there forever. And it's got videotapes in some of the houses. They've gone in there. Everybody just left. Yeah, just left. And it kind of like it's Chernobyl. It's, it's creepy. Yeah. It's creepy. Yeah, I think uh, Dan Bell did a video there. Well, a lot of uh, urban exploration channels have done like videos there because it's kind of famous, like in the mm -hmm. U.S., that town. Uh, because... Yeah, it's like it's not a massive town or anything. It's just like a little town, but all the houses are abandoned. Sandra just says creepy. We don't know what you're talking about, Sandra. No, she said crazy. Crazy, I think she's creepy. Yeah, about all the urban exploit, like at, that everything just like being abandoned. Yeah, yeah. There's lots of it. They have a dude that did, did a little video. He bought a mining town. I can't remember where that was. New Mexico. And he bought Probably the out. There's a lot of silver mines out yeah, there. Yeah, he bought a mining town. It already had buildings in it and everything in a mine. It had been abandoned for a long time, 30s or 40s. And he's revived it, so he lives in this abandoned mining town out in the middle of the desert. He's pumping his own water, rebuilding it. People are coming to visit him. He's got a fucking Patreon page and making videos of what he's doing in the town. And the fucking, it used to have like couple hundred people living in it. It's just him now living in this town, making videos. I like that idea. Yeah. Maybe I could find a Owns a whole town, town. I could live in. Out hmm. in the middle of the desert. Well, every time we see like an urban exploration video where like there's just some mansion in the middle of fucking nowhere. Yeah. And it looks like it's in okay shape. Yeah. I'm just kind of like, I wonder if I could just go move into that. Yeah. <laughs> I would imagine. That looks pretty nice. Sandra, I would imagine you as a German would freak the fuck out because I know you guys are like all authoritarian and always worried about who owns what and where everything is. You can find urban exploration videos of them where they will find a fucking mansion here in the United States built in the 90s of the 2000s that looks fucking perfect. I'm talking about a mega mansion with basketball courts and fucking jacuzzis and bowling lanes and everything. Nobody's been in there for 20 or 30 years. And you can go in there and it's just pristine. And it's out in the middle of nowhere. You could, And they know who owned it and why they sold it, but they're not worth anything. It's not like people think if you build a mansion and all of a sudden you ha it's worth something and you can sell it. No. Well, it depends on where it's at. No. I mean, if nobody wants to live there, yeah. then the shit is useless. Mansions are a great way to throw away money in the United States. You'll make more money on a little house like this, okay? Which is a little house compared to a mansion. People that can afford mansions can afford to build a mansion. And they want a brand new mansion made made to their specifications. Because why wouldn't you? Why the fuck would you want to build, buy a used mansion to someone else's specifications? So these guys will fucking build a four or five million dollar mansion, two million dollar mansion in a location, and then they die or they lose their money or they never go to it so they sell it or just kind of abandon it because they got other mansions and the shit just sits there and nobody will ever buy it it'll yeah, just fall it's apart. not worth anything it's not to worth anybody. anything to a rich person because like you yeah. said they have enough money to build yeah. their own shit because build like i said shit. if you have millions of dollars yeah if i had millions of dollars i'd be like yep. yeah i want to build a house to my specifications i don't want somebody else's crap yep and i guess a bank owns it I guess is what it ends up happening to it, but the bank doesn't really give a shit. You could probably move into something like that if you were taking care of it. If if anyone ever came by to ask any questions, that might be a couple years. Which maybe. probably they wouldn't. Probably never, but somebody <laughs> might come in. What are you doing? Oh, I'm, the I'm the caretaker. You're the caretaker? Yeah, the bank sent me here to take care of it. All right, fair enough. And if they believe that, they just let you go. <laughs> oh, okay. You'd be squatting in it. But. I mean, as long as it was kind of out in the middle of nowhere and you weren't bothering anybody, yeah, I don't think they'd do really it. give a crap. You could do it. <laughs> yeah, as long as you were taking care of things, you weren't damaging things. And... And, but what's funny is that those mansions always have the power on. Maybe, well, because... Like, rich people don't pay for power. It doesn't matter. Either that or it's, like, not enough for anybody to notice. They don't notice it. If you were in there fucking running them lights, I imagine they'd eventually notice it. Why are you draining all this power? Who yeah, are you? somebody would like it would red yeah. flag to somebody, but I kind of feel yeah. like most people who work in the power company just like regular working Joes, and they're just kind of like whatever. I don't give a crap. So as long as it's not like yeah. raising any red flags, probably nobody cares. I would think. Yeah. Tammy says uh, on the next Dan Bell, I found Hoffa. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Wouldn't that be funny if he was just like exploring like Dan, some Dan abandoned just, house and like fucking found. Some. Dan just released a video either today or yesterday explaining where he's been and he's been having mental problems. Oh, he has a new one out. Yeah. Okay, he's I'm gonna been have to watch that. Some kind of mental problems, so he's not. He hasn't been posting videos. 
He's got fucking. Uh... Poor Dan. Yeah, he's. Just, I he's love not... Dan. Yeah, he's got good shit. He's he's a good he's a good yeah. dude. Like I said, I need to go on his Patreon because he's got like a bunch of extra content on there, mm-hmm. and I have to like check that out. Got to the end of the Jimmy Hoffa stuff. Yeah, we did. <laughs> I mean, you know, nobody knows what happened. To the, I mean, everybody knows what happened to him, but nobody knows exactly what happened. You know what I mean? It's still a mystery. I don't think they're ever going to solve that. Because like I said, I don't think his body even exists. His body anymore. doesn't exist. It was destroyed. Yeah. They, whether they, I don't think they fed it to the, fed it to sharks or pigs or put it in a, you know, car Not. compactor or whatever. But it's like they, they got rid, they didn't just bury it somewhere. They got rid of that shit. They compacted that bitch in a, they put him in a trunk and fucking crushed the car and melted it. Yeah, No Need Absolutely. For Me Too says they just leave it connected to the grid because they forget to unhook it all. That's yeah. kind of what I think happens. I think I, that's what happens. And it's not like drawing enough power to like have anybody's attention. Like nobody yeah. notices that no one's paying for it. Right. Um, you know, it, if it doesn't raise any red flags, like I said, no one's going to really notice. You could literally go into that mansion and live in there and nobody would notice you. The problem is, is those mansions are fucking huge. If you see the mansions we're talking about, a lot of empty spaces. In Florida, something like that would cost thousands and thousands, probably two thousand, three thousand dollars a month to air condition. And you need to air condition you it because otherwise it will just be mold. mold. They'll just be mold. A lot of the ones that they show the aren't here in Florida. We do have huge fucking mansions here in Florida, but they got to be run under the air conditioning fucking during the summer. Um, cause shit, man, we couldn't just, live in there. We just had the power off a few days because of a hurricane, and already I'll like. Kill you. Molds are well. Shit, we yeah. a, a little bit. I I have to keep spraying bleach in the shower because of mold, yeah. and we have air conditioning. Yeah, which is drying the shit out. So even if you have air conditioning, you still have like it's a constant battle against fucking yeah. mold because of the humidity. You know what I mean? Yeah. All right. So I, we're so we're done with this story. We can pretty much. Shut yeah. This down. I'm starving. Yeah. We're, I got food. You got like more. We'll chicken. We'll eat that chicken. Yeah. Yeah, chicken and veggies. I mean, he grilled some more chicken today, but he put curry on. Yeah, grilled chicken curry and, and grilled vegetables. And grilled vegetables. It was yeah. really oh, we're so healthy. Yeah. The last, other than all the booze. I've lost a lot of fat. In the past <laughs> days. Other than all the booze, we're like super healthy. I've lost several pounds of fat in the past couple couple uh, days. You think? A couple weeks probably. Victor yeah. says, "No, don't leave me." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We've been going almost four hours though. Yeah, it's a long show. I mean, you know, we covered most of the shit, right? I, yeah. I think it turned out okay. Do you want some of this? It looks like you're getting run. Or, or are you done drinking? Wait, is this the apple that, pie? Yeah, it's apple. Okay. Because we're out of the uh, coconut. We're out of what? Coconut. We're out oh, of shit. We're out yeah, of so coconut. So we just put okay. that. And I can't drink all that anyway. Oh, okay. Well, I'll help you out. So, yeah. So uh, tomorrow's Saturday. So we're yeah. going to take a break tomorrow. Like I said, got to meet with the landlords. Find out what that situation is going to be. They want to buy this house. We'll see how that goes. Okay. I don't know how that's going to go. Right. Like I said, we might have to buy this house or we might have to move. I'm not really right. entirely sure what's, what's going to happen. Um, but Sunday, well, okay. So yesterday we went to the movie theater and saw that Marvel movie. Yeah. Uh, what is it called? Shang-Chi. Shang-Chi. Yeah, Shang-Chi. Shang-Chi, yeah. Uh, it was, it was pretty which good. is actually pretty decent. Yeah, I, pretty I actually quite enjoyed it. Um, so we'll probably talk about that Sunday. Tomorrow we're probably going to go see Malignant the yeah, James okay. Wan movie if we okay. have time uh, so then maybe we can talk about that on Monday because that looks pretty good I'm not a massive like I liked The Conjuring I like James Wan's movies they're fine um, so this one looked like it was going to be fine like entertaining so we'll probably go see that tomorrow if we have time and then we'll talk about no, that no if we have to move it won't be far no we're not going anywhere like no more it, enough... it, it would just be around here like yeah. 10 15 miles yeah. away at the most yeah because i don't want to like move any farther we got too many friends around here away yeah, yeah we have like a massive uh there's a lot of good houses 15 miles out in a 15 mile radius from here's a lot of good houses mm. i'm not worried about it we got the houses we got the money we got fucking financial fucking support loans and shit it's just the time and the fucking the hassle that's 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 all yeah because we weren't really expecting it yeah just like we blue. just kind of out of the blue well like we don't know what they were, want yet i know what they, they were kind of like hey can we come over to the house tomorrow we, we got talk something to i guys. tell you in person and i was just like oh shit they want like, us to fucking oh. buy the house because well because they uh, they asked yeah. us about it before they asked about it before and it's been we've been here for 10 years so they're like let's go ahead and sit but the, the price wasn't right and they're asking too much for but we'll see how. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see what's going on. We'll see how. But we got to meet with them tomorrow morning, so we'll see. Yeah. We'll tell you guys what happened on Sunday. Yeah. 
But like I said, we don't know what we're going to decide to do. Yeah. We just have to like see. We'll have it. time to figure shit out. Was, I hope so. I'm not going to, well, I'm going to give them an answer. Okay. I don't think, no. What's the average home I'm, price in Florida, says Louis? But it depends on what kind of house you're talking about. Um, In this area, I kind of feel like the houses around, are around here are around 400000 They're nice, though, in this area. Um, for nice, like this, I'm talking yeah. like a large, like 2,000, 2,500 square four foot. Four bedroom. Four bedroom, three bath. Yeah, two living rooms, a fucking uh, den, yeah. fucking all that shit. Victor says move to Texas. <laughs> Thank you, Victor. Nah, if I take Florida over Texas. I like Texas. Texas is good, but I'd rather have Florida. I've never been to Texas. I've been in New it's Mexico. Good. I've been to Colorado. I like those, but I've never been to Texas, I don't think. Florida's wilder. And Texas is wild, too, though. They're both wild. Tammy says, go squat in the haunted mansion at Disney. <laughs> yeah. I Honestly, if I could if I could afford to decorate a house like the haunted mansion at Disney, I would totally yeah. do that. <laughs> No shame. Victor sends five dollars saying to move to Texas. Yeah, I know. I just said that. Florida and Texas are similar. They're they're already similar. Yeah, I, I think I'd rather take Texas, Florida though. Victor says Texas is booming and our buildings don't collapse. Yeah. <laughs> it's the same thing with fucking Florida though. Florida's booming also. The buildings collapse, but that's South Florida. That's way down there. And that was that that building. You, fuck, man. I don't need to fucking Although I'm Florida. still worried that about... One, the, I still the, worry about um, sinkholes. Yeah. Because you never... Honestly, you never know. You never know when that's going to happen. Because... So no days and shit. Yeah, just... Yeah. You're just going about your average life and then all of yeah. a sudden, choop, the fucking ground like yeah. gives out underneath you and like sucks down five or six houses. That particular building in it's South... Happened. That particular building in Miami, though, that was a fucking drug building. That was from the fucking. That was a drug money building. That's why that shit fell. It's like they built that shit at paper mache yeah. or some shit. I don't they know. They knew. They knew that shit was falling. Fuck, I'd have got to move the fuck out of there. <laughs> yeah, but I kind of feel like a house like this in this area yeah. is around four hundred thousand. Um, yeah. There are some newer ones that they're building in this area that are around that four hundred thousand to five hundred thousand. But like I said, they're big, nice houses. Like. Yeah. You know, 2,500 square feet. Four Graham's going, you get the boot, you can stay up. We're not going to get the boot, man. Fucking. We better not after all no, this we, time. No, we're not going to get the boot. Fucking, uh, we, we either have to buy this one or we have to fucking buy another one. That's all it is. And we're going to see what We just haven't decided, we haven't what, decided what we want to do yet. Do we want to buy this house or do right. we want to like look for another place? And really the best thing going for this house is two things. Our stuff is already in it. <laughs> yeah, we don't have to all move. Right. That's, that's move. good. Two, the location's really good. I do like this location. Yeah, other than that, it's not that special for this area. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's a lot of houses like there's this. There's a lot of houses area. like this. And you go 10 miles the other way, for the same price, you can get almost twice the house. Like I said, I do like that this is right by yeah. the trail. Yeah. And I do like that it's right by the highway. Yeah. Like I-4 is right literally I like a mile or a mile and a half that's away. What, that's what makes this house worth what it is. It's and downtown worth. Sanford is like... But we don't commute, so that Five or ten minutes. We don't commute. Yeah, it's not as big a deal as it used to be. I mean, it used to be a bigger deal when I had to like drive to work. Right. But I don't have to do that anymore. So it's not as big a deal. So I'd be more willing to move out, but I still don't want to like live out in the middle of nowhere. For 425, cause... we can go ten miles out that way and get a fucking palace. We could get this house for probably fucking... 275 300 but like i said if we could find something like that yeah um and like i said one thing that i would like that this house does not have i would like to have like a big screen porch area so i can build a catio yeah for the kitties yeah so they can get so they don't have to go outside outside but they can still be pretend outside without having to worry about them getting like hurt or eaten by animals because that's something that I kind of worry about around here. All right, let's shut it down. I'm going to go get some meat. Yeah, I'm starving. All right, yeah. so uh, we'll be back. Have a good weekend. We'll be back on Sunday, like I said, talking about the new Marvel movie, because uh, we saw it yesterday. So thanks, everybody, for dropping by. Thanks for all your super chats. It's been super fun hanging out with you guys on this Friday night. And we will see you guys on Sunday afternoon. Have a good Saturday. Bye. <laughs>